Hey, David here. Welcome to Week in Review, live with another Week in Review. So uh, God bless everyone. Hope everyone had a good week. A lot of research. I got through a lot of things. So, uh, you know, since uh, Jennifer wasn't able to continue with Week in Review, it has moved to most research. And so I'm feeling pretty good about that. My numbers may be a little bit down. So at this point, I'm not so concerned with growing with a growing week in review. Probably throughout the rest of the summer, I have a lot of research I want to cover just to you know do the due diligence on my research and understand some of these topics that are not well understood, not well covered, uh, quite well. And uh, you maybe after that, I'll consider trying to work, reach out for some interviews or line up some guests. So. You know, if there are any guests that uh, you know people want to pop in, pop in or have a talk, um, you know, I put the link in the chat, and uh, you know, once I get going, even to you know between papers, because I have a lot to cover. So let's end our screen share right away. I have a lot of links, a lot of uh, you know, a handful of interesting things that I saw during the week, and then a lot of things related to uh, the topic I plan on covering related to. Truth. Okay, so I've mentioned this a few times. I mean, a big case, tough to know what's going on. So the Jerusalem Post did an expose on how much money do the Tates actually have. And according to them, according to the Romanian courts, what Duvid suspected is that they're not really that rich. So according to uh, the Jerusalem Post from the Revelation of the courts, the Andrew Tate's net worth is about, and his brother's worth about $10 million, of which $8 million was the the cars. So, you know, a certain amount, like a million and a half for his house, which I guess is in an industrial area. So uh, it might be a mansion, but it's like a converted uh, industrial site. And uh, he didn't have that much cash, not that much in bank accounts had maybe half a million dollars in Bitcoin. So his main asset, which has been repossessed pending the outcome of the court cases, is cars, and they estimate that they have repossessed about $8 million of his cars. Those who are the court cases going off, you know, claim that you know, he has a bunch of money or whether his main source of money was off of some sort of pimping um cam girl operation that the, his main source of money was actually from what was happening with the women and you know even hustlers university whether they actually had that many members and so he has said the court documents saying that he only had about two million only had about 10 million dollars in assets of which um eight million were the cars and only a few hundred thousand dollars in cash and bitcoin Okay, so I appeared on Ethan Ralph Tuesday, the kill stream. We had a nice conversation. A I C three, good to see you. Been a while. God bless. If you want to pop on and say hi, you can take the link. So, uh, yeah, Michael Cisco, who uh, had been on Week in Review in the past, I think we met through Jennifer. However, she met him. Um, but you know, he had been an occasional co-host or partner to Ethan Ralph. And you know, so we talked a little bit. Ben Thorpe came on the stre uh, stream and we debated a little bit of theology. We talked about uh, hypocrisy and the Jewish view of hypocrisy being that hypocrisy is not necessarily that bad, as opposed to uh, Islamo-Christian view that hypocrisy is like from the worst things a person can do, as where you judaically say hypocrisy is largely expected to be seen as bad character, but uh, not as uh, sinful. And there's a handful of callers, uh, some theological discussion. Um, so if anyone from the kill, kill stream, you know, saw that, wants to talk or something, you feel free to reach out and we'll see if he lines up a debate. So I said, I'm happy to defend the Jews. And, uh, you know, we spoke for almost three hours, a bunch of various topics so you know we'll see how that turns out and if he uh, is able to line up a debate. 
Um, so I shared this a few weeks ago. The Neuroscience Conference has finally lined up uh, the finalized the date. So it may be semi unlikely that I go to it, but uh, it's too big. The link's too big for me to share. But uh, you know, August eighteenth to twentieth near San Diego in California. And, you know, so now they have the hotel and uh, all the booking information and sponsors, remote or in-person, for a weekend. So, you know, some interesting uh, names. Honor Band, uh, Bandapade, uh, you know, Sir Roger Penrose, um, So, I mean, I, I guess it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to end up going to California for it. But, uh, you know, they finalized the material for the conference. So I shared that a few weeks ago. God forbid, you know, Rathiatha, Michigan, Rathiatha is coming up in uh, two weeks. But uh, I think it's two weeks, two or three weeks. And uh, so there was some form of uh, electrocution, God forbid, in uh, Ulta, so I'm not even sure where that is in India, and uh, so it came in with uh, into contact with uh, electrical wiring, and led to electrocution. So uh, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, Lord Dragonoth, uh, you should protect people. So, uh, um. Okay, so I finished up my series with Michael on Jewish prayer this week. You know, maybe me and Michael will continue streaming, so you'll see what goes on with that. But uh, as of now, um, we have finished the introduction to Jewish prayer, and this last one might be one of the more interesting ones because we did the Friday night prayers and Kabbalah Shabbos and uh, you know Kiddush, and so there was more songs. So. Uh, um, you see, it already has uh, over 220 views. Uh, the first one was the most popular, but uh, this one will probably end up being the most popular of all of them. So uh, we'll see, uh, you know, what, what me and Michael, if we come up and do something next. Uh, no, Lambe, I've not been to India, not made it to India, God forbid. Um, opportunity did not uh, make it possible for yet for me to go to India. I would like to. My sister went to India um on business so a, a paid trip related to her business ashish delayla back with a long article um i almost wanted to make a comment but uh he's a tough guy to speak with so i think you know he might it might just get on friendly so i didn't make any comments but he did you know what happened to the bhakti devanta Institute that Prabhupada created to you know, do some sort of unification of science. So uh, you know he mentions in it that uh, the three primary goals of the Bhaktivedanta Institute was to refute the materialism in modern science, something that uh, I'm in agreement on. Refute the blind faith assumptions of other religions and. I'm not necessarily sure that's accurate, that there are blind faith assumptions in other religions. C, establish the Vedic system as scientific. And I'm not sure that the Vedic system could be established as scientific, but uh, if he didn't pay to argue with them, but he, um, um, you know, looked and saw how that was kind of transformed. So, you know, so the goal of refuting the materialism of modern science took a back seat and was replaced by a desire to build bridges with modern science and get a seat within the modern academic system and not criticize the materialistic dogma of modern science to preserve the academic seat. You know, say that most people within ISKCON, um, you know, especially people coming over from India to America, they want to be accepted. They want to get ahead. So, you know, they're not necessarily here trying to fight with the academic system and, and you know, relatively they respect and value education. So at that sense, you know, they're more concerned with acceptance than, uh, you know, some, theoretical battle 
um, and it's usually more the uh, zeal of the Western converts that would be more likely to carry on that mission. The goal of challenging the blind faith axioms of religion took a backseat and was replaced by a desire to build bridges with other religions, reformulate the Vedic system in terms of alien concepts like monotheism and not speak ill of other religions to preserve those bridges. Yeah, in the sense of like winning a battle, you know, to more just being accepted. People wanted to be normalized into American society. And to a large extent, ISKCON succeeded in being normalized into American culture and you know, giving up the mission of being more combative, of you know, showing that they have the truth and no one else does. Um, so, you know, more normalization. The goal of presenting the Vedic system as an alternative scientific system took a backseat and was placed, replaced by the desire to reformulate the Vedic system in terms of modern scientific ideas such as mathematical theories, hoping to gain more acceptance within modern society. I'm not really sure that that has uh, been done so much. So, I mean, there might have been a handful of people that tried to do that. Um, however, um, I don't think there's been a serious attempt at all within ISKCON. There's only a ha handful of people that you know, even care about the science. The Temple of the Vedic Planetarian um, was not necessarily an attempt to present it in a scientific manner, but just to present it in authentic manner according to uh, the Vedic scripture, you know, whether that uh, corresponds with science or not. So, you know, she's delayed is trying to bite off a huge uh, task here, and uh, you make some interesting points. I mean, he knows quite a bit about Western history and the history of science and the philosophy of science, but uh, he has a lot of holes in his research, and he's not really open to feedback. So, you know, to be peer reviewed and get published, um, he can't, he, he wouldn't even be able to work together with someone like me to, uh, you know, try to help him fill in the holes and gaps in his writings and his, you know, possibly failed assumptions about uh, Western history or Western science. Although, you know, he does have a, a decent knowledge of it and uh, makes some interesting points. So, uh, I want to look at that. Um, I shared this one with Jennifer. So this was interesting. So DeepMind from Google's is coming up with a Alpha Zero version of ChatGPT that would be based off the Alpha Zero programming that has a uh, you know, things like the alpha beta pruning and Monte Carlo simulation that is probably somewhat similar to chat GPT, but would have uh, slight differences. So that'll be interesting. And some of the people at DeepMind have claimed that their version, you know, their beta testing that you know, might, might be released soon is much more powerful and better than chat GPT. So uh, you check that out on AI Explain channel, show that pretty often. Um, here was a new MIT course that I went through, almost half done. I guess they said uh, um, some of the lectures aren't available, but on uh, urban energy systems and policy, uh, definitely a very important topic uh, you know, for modern society, do with the civil engineer. So I was happy to see a new MIT online course, you know, something uh, interesting and it wasn't that mathematical or technical it's more uh um policy i came across uh, this channel I, I was looking for like a review of the most modern indiana jones and so this channel god forbid the critical drinker and he said it was horrible and he kind of had a cynical view and uh, i guess he's in a scottish drunk as he calls himself, and uh, he gives a pretty critical, damning review of the new Indiana Jones movie, which is probably pretty accurate, and, you know, just all the holes in the movie and uh, problems of it, and uh, and so I saw he had this long series of what makes, why modern movies suck, and uh, it was actually pretty good. I watched the whole thing, and, you know, he probably hadn't heard about uh, you know, identity theory in terms of narrative identity. Uh, you're saying that, especially of these reboots and sequels and then rewriting sequels where this like narrative identity uh, 
you like uh, Luke Ford and your hero systems. So what made a hero when a lot of these movies like Indiana Jones and Star Wars or uh, even like Predator or uh, Ghostbusters, and, you know, a lot of these movies, these covers that have been rebooted is that the hero system has changed and the narrative identity of the hero's journey has changed and then trying to reformulate the hero's identity or uh, you make a lot of comment about uh, the role of women, the emasculation of man. And so it was actually a pretty good review because I don't watch too many movies, but uh, you know, just to get a review of some of the modern movies. And like I said, he's not familiar with uh, you know, McAdams and the theory of uh, narrative identity that I've covered. Uh, but I thought a lot of the insights would be interesting. And when I mentioned narrative identity and things like the hero's journey, that is most seen in fiction, specifically movies. I mean, you could also see in literature and uh, mythology like Joseph Campbell and the monomyth related to mythology. Uh, but probably the main version you know, of uh, narrative identity and uh, the hero's journey in modern Western culture is through the movie. Um, Kane B. So I'm going to be talking a lot about truth. So Kane B. I guess he has a Discord. Maybe I'll try joining his Discord at some point and try speaking to him. Um, but he, he just had today, I'm going to be talking about the correspondence theory of truth. And so he just had a video today on the correspondence theory of truth. Wow, so he's got 300 online people, over 2,000 members. So uh, maybe I'll try to join his Discord and uh, see what's going on there. And I'm not in anybody's Discord right now, but uh, I, I tweeted at him and he didn't reply. I can't even tell if he saw it. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll come back. It's probably going to be hard to have conversations. You know, even my Discord's pretty uh, pretty inept and uh, hard to have conversations in my own Discord. So, you know, joining other ones. But um, I'm going to be talking about the correspondence theory of truth and theories of truth today. So, Kane B, I've mentioned one of the few YouTube streamers that has quite a bit of material on uh, um, the philosophy of science. And also some of the stuff I'll be talking about today, which appears to be a topic that he's going to move, be moving into covering. Okay, so let's do a quick review of some of the last theories, some of the last streams. So since I went solo almost three months ago, yeah, I, I talked about monism, the conservation of energy, um, the philosophy of science. I had my own philosophy of science series. Um, talked about molecular biology um, and the relationship to life and evolution, uh, monism, panpsychism, um, quantum consciousness. I did a long whole stream of the overviews of various theories of quantum consciousness. I did a deep dive into the cognitive revolution. Um, I talked about Ginsburg's physical minim minimum chunking theory, Fernand Gobe, hopefully lead into a topic I'll be returning to, the science of expertise. Um, I talked about the multiverse and holography. And then last week I mentioned the multiple hypothesis testing, and um, Durkheim on pragmatism leading into truth. So today I will be talking about theories of truth. Um, I'll be looking into you know the concept of explanatory power and inference to the best explanation. I briefly covered some of these topics before on 
week in review. And uh, so let's jump right in. And there's a lot of information here. And a lot of this stuff I'm going to um, come back to um, you probably many times. So I chose to call it the multiple truth hypothesis. I said in science, like last week, I went to multiple hypothesis testing. Truth is generally not used in science. Truth is used in philosophy and logic and in general, you know, human communications. And so truth, the word itself, is not of Latin Greek origins, actually Germanic origins. So it's interesting. Your truth comes from Old English, uh, Saxon, possibly Germanic, um, maybe even just as pure uh, English, Saxon origins, having some form of meaning of accuracy, correctness. And you have note here that it doesn't have a verb form. Truth was actually used much more commonly in the early 1800s and then dropped off and has had a revival in the last decades of the use of truth. Um, there's some possibility that truth has a common origin with uh, Sanskrit, Proto-Indo-European uh, word meaning like uh, drew, meaning to be firm, solid, or steadfast, um, possibly related to like a tree trunk. Um, and lie also is English, Saxon, Proto-Germanic in origin, meaning false, speaking falsely, telling on truth for the purpose of misleading. Um, and ironically, it notes here that lie has a verb form as where truth does not have a verb form. So you're just an interesting etymology. You like uh, some things in the English language have, uh, um, you know, been taken from, you know, obviously English. So uh, that, uh, but most of uh, the philosophical terms have Greek origin through Latin. So uh, it's just interesting etymology that truth does not. Here is a long article, a good article, almost 100 pages, a brief history of truth, and you know, like a not so brief history of truth by Candlish and Damjanovic. And he divides it into three periods with technical literature related to logic, um, a continental tradition of um, the popularization of the truth concept, and then modern topics in the English language. And a lot of that is in relationship to the Vienna School and students of the Vienna School. So a lot of the big thinkers on truth are students of the Vienna School. So here's just a few big names in truth. So Alfred, Alfred Tarski um, mentioned he's like adjunct to the Vienna School. I think he was Hungarian, but uh, wasn't specifically. It was related and had dealings with the Vienna School. Um, actually, his original name was Teitelbaum, a Jewish con convert to Catholicism. And Tarski has his own theory of truth. And he has like a semantical version that was popular in the time of Wittgenstein and the Vienna Circle relating to semantics and uh, trying to look at propositions. And I mentioned like um, uh, theories in general and the different ways of looking at theories where you look at theories that are mathematical or theories are more linguistical or, uh, or mixed pragmatic where they contain like, you know, sentences and then how to parse sentences for truth values. And then, you know, Tarski also uh, work related to Gödel and uh, pure mathematical logic. Uh, but Tarski has a crossover into the philosophy of science. So an important name. Another important name, um, you know, more recently, he lived all, all the way to 2011, 
and Michael Dumnet, Dumnet, who uh, was Anglo. I guess you know he was like liberal, like a pro-immigration, um, but he was the major scholar of Frege, and you know Frege, the you know prominent math the mathematician, logician. Um, some crossover into philosophy, but Frege had versions of truth, and Dummett developed Frege's versions of through of truth, and uh, also a, a Girdle. Um, Frege, God forbid, had uh, you know, a little bit of anti-Semitism, so like he writes about that, and Dummett was liberal, but uh, Dummett crosses you know, say the the debate between realism and anti-realism. And when we look at the different theories of truth and like the correspondence theory of truth, just looking to see, you know, like a realist re version of, you know, sort of say like scientific truth, the philosophy of science and anti-realist. of, uh, And so just important names to uh, know in the philosophy of truth. Also have uh, Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein, you know, part of the Vienna Circle, whose major work, the um, Tractatus. And so you hear say Wittgenstein's main thing is the application of logic, modern logic to metaphysics. And you know, eventually the, you know, the, the disciples of the Vienna School of Scientific Realism would, uh, in, in some within the Vienna circles, become anti metaphysicians but uh Wittgenstein tries to um I mean demonstrates the application of modern logic to metaphysics via language uh, providing new insight in the relationship between the world thought and language and thereby into the nature of philosophy related somewhat to Tarski with looking at semantic uh linguistic sentence and the logical structure or truth values so uh one last major name, um, Alexian Minon, um, sometimes called Ritter, also a uh, German psychologist, uh, disciple of uh, Brentano, and he's got theories about object, object theory. And one of the things to see about true in the Western tradition is truth is defined as mind independent truths, like I've mentioned so many times in the history of science. And uh, um, you know, the approach of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton was that science is mathematical descriptions of objects, objects having mass moving in three-dimensional space over time according to predictable mathematical laws and you know so this truth relating to truths about objects and being mind independent and you know a lot of thoughts of Kant and deeper philosophy that hopefully I'll return to at a different time because uh, it's a very complicated issue but you know the nature of this English uh, Germanic word truth um, denoting something of mind independence which uh, may be different than the Platonic tradition or the Greek tradition of forms where there wasn't such a clear distinction of truth as being mind independent and hence the popular popularity of this word truth that has a stronger connotation of mind independence. So I'm going to read through the Wikipedia um whole thing on truth just get through a lot of definitions and your basic information and the different elements of truth so it's probably a pretty long reading maybe even like a 45 minute reading um i'm not going to cover these two um at least from the stanford encyclopedia but people want to look at pluralistic theories of truth plausibility of theories of truth has also been observed to vary sometimes extensively across domains of regions of discourse because of this variance the problem is internal to each such theory becomes salient as they overgeneralize 
A natural suggestion is therefore that not all declarative sentences in all domains are true in exactly the same way. Sentences of mathematics, morals, comedy, chemistry, politics, and gastronomy may be true in different ways if and when they are ever true. Pluralism about truth names the thesis that there is more than one way of being true. So this semi-related to the multiple truth hypothesis. This is a little bit interesting. I read through it, but uh, I don't think it pays to read through it today. Um, and also the coherence theory of truth. So there's a lot of information in this. Um, I'm going to look at just the Wikipedia entry on this. So just to close it out, but uh, you know, there's importance. The coherence, that was what Kane B did his stream on that just came out. And I'm, I'm going to look a little bit at it. And, you know, it's an important uh, theory. I think I had the identity theory of truth and the correspondence theory of truth. I'm going to look at a little bit more deeply. But uh, you, we will look a little bit at the course, uh, coherence theory of truth. Okay, so a lot of reading here just from Wikipedia um, truth. So you just do my due diligence, and you're going to see there's a lot of theories. And yeah, I'm going to go more in depth into it, but just to you know, do the due diligence and uh, go through some of the um, schools and, you know, epistemology related to knowledge. Um, so truth is the property of being in accord with fact or reality. In everyday language, truth is typically ascribed to things that aim to represent reality or otherwise correspond to it, such as beliefs, propositions, and declarative sentences. Truth is usually held to be the opposite of falsehood, the concept of truth is discussed and debated in various contexts, including philosophy, art, theology, and science. Most human activities depend upon the concept where its nature as a concept is assumed rather than being a subject of discussion. These include most of the sciences, law, journalism, and everyday life. Some philosophers view the concept of truth as basic and unable to be explained in any terms that are more easily understood than the concept of truth itself. Most commonly, truth is viewed as the correspondence of language or thought to a mind-independent role. This is called the correspondence theory of truth. Various theories and views of truth continue to be debated among scholars, philosophers, and theologians. There are many different questions about the nature of truth, which are still the subject of contemporary debates, such as the question of defining truth. It is even possible to give an informative definition of truth, identifying things as truth bearers and are therefore capable of being true or false. If truth and falsehood are bivalent or if there are other truth values identifying the criteria of truth, that allows us to identify and distinguish it from falsehood, the role of truth plays in constituting knowledge. And if truth is always absolute or if it can be relative to one's own perspective. Just a truth bearer will look at this more in the future. A truth bearer is an entity that is said to be either true or false and nothing else. The thesis that some things are true while others are, are false has led to different theories about the nature of those entities. So, you know, we looked at the etymology of truth coming from Old English relating to uh, uh, steadfastness, possibly like to a form of wood or tree, and maybe even pagan origins in the Old Norse true faith, word of honor, uh, religious faith, uh, belief. Thus, truth involves both the quality of faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, sincerity, veracity, and that of agreement with fact or reality in Anglo-Saxon expressed by um, sooth. All Germanic languages beside English have introduced a terminology distinction between truth fidelity and true factuality. To express factuality, Northern Germanics opted for nouns derived from Santa to assert, affirm, while well, West Continental, West Germanic opted for continuations of war of faith, trust, pact. Romance language used terms following from Latin, veritas, while well, the Greek, aletheia, Russian, pravda, South Slavic, uh, istina, and Sanskrit, sat, related to the English suit, and North Germanic, sana, have separate etymological origins. In some mo modern contexts, the word truth is used to refer to the fidelity to an original standard. It can also be used in the context of being true to oneself in the sense of acting with authenticity. 
It's the major theories of truth. So this is what we're going to be examining today is um, the various theories of truth. So the question of what is the proper basis for deciding how words, symbols, ideas, and beliefs may properly be considered true, whether a single person or an entire society is dealt with by the first, uh, by the five most prevalent substantive theories of truth listed below. Each presents perspectives that are widely shared by published scholars. Theories other than the most prevalent substantive theories are also discussed. According to a survey of professional philosophers and others in their philosophical views carried out in 2009, 45% um, of the respondents accept or lean towards correspondence theories, 21% accept or lean towards deflationary theories, and 14% towards epistemic theories. Which are attempts to analyze the notion of truth in terms of epistemic notions such as knowledge, belief, acceptance, uh, verification, justification, and perspective. So substantive theories of truth. So the correspondence theory of truth. Correspondence theories emphasize that true beliefs and true statements correspond to the actual state of affairs. This type of theory stresses a relationship between thoughts or statements on the one hand and things or objects on the other. It is a traditional model tracing its origins to the ancient Greek philosophers such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The class of theories hold that the truth or falsity of the representation is determined in principle entirely by how it relates to things by whether it accurately describes those things. A classic example of correspondence theory is the statement by the 13th century philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, uh, truth is the adequation of things and intellect, which Aquinas attributed to the 9th century Neoplatonist Isaac Israeli. Aquinas also restated the theory as a judgment is said to be true when it conforms to the external reality. Correspondence theories centers heavily around the assumption that truth is a matter of accurately copying what is known as objective reality and then representing it in thoughts, words, and other symbols. Many modern theorists have stated that the ideal cannot be achieved without analyzing additional factors. For example, language plays a role in that all language have words that, that to represent concepts that are virtually undefined in other language. The German word zeitgeist is one such example. One who speaks or understands the language may know what it means, but any translation of the word apparently fails to accurately capture its full meaning. This is a problem with many abstract words, especially those derived in agglutinative languages. Thus, words. some words add an additional parameter to the construction of an accurate truth. Predicate among the philosophers who grapple with the problem is Alfred Tarski, whose semantic theory is summarized th further on. Proponents of several of the theories below have gone further to assert that there are yet other issues necessary to the analysis, such as interpersonal power struggles, community interactions, personal biases, and other factors in deciding what is seen as truth. And you know, as we discussed last time about um, statistical methods and multiple hypothesis testing, so correspondence theory truth, you know, so to say, well, how well does the theory correspond to the external world, so to say, mind independent objects through predictions, and that would give tend to giving a value between zero and one. So you're like, how well does it correspond to truth? And then you would have a value between zero and one, where zero uh, meaning it doesn't correspond at all, and one meaning that it expand it uh, correlates exactly. And so, very rarely to never do you have correspondence of one, and uh, you and so you do to look at statistical methods like that is a topic uh, we will return to, and a large part of the multiple truth hypothesis. Coherence theory of truth. For coherence theories in general, truth requires a proper fit of elements within a whole system. Very often, uh, though coherence is taken to imply something more than simple logical consistency, often there is demand that propositions in a coherent system lend mutual inferential support to each other. So, for example, the completeness and comprehensiveness of the underlying set of concepts is a critical factor for judging the validity and useful of a coherent system. A pervasive tenet of coherence theory is the idea that truth is a primary property of whole systems or of propositions and can be ascribed to individual propositions only according to the coherence with the whole. Among the assortment of perspectives commonly regarded as coherence theory, theorists differ on the question of whether 
coherence entails many possible true systems of thought or only a single absolute system. Some variants of coherence theory are claimed to describe the essential and intrinsic properties of formal systems in logic and mathematics. However, formal reasoners are content to contemplate axiomatically independent and sometimes mutually contradictory systems side by side, for example, the various alternative geometries. On the whole, coherence theories have been rejected for lacking justification in their application to other areas of truth, especially with respect to the assertion about the natural world, empirical data in general, assertions about practical matters of psychology and society, especially when used without support from the other major theories of truth. Coherence theorists distinguish the thought of rationalist philosophers, particularly that of uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, uh, Hegel, uh, and Bradley. They found a resurgence also among several proponents of logical positivism, notably Otto Neurath and Karl Hempel of the Vienna Circle. And you're just thinking Duhem uh, conjecture related to uh, that all hypotheses are have elements of other theory of theory ladenness and you know so eventually i'm going to try to bring many of these things together so pragmatic and you know last week i read at length the, the lectures of emil durkheim on pragmatism um pragmatism might have some of the most correspondence so at least uh um metaphysically to the multiple truth hypothesis. So the pragmatic theory of truth. The three most influential forms of the pragmatic theory of truth were introduced around the turn of the 20th century by Charles Saunders Peirce, William James, and John Dewey. Although there are wide differences in viewpoint among these and other proponents of pragmatic theory, they hold in common that truth is verified and confirmed by the results of putting one's concepts into practice. Peirce defined truth as follows. Truth is that concordance of an abstract statement with the ideal limit towards which endless investigation would tend to bring scientific belief, which concordance the abstract statement may possess by virtue of, of the confession of its inaccuracy and one-sidedness, and the confession is an essential ingredient of truth. The statement stresses Pierce's view that the ideas of approximation, incompleteness, and partiality, when he described elsewhere as fallibilism and reference to the future, are essential to proper conception of truth, although Pierce uses words like concordance and correspondence to describe one aspect of pragmatic sign relation, he is also quite explicit in saying that definitions of truth based on mere correspondence are no more than nominal definitions, which he accords to a lower status than real definition. William James' version of pragmatic theory, while complex, is often summarized by a statement that the true is only the expedient in our way of thinking, just as the right is only the expedient in our way of behaving by this. James meant that truth is a quality, the value of which is confirmed by its effectiveness when applying concepts to practice. John Dewey, less broadly than James, but more broadly than Pierce, held that inquiry, whether scientific, technical, sociological, philosophical, or cultural, is self-corrective over time, if openly submitted for testing by a community of inquiries in order to clarify, justify, refine, and or refute proposed truths. And note, uh, um, Pierce, Charles Sanders Pierce was one of the major developers of the scientific method and the you know the philosophical formulation of the scientific method that I covered in my philosophy of science series. And so I said, like, generally truth is not used in science, but uh, you say Pierce had the theories on the scientific method and the philosophy of science and a pragmatic view towards truth, though not widely known a new variation of pragmatic theory was defined and wielded successfully from the 20th century forward defined and named by William Ernest Hawking. This variation is known as negative pragmatism. Essentially what works may or may not be true, but what fails cannot be true because the truth always works. Richard Feynman also ascribed to it. We are, we definitely, we never are definitely right, but we can only be sure we are wrong. This approach incorporates many of the ideas of Pierce, James, and Dewey. For Pierce, the idea of endless investigation would tend to bring about scientific belief fits negative pragmatism in that a negative pragmatist would never stop testing. As Feynman noted, an idea or theory uh, could never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment might succeed in proving wrong what you thought was right. Similar to James and Dewey, 
ideas also describe truth or repeated testing, which is self-corrective over time. Pragmatism and negative pragmatism are also closely aligned to the coherence theory of truth and that any testing should not be uh, isolated, but rather incorporate knowledge from all human endeavors and experience. The universe is a whole and integrated system and testing should acknowledge and account for its diversity. As Feynman said, if it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. Constructivist epistemology. Social constructivism holds that truth is constructed by social processes, is historically and culturally specific, and that is part shaped through the power struggles within a community. Constructivism views all of our knowledge is constructed because it does not reflect any external transcendental realities. Rather, perceptions of truth are viewed as contingent on convention, human perception, and social experience. It is believed by constructivists that representations of physical and biological reality, including race, sexuality, and gender, are socially constructed. Giabattista Vico was among the first to claim that history and culture were man-made. Vico's epistemological orientation gathers the most diverse rays and unfolds in one axiom. The truth itself is constructed. Hegel and Marx were among the other early proponents of the premise that the truth is or can be socially constructed. Marx, like many critical theorists who followed, did not reject the existence of objective truth, but rather distinguish between true knowledge and knowledge that has been distorted through power or ideology. For Marx, scientific and true knowledge is in accordance with the dialectic understanding of history, and ideological knowledge is an epiphenomenal expression of the relationship of material forces in a given economic arrangement. And you will get back, and we've talked during the philosophy of science about history and the role of, to say, history as a science, and then we'll call historical truth claims and separation of truth claims that are dependent on mind versus mind independent and whether something like history could be considered mind independent truth or certain elements of history could be considered mind independent. Consensus theory of truth. Consensus theory holds that truth is whatever is agreed upon or some versions might come to be agreed upon by some specified group. Such a group might include all the human beings or a subset thereof consisting of more than one person. Among the current advocates of consensus theory, as a useful accounting of the concept of truth is the philosopher Habermas of the uh, critical of the, the Frankfurt School. Habermas maintains that truth is what would be agreed upon as an ideal speech situation. Among the current strong critics of consensus theory is the philosopher Nicholas Rescher. So the minimalist school, including the deflationary theory of truth. Deflationary theory of truth. Modern developments in the field of philosophy have resulted in the rise of a new thesis that the term truth does not denote a real property of sentences or proposition. This thesis is in part a response to the common use of truth predicates that some particular thing is true, which was particularly prevalent in philosophical discourse on truth in the first half of the 20th century. From this point of view, to assert that 2 plus 2 is true is logically equivalent to asserting that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And the phrase is true is completely dispensable in this and every other context. In common parlance, true predicates are not commonly heard. And it would be interpreted as an unusual occurrence where so, someone to utilize a truth predicate in everyday conversation when asserting that something is true. Newer perspectives take that this discrepancy into account and work with sentence structures that are actually employed in common discourse can be broadly described as deflationary theories of truth since they attempt to deflate the presumed importance of words like true or truth as disquotational theories that to draw attention to the disappearance of the quotation marks in uh, cases like the above example or as minimalist theories of truth. Whichever term is used, deflationary theories can be said to hold in common that the predicate true is an expressive convenience, not the name of a property requiring deep analysis. Once we have identified the truth predicate's formal features and utility, deflationists argue we have said all there is to be said about truth. Among the theoretical concerns of these views is to explain away those special cases where it does not, where it does appear that the concept of truth has peculiar and interesting properties. In addition to highlighting some formal aspects of the predicate is true, some deflationists point out that the concept enables us to express things 
that might otherwise require infinitely long sentences. For example, one can express confidence in Michael's accuracy by asserting the end of the sentence. Michael says, snow is white and snow is white, or he says, roses are red and roses are red, or he says, so, so on and so on. The assertion can only be succinctly expressed by saying what Michael says is true. Performative. According to P.F. Strawson, the performative theory of truth, which holds to say snow is white is true, is to perform the speech act of signaling one's agreement with the claim that snow is white, much like nodding one's head in agreement. The idea that some statements are more actions than communicative statements is not as odd as it may seem. For example, when a wedding couple says, I do, at the appropriate time in a wedding, they're performing the act of taking the other to be their lawful wedded spouse. They're not describing themselves as taking the other, but actually doing so. Strawson holds that a similar analysis is applicable to all speech acts, not just illusory ones. To say a statement is true is not to make a statement about a statement, but rather to perform the act of agreeing with, accepting, or endorsing a statement. When one says it is true that it is raining, one asserts no more than it's raining. The function of the statement it is true is to agree with, accept, or endorse the statement. The redundancy theory of truth. According to the redundancy theory of truth, asserting that a statement is true is completely equivalent to asserting the statement itself. For example, making the assertion that snow is white is true is equivalent to asserting snow is white. Redundancy theories infer to this premise that truth is a redundant concept, that it is a merely a word that is traditionally used in conversation or writing, generally for emphasis, but is not a word that actually equates to anything in reality. The theory is commonly attributed to Frank B. Ramsey, who held that the Use of the words like fact and truth is nothing but a roundabout way of asserting a proposition, and that treating these words as separate problems in isolation from judgment was merely a linguistic muddle. A variance of redundant theory is disquotational theory, which uses a modified form of Tarski schema to say that P is true is to say that P. A version of this theory was defended by C.J.F. Williams in his book, What is Truth? Yet another version of deflationism is the Procentational theory of truth first developed by Dorothy Grover, uh, Joseph Camp, and Neil Belknap as an elaboration of Ramsey's claim. They argue that sentences like that's true when said in response to its reigning are pro sentences expressing that merely repeat the content of other expressions in the same way that it means the same as my dog in the sentence, my dog was hungry, so I fed it. That's true is a, supposed to mean the same as it's raining. It one says the latter and another then says the former. These variations do not necessarily follow Ramsey in asserting that truth is not a property, but rather it can be understood to say that, for instance, the assertion P may well involve a substantial truth, and the theorists in this case are minimizing only the redundancy or pro-sentence involved in the statement such as that's true. Deflationary principles do not apply to representations that are analogous to sentences and also do not apply to many other things that are commonly judged to be true or otherwise. Philosophical skepticism. Philosophical skepticism is generally any questioning attitude or doubt towards one or more items or knowledge of belief which ascribe truth to their assertions and propositions. The primary target of philosophical skepticism is epistemology, but it can be applied to any domain such as the supernatural, morality, and religion. Philosophical skepticism comes in various forms. Radical forms of skepticism deny that knowledge or rational belief is possible and urge us to suspend judgment regarding description of truth on many or all controversial matters. More moderate forms of skepticism claim only that nothing can be known with certainty or that we can know little or nothing about the big questions in life, such as whether God exists or whether there is an afterlife. Religious skepticism is doubt concerning basic religious principles. Scientific skepticism concerns testing beliefs for reliability by subjecting them to systematic investigation using the scientific method to discover empirical evidence for them. Plural's theories of truth. Several of the major theories of truth hold that there is a particular property, the having of which makes a belief or proposition true. Pluralist theories of truth assert that there may be more than one property that makes a proposition true. Ethical propositions might be true by virtue of coherence. Propositions about the physical world might be true by corresponding to objects and properties they are about. Some of the pragmatic theories, such as those of Charles Pierce or William James, included aspects of correspondence, coherence, and constructivist theories. Crispin Wright argues in a 1992 book, Truth and Objectivity, that any predicate which satisfies certain platitudes about truth 
qualified as a truth predicate. And some discourses, Wright argued, the role of the truth predicate might be played by the notion of super assertability. Michael Lynch in the 2009 book, Truth as One and Many, argued that we should see truth as a functional property capable of being multiple manifested in distinct properties like correspondence or coherence. So I'm not sure pluralist is necessarily super related to the multiple truth hypothesis. And you know, maybe I'll look more into right, but it could be saying something slightly different about truth having multiple components to it or different natures that, uh, um, but it would have some element similar to what I'm trying to get at with the multiple truth hypothesis. Formal theories. Logic. Logic is concerned with the patterns and reason that can help to tell if a proposition is true or not. Logicians use formal logic to express the truths which are concerned with, and as such, there is only truth under some interpretation or truth within some logical system. A logical truth, also called an analytical truth or necessary truth, is a statement which is true in all possible worlds or under all possible interpretations as contrast to a fact, also called a synthetic claim or contingency, which is only true in this world as it has historically unfolded. A proposition such if P then Q, and Q then P is considered to be logical truth because of the meaning of the symbols and words in it and not because of any fact of any particular world. They are such that they could not be untrue. Degrees of truth in logic may be represented two or more discrete values as with uh, bivalent logic or three-valued logic and other forms of finite-valued logic. Truth and logic can be represented using numbers comprising a continuous range typically between zero and one and with fuzzy logic and other forms of infinite-valued logic. In general, the concept of representing the truth more than two values is known as many-valued logic. Uh, mathematics. There are two main approaches to truth in mathematics. They are the model theory of truth and the proof theory of truth. Historically, in the within the 19th century development of Boolean algebra, mathematical models of logic began to treat truth, also represented as capital T or 1, as an arbitrary constant. Falsity is also an arbitrary constant, which could be represented as capital F or 0. In propositional logic, these symbols can be manipulated according to a set of axioms and rules of inference, often given in the form of truth tables. In addition, from at least the time of Hilbert's program, at the turn of the 20th century, to the proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem and the development of the Church-Turing thesis in the early part of the century, true statements in mathematics were generally assumed to be those statements that are provable in a formal axiomatic system. The works of Kirk Gödel, Alan Turing, Alan Turing, and others shook this assumption with the development of statements that are true but cannot be proven within the system. Two examples of the latter could be found in Hilbert's problem. Work on Hilbert's 10th problem led to the tw 20th century to the construction of specific Diophantine equations for which it is undecidable whether they have a solution or even if they do, whether they have an infinite or finite number of solutions. More fundamentally, Hilbert's first problem was on the continuum hypothesis Gödel and Paul Cohn showed that the hypothesis cannot be proved or disproved using the standard axiom of set theory. In the view of some, then, it is equally reasonable to take either the continuum hypothesis or its negation as a new axiom. Gödel thought that the ability to perceive the truth of a mathematical or logical proposition is a matter of intuition, an ability he admitted could be ultimately beyond the scope of formal logic of logic or, or mathematics and perhaps best considered in the realm of human comprehension and communication, but commented, the more I think about language, the more it amazes me that people ever understand each other at all. Tarski semantics. The semantic theory of truth has as its general case for a given language, P is true if and only if P, where P refers to the sentence, uh, the sentence's name, and P is just the sentence itself. Tarski's theory of truth Named after Alfred Tarski, was developed for formal languages such as formal logic. He, here he restricted it in this way. No language could contain its own truth predicate. That is, the expression is true, could only apply to sentences in some other language. The latter he called an object language, the language being talked about. And it may in turn have a truth predicate that can be applied to sentences in still another language. The reason for this restriction was that languages that contain their own truth predicate will contain paradoxical sentences such as 
this sentence is not true. As a result, Tarski held that the semantic theory could not be applied to any natural language such as English because they contained their own truth predicates. Donald Davidson used it as a foundation for his truth conditional semantics and linked it to radical interpretation in a form of coherentism. Bertrand Russell is credited with noticing the existence of such paradoxes, even in the best symbolic formulations of mathematics in his day. In particular, the paradox that came to be named after him, Russell's paradox. Russell and Whitehead attempted to solve these problems in principle of mathematics by putting statements into a hierarchy of types, where in a statement cannot refer to itself, but only to statements lower in the hierarchy. This in turn led to new orders of difficulty regarding the precise nature of types and the structures of conceptually possible type systems that have yet to be resolved to this day. Kripke's semantics. Kripke's theory of truth, named after Saul Kripke, contends that a natural language can in fact contain its own truth predicate without giving rise to contradiction. He showed how to construct one as follows. Beginning with a subset of sentences of a natural language that contain no occurrences of the expression is true or is false, so the barn is big is included in the subset, but not the barn is big is true, nor problematic problematic sentences such as the sentence is false. Defining truth is just for the sentences in the subset. Extending the definition of truth to include sentences that predicate truth or falsity of one of the original subsets of sentences, so the barn is big is true, is now included, but not either this sentence is false, nor the barn is big is true is true. Defining truth for all sentences that predicate truth or falsity of a member of the second set, imagine this process repeated infinitely so that truth is defined for the barn is big, then for the barn is big is true, then for the barn is big is true is true, and so on. Truth never gets defined for sentences like this sentence is false, since it was not the original subset in the original subset and does not predicate truth of any sentence in the original or any subsequent set. In Kripke's terms, these are ungrounded, since these sentences are never assigned either truth or falsehood even in the process is carried out infinitely. Kripke's theory implies that some sentences are neither true nor false. This contradicts the principle of bivalence. Every sentence must be either true or false. Since this principle is a key premise in deriving the liar paradox, the paradox is dissolved. However, it has been shown by Gödel that self-reference cannot be avoided na na naively, since propositions about seemingly unrelated objects can have an informal self-referential meaning. In Gödel's work, these objects are integral numbers, and they have an informal meaning regarding propositions. In fact, this idea manifested by the diagonal lemma is the basis for Tarski's theorem that truth cannot be consistently defined. Is thus claimed in Kripke's system. Indeed, leads to a contradiction. While its truth predicate is only partial, it does not give true value to propositions such as the one built on in Tarski's proof and is therefore inconsistent. While there is still a debate on whether Tarski's proof can be implemented to every similar partial truth system, none have been shown to be consistent by acceptable methods used in mathematical logic. Kripke's semantics are related to the use of Topoi and other concepts from category theory in the study of mathematical logic. They provide a choice of formal semantics to intuitional logic. And folk beliefs. The truth predicate P is true has great practical value in human language, allowing efficient endorsement or impeaching of claims made by others to emphasize the truth or falsity of a statement or to enable various indirect conversational implications. Individuals or societies will sometimes punish false statements to deter falsehoods. The oldest surviving law text, the Code of Urnamu, lists penalties for false accusations of sorcery or adultery as well as for committing perjury in court. Even four-year-old children can pass simple false belief tests and successfully assess that another individual belief diverges from reality in a specific way. By adulthood, there are strong implicit intuitions about truth that form a folk theory of truth. These intuitions include capture, uh, T in if P, then P is true, release T out if P is true, then P, Non-contradiction, a statement cannot be both true and false. Normativity, it is usually good to believe what is true. False beliefs, the notion that believing a statement does not necessarily make it true. Like many folk theories, the folk theory of truth is useful in everyday life, 
but upon deeper analysis, turns out to be technically self-contradictory, in particular, any formal system that fully obeys capture and release, semantics for truth, uh, also known as the T schema, and that also respects classical logic, is provably inconsistent and succumbs to the liar paradox or to a similar contradiction. Okay, so now looks at, let's look at some of the history. So, yeah, Orfeo, thanks for tuning in. Ancient Greek philosophy. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle's ideas about truth are seen by some as consistent with correspondence theory. In his metaphysics, Aristotle stated to say of what is that it is not or of what is not that it is is false, while to say of what is that it is or of what is not that it is not is true. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy proceeds to say of Aristotle, Aristotle sounds much more like a genuine correspondence theorist in the categories where he talks about underlying things that make statements true and applies that these things are logically structured situations or facts. Most influential is his claim in uh, the interpretation that thoughts are likenesses of things, although he nowhere defines truth in terms of a thought's likeness to a thing or a fact. It is clear that such definitions would fit well into his overall philosophy of mind. Similar statements can be found in Plato's dialogue. Some Greek philosophers maintained that truth was either not accessible to mortals or of greatly limited accessibility, forming early philosophical skepticism. Among these were uh, Xenophanes, Democrates, and Phyro, the founder of uh, Phyroism, who argued that there was no criterion of truth. The Epicureans believed that all sense perceptions were true and that errors arise in how we judge those perceptions. The Stoics conceived truth as accessible from impressions via cognitive grasping. Medieval philosophy, Avicenna, and early Islamic philosophy, Avicenna, uh, defined truth in his work, The Book of Healing, as what corresponds in the mind to what is outside it. Avicenna elaborated on his definition of truth. Uh, the truth of a thing is the property of being of each thing which has been established in it. However, this definition is merely a rendering of the medieval Latin translation of the work of Simone van Riet, a modern translation of the original Arabic text states, truth is also said of the veritational belief in the existence of something. Aquinas, re-evaluating Avicenna and also Augustine and Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas stated in his disputed questions of true on truth, a natural thing being placed between two intellects is called true insofar as it conforms to either. It is said to be true with regards respect to its conformity with the divine intellect insofar as it fulfills the end to which it was ordained by divine intellect with respect to its conformity with the human intellect. A thing is said to be true insofar as it is such as to cause a true estimate about itself. Thus for Aquinas true the truth of human intellect, logical truth, is based on the truth of things. Ontological truth, found this, he wrote an elegant restatement of Aristotle's view. Truth is the conformity of the intellect and things. Aquinas also said that real things participate in the act of being of the creator God, who is a substance being, intelligence, and truth. Thus, these beings possess the light of intelligibility and were knowable. These things, being in reality, are the foundation for truth that is found in the human mind when it acquires knowledge of things, first through the senses, then through the understanding and the judgments done by reason. For Aquinas, human intelligence intus within and the Gary to read has the capability to reach the essence and existence of things because it has a non-material spiritual element, although some moral, educational, other elements might interfere with its capacity, capability. Changing concepts of truth in the Middle Ages, Richard Further Green examined the concept of truth in the later Middle Ages in his Crisis of Truth and concludes that it's roughly during the reign of Richard II of England that the very meaning of the concept changes. The idea of the oath, which was so much part and parcel of the instance of Romance literature, changes from a subjective concept to a more objective one. Whereas truth, as in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, was first an ethical truth in which truth is understood to reside in a person. In Ricardian England, it transforms into political truth in which truth is understood to reside in documents. Modern philosophy. Kant. 
Manual Kant endorses the definition of truth along the lines of the correspondence theory of truth. Kant writes in Critique of Pure Reason, the nominal definition of truth, namely that it is an agreement of cognition with its object, is here granted and presupposed. However, Kant denies that this correspondence definition of truth provides us with a test or criterion to establish which judgments are true. Kant states in his logic lectures, truth, it is said, consists of an agreement of cognition with its object and consequence of this mere nominal definition, my cognition, to count as true is supposed to agree with its object. Now I can compare the object with my cognition, however, only by cognizing it, hence my cognition is supposed to confirm itself, which is far short of being sufficient for truth. For since the object is outside of me, the cognition in me, all I can ever pass judgment on is whether my cognition of the object agrees with my cognition of the object. The ancients called such a circle an explanation a uh, dialogue. And actually the logicians were always reproached with this mistake by the skeptics who observed that with the definition of truth, it is just as when someone makes a statement before court and doing so appeals to a witness with whom no one is acquainted, but who wants to establish his credibility by maintaining that the one who he called as a witness is an honest man. This accusation was grounded to only the solution of the indicated problem is impossible without qualification and for every man. This passage makes use of the distinction between nominal and real definitions. A nominal definition explains the meaning of a linguistic expression. A real definition describes the essence of certain objects and enables us to determine whether any given item falls within the definition. Kant holds that the definition of truth is merely nominal and therefore we cannot employ it to establish which judgments are true. According to Kant, the ancient skeptics were critical of the logicians were holding that by means of merely nominal definition of truth, they can establish which judgments are true. They were trying to do something that is impossible without qualifications for and for every man. Hegel. Hegel distanced his philosophy from psychology by presenting truth as being an external self-moving object instead of being related to inner subjective thoughts. Hegel's truth is analogous to the mechanics of a material body in motion under the influence of its own inner force. Truth is its own self-movement within itself. Theological truth moves itself in a three-step form of dialectic uh, triplicity towards the final goal of perfect, final, absolute truth. According to Hegel, the progression of philosophical truth is a resolution of the past oppositions into increasing the more accurate approximations of absolute truth. Uh, Chalabaus used the term thesis, antithesis, and synthesis to describe Hegel's dialectic trick. The thesis consists of an incomplete historical movement to resolve the incompletion. An antithesis occurs, which opposes the thesis. In turn, the synthesis, synthesis appears when the thesis and antithesis become reconciled and a higher level of truth is obtained. The synthesis thereby becomes a thesis, which will again necessitate an antithesis regarding the synthesis until a final state is reached as a result of reason's historical movement. History is the absolute spirit moving towards a goal. The historical progression will finally conclude itself when the absolute spirit understands its own infinite self at the very end of history. Absolute spirit will then be the complete expression of an infinite God. Schumpenauer. For Arthur Schumpenauer, judgment is a combination of separation of two more concepts. If a judgment is to be an expression of knowledge, it must have a sufficient reason or grounds by which the judgment can be called true. Truth is the reference of a judgment to something different from itself, which is its sufficient reason or ground. Judgment can have material, formal, transcendental, or metalogical truth. A judgment has material truth if concepts are based on intuitive perceptions that are generalized from sensations. If a judgment has its reasons ground in another judgment, its truth is called logical or formal. And if a judgment of, for example, pure mathematics or pure science is based on the form, space-time causality, or of intuitive empirical knowledge, then the judgment has transcendental truth. Kierkegaard. When Soren Kierkegaard, as his character Johannes Klimakos, ends his writings, my thesis was subjectively heartfelt is the truth. He does not advocate for subjectivism in the, its extreme form, the theory that something is true simply because one believes it to be so, but rather that the objective approach to matters of personal truth cannot shed any light upon 
that which is most essential to a person's life. Objective truths are concerned with the facts of a person's being, while subjective truths are concerned with a person's way of being. Kierkegaard agrees that objective truths for the study of subjects like mathematics, science, and history are relevant and necessary, but argues that objective truths do not shed any light on a person's inner relationship to existence. At best, these truths can only provide a severely narrowed perspective that has little to do with one's actual experience in life. While objective truths are final and static, subjective truths are continuing and dynamic. The truth of one's existence is a living inward and subjective experience that is always in the process of becoming. The values, morals, and spiritual approaches a person adopts, while not denying the existence of objective truths of these beliefs, can only become true, not truly known when they have widely been wi in, inwardly appropriate appropriated through subjective experience. This Kierkegaard criticizes all systematic philosophies which attempt to know life or the truth of existence via theories and objective knowledge about reality. As Kierkegaard claims, human truth is something that is continually occurring, and a human being cannot find truth separate from the subjective experience of one's own existing, defined by truth, by values, and fundamental essence that consists of one's way of life. Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche believed the search for truth or the will to truth was a consequence of the will to power of philosophers. He thought that truth should be used as long as it promoted life and the will to power, and he thought untruth was better than truth if it had this life enhancement as a consequence. As he wrote in Beyond Good and Evil, the falseness of judgment is to us not necessarily an object of, to a judgment. The question is to what extent is a life advancing, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps even species breeding. He proposed the will to power as a truth only because, according to him, it was the most life affirming and sincere perspective one could have. Robert Wicks discusses Nietzsche's basic view of truth as follows. Some scholars regard Nietzsche's 1873 unpublished essay on truth and lies in the nominal sense as a keystone in his thought. In this essay, Nietzsche rejects the idea of universal constants, and he claims that what we call truth is only a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphism. anthropomorphism. His view at the time is that arbitrariness completely prevails within human experiences. Concepts originate via the very artistic transference of nerve stimuli into images. Truth is nothing more than the invention or fixed convention for merely practical purposes, especially those of repose, security, and consistence. Separately, Nietzsche suggested that an ancient metaphysical belief in the divinity of truth lies at the heart of and has served as the foundation of the entire subsequent Western intellectual tradition. But you will have gathered what I'm getting at, namely that it is still a metaphysical faith on which our faith in secret science rests, that even we knowers of today, we godless anti-metaphysicians still take our fire too from the flame lit by the thousand-year-old faith, the Christian faith, which was also Plato's faith that God is truth and the truth is divine. Moreover, Nietzsche challenges the notion of objective truth, arguing that truths are human creations and severe practical purpose for purposes. He wrote, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. He argues that truth is a human invention arising from the artistic transference of the nerve stimuli into images serving practical purposes like repose, security, and consistency formed through metaphorical and rhetorical devices shaped by societal conventions and forgotten origins. What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphism, in short, is sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically. Nietzsche argues that truth is always filtered through individual perspectives and shaped by various interests and biases. On the ge genealogy of morality, he asserts there are no facts, only interpretation. He suggests that truth is subject to constant reinterpretation and change, influenced by shifting cultural and historical contexts, as he writes in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, that I say unto you, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. In the same book, Zarathustra proclaims, truths are illusory, which we have forgotten are illusions. They are metaphors that have become worn out and have been drained of sensuous force, coins which have lost their embossing and are now considered as metal and no longer as coins. Heidegger. Other philosophers take this common meaning to be secondary and derivative. According to Martin Heidegger, the original meaning of essence of truth in ancient Greece was unconcealment 
or the revealing or bringing of what was previously hidden into the open as indicated by the original Greek term for truth, aletheia. On this view, the conception of truth as correctness is a latter derivation from the conceptual original essence. The development Heidegger traces to the Latin term veritas. Owing to the primacy of ontology in Heidegger's philosophy, he considered this truth to lie within being itself, and already in being and time, he had identified truth with being truth, of the truth of being, and partially with the Kantian thing in itself, in an epistemological, essentially concerning a mode of Dasein. Sartre, in being and nothingness, partially following Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, identified our knowledge of truth as a relationship between the in itself and for itself of being, yet simultaneously close connection in this vein to the data available to the material personhood in the body of an individual in the interaction with the world and others with Sartre's description that the world is human, allowing him to postulate all truth as strictly understood by self-consciousness and self-consciousness of something. A view also preceded by Henry Bergson in Time and Free Will, thus the reading of which Sartre had credited for his interest in philosophy. This first existentialist theory, more fully fleshed out in Sartre's essay, Truth and Existence, which already demonstrates a more radical departure from Heidegger in its emphasis on the primacy of an idea already formulated in being and nothingness of existence as preceding essence in its role in the formulation of truth has nevertheless been critically examined as idealist rather than materialist in its departure from more traditionalist ideal idealist epistemologies such as those of ancient Greek philosophy and Plato and Aristotle as and staying as does Heidegger with Kant. Later in Search for Method, in which Sartre used a unification of existentialism and Marxism that he would later formulate in the Critique of Dialectical Reason, Sartre, with his growing emphasis on the Hegelian totalization of historicity, posited a conception of truth still defined by its process of relation to a container giving it material meaning, but with specific reference to a role in this broader totalization, for subjectivity is neither everything for nothing nor nothing, it represents a moment in the objective process that in which externality is internalized. And this moment is perpetually eliminated only to be perpetually reborn. For us, truth is something which becomes, it has, and will have become. It is a totalization which is forever being totalized. Particular facts do not signify anything. They are neither true nor false, so long as they are not related through the mediation of various partial totalities to the totalization and process. Sartre describes this as a realistic epistemology developed out of Marx's ideas, but such a truth, but such a development only possible in an existentialist light, as with the theme of the whole work. In an early segment on the lengthy two-volume critique of 1960, Sartre contained, continued to describe truth as the totalizing truth of history to be interpreted by a Marxist historian, whilst his break with Heidegger's epistemological ideas is finalized in the description of a seemingly antinomous dualism of being and truth as the essence of a truly Marxist epistemology. Camus. The well-regarded French philosopher Albert Camus wrote in his famous essay, The Myth of Civicis, that there are truths but no truth in fundamental agreement with Nietzsche's perspectivism, and favorably cites Kierkegaard, imposing that no truth is absolute or can render satisfactory in existence that is impossible in itself. Later in The Rebel, he declared akin to Sartre that the very lowest form of truth is the truth of history, but describes this in the context of its abuse. And like Kierkegaard in concluding on scientific postscript, he criticizes Hegel in holding a historical attitude, which consists in saying, this is truth, which appears to us, however, to be an error, but which is true precisely because it happens to be an error. As for proof, it is not I, but history at its conclusion that will furnish it. Whitehead, Alfred, White, Alfred North Whitehead, a British mathematician who became an American philosopher, said there are no whole truths, all truths are half truths. It is trying to treat them as whole truths that plays the devil. The logical progression or connection of this line of thought is to conclude that truths can lie since half truths are deceptive and may lead to false conclusion. Pierce, pragmatists like Charles Sanders Pierce, take truth to have some manner of essential relation to human practices for inquiring into discovering truth, with Pearson self-holding that truth is what human inquiry would find 
out on a matter and if our practice of inquiry were taken as far as it could properly go, the opinion which is fated to ultimately agree to by all the who investigate is what we mean by the truth. Nishida, according to Kitaro Nishida, knowledge of things in the world begins with the differentiation of unitary consciousness into knower and known and ends with self and things becoming one again. Such unification takes form not only in knowing, but in the valuing of truth that directs knowing the willing that directs action, and the feeling of emotive reach that directs sensing. And Fram, Eric Fram, finds that trying to discuss truth as an absolute truth is sterile and that emphasis ought to be placed on optimal truth. He considers truth as stemming from the survival imperative of grasping one's environmental physicality and physically and intellectually, whereby young children instinctively seek truth so as to orient themselves in a strange and powerful world. The accuracy of their perceived approximation of the truth will therefore have direct consequence on their ability to deal with their environment. Fromm can be understood to define truth as a functional approximation of reality. His vision of optimal truth is described partly in man for himself and according to the psychology of ethics from which experts are included below. The dichotomy between absolute equals perfect and relative equals imperfect has been superseded in all fields of scientific thought, whereas it is generally recognized that there is no absolute truth, but nevertheless that there are objectively valid laws and principles. In that respect, a scientifically or rationally valid statement means that the power of reason is applied to all available data and of observation without any of them being suppressed or falsified for the sake of desired result. The history of science is a history of inadequate and incomplete statements, and every new insight makes possible the recognition of the inadequacies of previous propositions and offers a springboard for creating a more adequate formulation. As a result, the history of thought is the history of an ever-increasing approximation of the truth. Scientific knowledge is not absolute but optimal. It contains the optimal optimum of truth attainable in a given historical period. Fromm furthermore notes that the different cultures have emphasized various aspects of truth and that increasing interaction between cultures allows these aspects to reconcile and integrate, increasing further in the approximation of the truth. Foucault. Troup says Michel Foucault is problematic when any attempt is made to see truth as an objective quality. He prefers not to use the term truth itself, but regimes of truth. In his historical investigations, he found truth to be something that was itself a part of or embedded within a given power structure, Thus, Foucault's view shares much in common with the concept of Nietzsche. Truth for Foucault is also something that shifts through various episteme throughout history. Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard considered truth to be largely simulated, that is, pretending to have something as opposed to dissimulation, pretending to have something. He took his cue from Iconoclast, whom he claims knew that images of God demonstrate that God does not, did not exist. Uh, Baudrillard wrote in Procession of the Simulacra, this simulacrum is never that which conceals the truth. It is the truth which conceals that there is none. The simulacrum is true. Some examples of simul simulacra that uh, Baudrillard cited were that prisons simulate the truth that society is free. Scandals stimulate the that corruption is co corrected. Disney simulates that the U.S. itself is an adult place. Though such examples seem extreme, such extremity is an important part of Bartolaut's theory. For a less extreme example, movies usually end with the bad being punished, humiliated, or otherwise failing, thus affirming for viewers that the concept of the good end happily in the bad, unhappily narrative, which implies that the status quo and established power structures are largely legitimate. Other contemporary positions, truth maker theory is the branch of metaphysics that explores the relationship between what is true and what exists. It is different from substantive theories of truth in the sense that it is not aimed at giving a definition of what truth is. Instead, it is the goal of determining how truth depends on being. And then it has a section on religious views of truth. Okay, so that was pretty intense. I read through the whole Wikipedia there, just some due diligence to uh, you know get the definitions and a little overview of the broad spectrum 
of the theory, the history, and thought on the topic. You say, well, what does truth even mean? And you know, certainly we could give a definition, but then how do we come to know truth or apply truth you know, for a colloquial speaking to actual theories of truth? And you know, that's when we you know, talked about multiple hypothesis testing, the multiple truth hypothesis, where to get more into you know, the explanatory power, inference to the best explanation, or scientific values of truth discovery. But uh, you know, just for the due diligence, we're covering the classical theories of truth. So let's just re-go over this section on the coherence theory of truth. Coherence theories of truth characterize truth as a property of whole systems of propositions that can be ascribed to individual propositions only derivatively according to the coherence within the whole. While modern coherence theorists hold that there are many possible systems to which the determination of truth may be based upon coherence, others, particularly those with strong religious beliefs, hold that the truth only applies to a single absolute system. In general, truth requires a proper fit of elements within the whole system. Very often, though, coherence is taken to imply something more than the simple form of coherence. For example, the coherence of the underlying set of concepts is considered to be a critical factor in judging validity of the whole system. In other words, the set of base concepts is a universe of discourse must first be seen to form an intelligible paradigm before many theorists will consider that the coherence theory of truth is applicable. The history. In modern philosophy, the coherence theory of truth was defended by Baruch Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, uh, Johann Gottlieb Fitche, Carl Wilhelm Friedrich uh, Schlegel, Carl Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, and Harry Henry Drachem, who is credited with the definitive formulation of the theory. However, Spinoza and Kant have also been interpreted as defenders of the correspondence theory of truth. In contemporary philosophy, several epistemological uh, lists have significantly contributed to defended the theory. Primary uh, Brand Blanchard, who gave the earliest characterization of the theory in contemporary time, and Nicholas Reschler. Varieties. According to one view, the coherence theory of truth regards truth as the coherence with some specified set of sentences, propositions, or beliefs. It is a theory of knowledge which maintains that truth is a property primarily applicable to an extensive body of consistent propositions and derivatively applicable to any one proposition in such a system by virtue of its parts in the system. Ideas like this are part of the philosophical perspective known as confirmation holism. Coherence theories of truth claim that coherence and consistency are important features of a theoretical system, and these properties are sufficient to its truth. To state the reverse, that truth exists only within a system and doesn't exist outside of a system. According to another version uh, by Joachim, philosopher credited with the definitive formulation of the theory in his book, The Nature of Truth, 1906, truth is a systematic coherence that involves more than logical consistency. In this view, a proposition is true to the extent that it is a necessary constituent of a systematically coherent whole. Others in the school of thought, for example, uh, Brand Blanchard, hold that the whole hold that this whole must be so interdependent that every element in it necessitates and entails every other element. Exponents of this view infer that most complete truth is a property solely of a unique coherent system called the absolute, and that humanity, knowable propositions, and systems have a degree of truth that's proportionate to how fully they approximate this idea. Criticisms. Perhaps the best known objection to coherence theory th truth is Bertrand Russell's. He maintained that since both a belief and its negation will individually cohere with at least one set of beliefs, this means that contradictory beliefs can be shown to be true according to the coherence theory and therefore that the theory cannot work. However, what most coherence theorists are concerned with is not all possible beliefs, but the set of beliefs that people actually hold. The main problem for coherence theory of truth then is how to specify just this particular set given that the truth of which beliefs are actually held can only be determined by means of coherence. So we saw the correspondence theories were the most popular and then the deflationary. So correspondence theory of truth. 
In metaphysics and philosophy of language, the correspondence theory of truth states that the truth or falsity of a statement is determined only by how it relates to the world and whether it accurately describes that world. Correspondence theories claim that true beliefs and statements correspond to actual states of affairs. This type of theory attempts to posit a relationship between thoughts or statements on the one hand and things or facts on the other. In history, correspondence theory is traditionally traditional model which goes back at least to some of the ancient Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle. This class of theories hold that truth or falsity of a representation is determined solely by how it relates to a reality, that is by whether it accurately describes that reality. As Aristotle claims in his metaphysics, to say that which is, is not and that which is not is a falsehood, therefore to say that which is, is, and that which is not, is not, is true. Classic example of correspondence theory is the statement by the medieval philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, truth is the adequation of things and intellect, which Aquinas attributed to the 9th century Neoplatonist Isaac Israeli. Correspondence theory was either explicitly or implicitly embraced by most of the early modern thinkers, including Descartes, Spinoza, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, and Kant. However, Spinoza and Kant have also been interpreted as defenders of the coherence theory of truth. Correspondence theory has also been attributed to Thomas Reed. In late modern philosophy, uh, Schelling espoused the correspondence theory. According to Parak, Karl Marx also ascribed to a version of the correspondence theory. Contemporary continental philosophy, Edmund Herschel defended the correspondence theory. In contemporary analytical philosophy, Bertrand Russell, Ludwin Wittgenstein, at least in his early period, Austin and Karl Popper defended the correspondence theory. Varieties. Correspondence as congruence. Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein have in different ways suggested that a statement to be true must have some kind of structural isomorphism with the state of affairs in which the world that makes it true. For example, a cat is on the mat is true if and only if there is a cat in the world and the cat and a mat and the cat is related to the mat by virtue of being on it. If any of these three pieces, the cat, the matter, the relationship between them, which corresponds respectively to the subject, object, and the verb of the statement is missing, the statement is false. Some sentences pose difficulties for this model. However, as just one example, adjectives such as counterfeit, alleged, or false do not have the usual simple meaning of restricting the meaning of the noun they modify. A tall lawyer is a kind of lawyer, but an alleged lawyer may not be. Correspondence is correlation. Uh, Jail Austin theorized that there needs to be there need not be any structural parallelism between the true statement and the state of affairs that makes it true. It is only necessary that the semantics of the language in which the statement is expressed are such as to correlate whole for whole the statement with the state of affairs. A false statement for Austin is one that is correlated by the language to a state of affairs that does not exist. Relation to ontology, historically most advocates of the correspondence theory have been metaphysical realist, that is, they believe that there is a world external to the minds of all humans. This is in contrast to metaphysical idealists who hold that everything that exists exists as a substantial metaphysical entity independent of the individual thing of which is predicated, and also to conceptualists who hold that everything that exists is, in the end, just an idea in some mind. However, if it is not strictly necessary that a correspondence theory be married to a metaphysical realism, it is possible to hold, for example, the facts of the world determine which statements are true, and to also hold that the world and its facts is but a collection of ideas in the mind of some supreme being. The objections. One attack on the theory claims that correspondence theory succeeds in its appeal to the real world only insofar as the real world is reachable by us. The direct realist believes that we directly know objects as they are. Such a person could wholeheartedly adopt a correspondence theory of truth. The rigorous idealist believes that there are not no real mind independent objects. The correspondence theory appeals to imaginary undefined entities, so it is incoherent. Other positions hold that we have some type of awareness perception of the real world objects, which in some way falls short of direct knowledge of them, but such an indirect awareness or perception is itself an idea in one's mind, so that the correspondence theory of truth reduces to our correspondence between ideas and truth and ideas of the world, whereupon it becomes a coherence theory of truth. Vagueness or circularity, either the defender of the correspondence theory of truth off, offers some accompanying theory of the world, or they do not. If no theory of the world is offered, the argument is so vague 
as to be useless or even unintelligible. Truth would then be supposed to be corresponded to some undefined, unknowable, ineffable world. It would, in this case, be difficult to see how a candid truth could be more certain than the world we are to judge its degree of correspondence against. On the other hand, as soon as the defender of the correspondence theory of truth authors offers a theory of the world, they are operating at some specific ontological and scientific theory which stands in need of justification. But the only way to support the truth of this world theory is that that is allowed by the correspondence theory of truth is correspondence to the real, real world, hence the argument is inescapably circular. Okay, now let's look at deflationary theory of truth. So I so said these are the main truth theories, the correspondence theory of truth and the deflationary theories are the main theories of those elements and popularity of all of them. In philosophy and logic, a deflationary theory of truth, also semantic deflationism or simply deflationism, is one of a family of theories that ha all have in common the claim that assertions of predicate truth of a statement do not attribute a property called truth to such a statement. The redundancy theory of truth, Gat Gatlub uh, Frege was probably the first philosopher or logician to note that predicating truth or existence does not express anything above and beyond the statement to which it is attributed. He remarked, it is worthy of notice that the sentence, I smell the scent of violets, has the same contents as the sentence, it is true that I smell the scent of, violent, of violets. So it seems then that nothing is added to the thought by me ascribing to it the property of truth. Nevertheless, the first series attempt at a formulation of theory of truth, which attempted to systematically define the truth predicates out of existence, is attributed to F.B. Ramsey. Ramsey argued against the prevailing currents of the time that not only was it not necessary to construct a theory of truth on the foundation of a prior theory of meaning, but that once a theory of content has been successfully formulated, it would become obvious that there was no further need for, for, for a theory of truth since the truth predicate would be demonstrated to be redundant. Hence, his particular version of deflationism commonly referred to as redundancy theory. Ramsey noted that in ordinary context, in which we attribute truth to a proposition directly, as in it is true that Caesar was murdered, the predicate is true, does not seem to be doing any work. It is true that Caesar was murdered just means Caesar was murdered, and it is false that Caesar was murdered just means Caesar was not murdered. Ramsey recognized that the simple elimination of the truth predicate from all statements in which it is used in ordinary language was not the way to go about attempting to construct a comprehensive theory of truth. For example, Take the sentence, everything that John says is true. This can be un easily translated into a formal sentence with variables ranging propositions for all P. If John says P, then P is true. But attempting to directly eliminate is true from the sentence on the standard forced order interpretation of quantification in terms of objects would result in the ungrammatical formulation for all P. If John says P, then P. It is ungrammatical because P must, in that case, be replaced by the name of an object and not a proposition. Ramsey's approach was to suggest that such sentences as he is always right could be expressed in terms for all A, R, and B if he asserts A, R, B, then A, R, B. Ramsey also knows that although his paraphrasing and definitions could be easily rendered into logic, logical symbolism, the more fundamental problem was that in ordinary English, the elimination of the true predicate in a phrase like everything John says is true would result in something like if John says something, then that. Ramsey attributed this to a defect in natural language, suggesting that pro such pro sentences as that and what were being treated as if they were pronouns. This gives rise to artificial problems as to the nature of truth, which disappear at once when they're expressed in logical symbolism. According to Ramsey, it is only because natural language lack what he called pro sentences, expressions that stand in relation to sentences as pronouns stand to nouns, that the truth predicate cannot be defined away in all existence. A.J. Ayer took Ramsey's idea one step further by declaring that the redundancy of truth predicates imply that there is no such property as truth. There are sentences in which the word truth seems to stand for something real, and this leads to speculative philosophers to inquire what this something is naturally fails to obtain a satisfactory answer since this question is illegitimate. For our analysis 
has shown that the word truth does not stand for anything in the way which such a question requires. This extreme version of deflationism has often been called the disappearance theory or the no truth theory of truth, and is easy to understand why, since Ayer seems to be claiming both that the predicate is true, is redundant, and therefore necessary, and also that there is no such property as truth to speak of. Performative theory. Peter Strawson formulated the performative theory of truth in the 1950s. Like Ramsey, Strawson believed that there was no separate problem of truth apart from determining the semantic context of facts of the world, which gave the words and sentences of language the meanings that they have. One of the questions of meaning and reference are resolved. There is no further question of truth. Strawson views different from Ramsey's, however, in that Strawson maintains that there is an important role for the expression is true. Specifically, it has a performative role similar to I promise to clean the house. In asserting that P is true, we not only assert that P, but also perform the speech act of confirming the truth of a statement in context. We signal our agreement or approbation of a previous utterance assert assertion or confirm some commonly held belief or imply that what we are asserting is likely to be accepted by others in the same context. Tarski and deflationary theories. Some years before Strawson developed his account of the sentences which include the truth predicate as performative utterances, Alfred Tarski had developed his so-called semantic theory of truth. Tarski's basic goal was to provide a rigorously logical definition of the expression true sentence within a specific formal language and to clarify the fundamental conditions of material adequacy that would have to be met by any definition of truth predicate. In all such conditions, if all such conditions were met, then it would be possible to avoid semantic paradoxes such as the liar paradox, um, this sentence is false. Tarski's material adequacy condition or convention T is a definition of truth for an object language implies all instances of the sential form. S is true only if P, where S is replaced by the name of a sentence. In the object language, P is replaced by a translation of that sentence in the meta language. So for example, the Neva A Bianca is true if and only if Snow is white is a sentence which conforms to convention T. The object language is Italian. The meta language is English. The predicate true does not appear in the object language, so no sentence of the object language can directly or indirectly assert truth or falsity of itself. Tarski thus formulated a two-tier scheme that avoids semantic paradoxes such as Russell's paradox. Tarski formulated his definition of truth indirectly through a recursive definition of the satisfaction of sentinel functions sententinal functions, and then by defining truth in terms of satisf satisfaction. Example of a sententinal function is X defeated Y in the 2004 U.S. presidential election. This function is said to be satisfied when we replace the variables X and Y with the names of objects such that they stand in relation denoted by defeated in the 2004 U.S. presidential election. In this case, uh, just mentioning replacing X with George W. Bush and Y with John Kerry would satisfy the function resulting in a true sentence. In general, um, given a method for establishing the satisfaction or not in every atomic sentence, the usual rules for truth function connectives and quantifiers yield the definition for the satisfaction condition of all sentences of the object language. Tarski through his theory as a species of corresponding theory Tarski thought of his theory as a species of correspondence theory of truth, not a deflationary theory. Disquotationalism. On the basis of Tarski's semantic conception of Quine uh, developed in what eventually came to be known as disquotational theory of truth or disquotationalism. Quine interpreted Tarski's theory as essentially deflationary. He accepted Tarski's treatments of sentences as the only truth bearers. Consequently, Quine suggested that the truth predicate could only be applied to sentences within individual languages. The basic principle of disquotationalism is that an attribution of truth to a sentence undoes the effect of the quotation marks that have been used to form sentences. Instead of T above then, Quine's reformation would be something like the following disquotation schema. The sentence S is true only if and only if S. Disquotationists are often able to explain the existence and usefulness of the truth predicate in such contexts of generalization, such as John believes everything that Mary says by asserting with Quine that we cannot have we cannot dispense with the truth predicate in these contexts because the convenient expression of such generalizations is precisely the role 
of the truth predicate in language. In the case of John believes everything that Mary says, if we try to capture the content of John's belief, we would need to form an infinite conjecture such as the following. If Mary says that lemons are yellow, then lemons are yellow. And if Mary says that lemons are green, then lemons are green. And the disquotation scheme allows us to reformulate as Mary says that lemons are yellow, then the sentence lemons are yellow is true. If Mary says that lemons are green, then the sentence lemons are green is true. And since X is equivalent to X is true for the disquotationist, then the above infinite conjectures are also equivalent. Consequently, we have the generalization for all sentences S. If Mary said S, then S is true. Since we could not express the statement without a truth predicate along the lines of the truth defined by deflationary theory, is the role of the truth predicate in forming such generalizations that characterizes all that needs to be characterized about the concept of truth. pro sentinelism Grover, Camp, and Belknap developed a deflationary th truth called pro sentinelism which has since become defended by Robert Brandom. pro sentinelism asserts that there are pro-sentences which stand in for and derive their meaning from the sentences which they substitute. In the statement, Bill is tired and he is hungry, the pronoun he takes a reference from the noun Bill by analogy in the statement, he explained that he was in financial straits and that this is how things were and that therefore he needed an advance. The clause, this is how things were, receives its reference from the previously concurring sentinel clause, he was in financial straits according to a pro sentinelist account. How does this relate to truth? pro sentinelists view the statement that contains is true as sentences which do not contain a truth predicate, but rather contain some prom form of pro-sentence. So the truth predicate itself is part of an anaphoric or pro-sentinel construction. pro point out that many parallels which exist between pronouns and pro-sentences, pronouns are often used as la of laziness, as in Bill is tired and he's hungry, or they can be used in quantification context, such as someone is in the room and is armed with a rifle. In a similar manner, it is true can be used in the pro-sentence of laziness, as in Fred believes that it is raining, it is true, and is a quantification pro-sentence, such as what else believes is true. Pro-sentimentalist therefore reject the idea that truth is a property of some sort. Minimalism. Paul Horwich's minimal theory of truth, also known as minimalism, takes the primary truth-bearing entities to be propositions rather than sentences. According to the minimalist view, then, truth is indeed a property of propositions or sentences, as the case may be, but it is so minimal and anomalous a property that it cannot be said to provide us with any useful information about or insight into the nature of truth. It is fundamentally nothing more than a sort of metalinguistical property. Another way of formulating the minimalist thesis is to assert the conjunction of all the instances of the following schema. The proposition that P is true if and only if P provides an implicit definition of the property of truth. Each such instance of an axiom of the truth, and there are an infinite number of such instances, one for each actual or possible proposition in the universe. Our concept of truth consists of nothing more than a disposition to assert that all instances of the above schema when we encounter them. Objections to deflationism. One of the main objections to deflationary theories of all flavors was formulated by Jackson, Oppie, and Smith, 94, according to the objection, if deflationism is interpreted as a sentential theory, that is one where the truth is predicated of sentences on the left hand, such as biconditionals, then deflationism is false. On the other hand, if it is interpreted as a propositional theory, then it is trivial examining another simple instance of the standard equivalent schema. Grass is green is true if and only if grass is green. The objection is just that if the italicized words are taken as a sentence, then it is false because something more is required for the whole st statement to be true than merely the fact that grass is green is true. It is also necessary for the sentence grass is green means that grass is green, and the further linguistic fact is not dealt with in the equivalent schema. However, we have now assumed that grass is green on the left-hand side refers to a proposition. Then the theory seems trivial since grass is green is defined as true if and only if grass is green. Note that the triviality involved here is not caused by the concept of truth, but by that of proposition. In any case, simply accepting the triviality of the propositional version implies that, at least within the deflationary theory of truth, there can be no explanation of the connection between sentences and things that they express the propositions. Normandy of assertion, Michael Dummett, among others, has argued that deflationism can account for the fact that truth should be normative goal of assertion. 
The idea is that truth plays a central role in the activity of stating facts. The deflationist response is the assertion that truth is the norm of assertion can be stated only in the form of the following infinite conjunction. One should assert the proposition that grass is green only if grass is green, and one should assert the proposition that lemons are yellow only if lemons are yellow, and one should assert the proposition that a square circle is impossible only if a squared circle is impossible. And this in turn could be reformulated for all propositions P. Speakers should assert the proposition that P only if the proposition that P is true. It may be the case that if we use the truth predicate to express this norm, not because it has anything to do with the nature of truth in some inflationary sense, but because it is a convenient way of expressing this otherwise inexpressible generalization. Okay, so appreciate anyone still sticking in there. So Orfeo IC3, a little bit tedious, but uh, you really want to, uh, you get uh, all these ideas and theories out there, and I'm going to have to return like in depth. So I'm just giving an overview and, and a little touching on the surface of these theories. So I'm going to read a little part of the Stanford definition on the correspondence theory of truth also, because it's the most popular theory of truth. And then also we can look at the identity theory of truth. Correspondence theory of truth. Narrowly speaking, the correspondence theory of truth is the view that truth is correspondence to or with a fact, a view that was advocated by Russell and Moore early in the 20th century, but the label is usually applied much more broadly to any view explicitly embracing the idea that truth consists in relation to reality that truth is a relational property involving a characteristic relation to be specified in some portion of reality to be specified. The basic idea has been expressed in many ways, giving rise to an extended family of theories and more often theory sketches. Members of the family employ various concepts for the relevant relations, correspondence, conformity, congruence, agreement, accordance, copying, picturing, signification, representation, reference, and satisfaction, and or various concepts for the relevant portion of reality facts, states of affairs, conditions, situations, events, objects, sequences of objects, sets, properties, tropes, the resulting multiplicity of versions and reformulations of the theory is due to a blend of substantive and terminological differences. The correspondence theory of truth is often associated with metaphysical realism. Its traditional competitors, pragmatists, as well as coherentist, verificationists, and other epistemic theories of truth are often associated with idealism, anti-realism, or relativism. In recent years, these traditional competitors have been virtually replaced, at least in terms of publication space, by deflationary theories of truth and, to a lesser extent, by the identity theory. Um, note that these new competitors are typically not associated with anti-realism. Still more recently, two further approaches have received considerable attention. One is truth maker theory. It is sometimes viewed as a competitor to two, sometimes as a more liberal version of the correspondence theory, though there is pluralism. It incorporates a correspondence account of as one, but only one ingredient of its overall account of truth. So I'm just going to look at number one and two here. History of the correspondence theory. The correspondence theory is often traced back to Aristotle's well-known definition of truth to say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, that it is, is false. Well, to say what is that it is, and of what is not that is not is true. But virtually identical formulations can be found in Plato. It is noteworthy that these definitions do not highlight the basic correspondence intuition, although it does allude to relation to reality. The relation is not made very explicit, and there's no specification about of what on the part of reality is responsible for the truth of a saying. As such, the definition offers a muted, relatively minimal version of correspondence theory. Aristotle sounds much more like a genuine correspondence theorist in the categories where he talks of an underlying thing that makes statements true and implies that these things are logically structured situations of facts. Most influential in Aristotle's claim that thoughts are likeness of things, although he nowhere defines truth in terms of thoughts likeness to a thing or fact, it is clear that such definition would fit well into his overall philosophy of mind. Metaphysical and semantic versions. In medieval offers, we find a division between metaphysical and semantic versions of co the correspondence theory. The former indebted to the truth as likeness theme suggested by Aristotle's overall views. The latter are model, the latter are model in Aristotle's more austere definition from metaphysics. 
The metaphysical version presented by Thomas Aquinas is best known as truth is the equation of a thing and intellect, where he restates as a judgment is said to be true when it conforms to the external reality. He tends to use conformitas and adequatio, but also uses correspondentia, giving the latter a more generic sense. Aquinas credits the Neoplatonist Isaac Israeli with this definition, but there is no such definition in Isaac. Correspondence formulations can be traced back to the academic skeptics or Cernades, Sir, Sir 2nd century BC, whom Sectus Empiricus reports as having taught that a presentation is true when it is in accord, symphonos, with the object presented and is false when it is in discord with it. Similar accounts can be found in various early commentators on Plato and Aristotle, including some Neoplatonist Proclos, speaks of truth as the agreement or adjustment between knower and the known. Uh, Philoponus emphasizes that truth is neither in the things or states of affairs themselves, nor in the statement itself, but lies in the agreement between the two. He gives the simile of the fitting shoe, the fit consisting in a relationship between shoe and foot, not to be found in either one by itself. Note that his emphasis on the relationship as opposed to its relata is laudable, but potentially misleading, because X truth is being true is not to be identified with a relation of uh, between uh, R between X and Y, but with a general relational property of X uh, taking uh, this mathematical form. Further earlier correspondence function formulations can be found in Avancina and Averos. They were introduced to the classics by William Oxer, who may have been the intended recipients of Aquinas' mistaken attribution. Aquinas' balanced formulation of equal of thing and intellect is intended to leave room for the idea that true can be applied not only to thoughts and judgments, but also to things or persons, like a true friend. Aquinas explains that the thought is said to be true because it conforms to reality, whereas a thing or person is said to be true because it conforms to a thought. A friend is true insofar as and because he conforms to our or God's conception of what a friend ought to be. Medieval theologians regard both judgment truth as well as thing-person truth as somehow flowing from or grounded in the deepest truth, which is, according to the Bible, is God. I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14, 6. Their attempts to integrate this biblical passage with more ordinary thinking involving truth gave rise to a deep metaphysical theological reflections, the notion of thing, person, truth, which thus played a very important role in medieval thinking, is disregarded by modern and contemporary analytical philosophers, but survives to some extent in existentialist and continental philosophy. Medieval authors who prefer a semantic version of the correspondence theory often use a peculiarly truncated form to render Aristotle's definition. A mental sentence is true if and only if it signifies so to it, so it is. This emphasis, the semantic relation of signification, while remaining maximally elusive about what the it is, is signified by a true sentence and de-emphasizing the correspondence relation, putting it into a little word as and so, foreshadowing a favorite approach of the 20th century medieval uh, semanticists like Occam and Burdam give exhaustive lists of different truth condition of clauses of sentences of different grammatical categories. They refrain from associating true sentences in general with items from a single ontological category. Authors of the modern period generally convey the impression that the correspondence theory of truth is far too obvious to merit much or any discussion. Brief statements of some version of it can be found in almost all major writers, like Descartes, Spinoza, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, Kant, uh, Berkeley, who does not seem to offer any account of truth, is a potentially significant exception due to the influence of Thomism. Metaphysical version of the theory are much more popular with the moderns than semantic versions, but since the moderns generally subscribe to a representational theory of mind, the theory of ideas, they would seem to ultimately committed to spelling out relations like correspondence or conformity in terms of psychosemantic representations related to holding between ideas or sentential sequences of ideas like lacks mental propositions and appropriate portions of reality, thereby affecting a merger between metaphysical and semantic versions of the correspondence theory. Object-based and fact-based versions. 
It is helpful to distinguish between object-based and fact-based versions of correspondence theory, depending on whether the correspondence portion of reality is said to be an object or a fact. Traditional versions of object-based theories assume that the truth-bearing items usually taken to be judgments have subject predicate structure. An object-based definition of truth might look like this. A judgment is true if and only if the predicate corresponds to its object, I, like the object referred to by the subject term of the judgment. Note that this actually involves two relations to an object, a reference relation holding between the subject term and the judgment of the object the judgment is about its object and the correspondence relation holding between the predicate term of the judgment and a property of the object owing to its reliance on the subject predicate structure of truth bearing items. The account suffers from inherent limitation. It does not cover truth bearers that lack subject predicate structure, con conditionals and disjunctions, and it's not clear how the account might be extended to cover them. The problem is obvious and serious. It was nevertheless simply ignored in most writings. Object-based correspondence was usually was the norm until relatively recently. Object-based correspondence became the norm through Plato's pivotal engagement with the problem of falsehood, which was apparently notorious at its time in a number of dialogues. Plato came up against an argument advanced by a very sophist to the effect that false judgment is impossible. Roughly to judge falsely is to judge what is not, but one cannot judge what is not, for it is not there to be judged. To judge something that is not is to judge nothing, hence not to judge at all. Therefore, false judgment is impossible. Plato has no good answer to this patent absurdity until the sophist, where he finally confronts the issue at length. The key step in his solution is the analysis of truth bearers as structure, structured complexes. A simple sentence such as Theotetus sits, though simple as a sentence, is still a complex whole consisting of words of different kinds, a name and a verb having different functions. By weaving together verbs with names, the speaker does not just make a number of things, but accomplishes something meaningful speech expressive in the interweaving of ideas. The simple sentence is true when Theodosius, the person named by the name, is in the state of sitting ascribed to him through the verb, and false when the Theotetus is not in the state, but in another one. Only things that are show up in this account. In the case of falsehood, the ascribed state still is, but is a state different to the one Theotetus is in. The account is extended from speech to thought and belief via Plato's well-known thesis that thought is speech that occurs without voice inside the soul in conversation with itself. The historical origin of the language of thought hypothesis, the account does not take into consideration sentences that contain a name of something that is not. Thus bequeathing up to posterity a residual problem that would become more notorious than the problem of falseness. Aristotle adopts Plato's account without much ado. Indeed, the beginning of uh, the interpretations reads like a direct continuation of the passage from the Sophis mentioned above. He emphasizes the truth and falsehood have to do with combination and separation. Unlike Plato, Aristotle feels the need to characterize simple affirmation and negative statements separately, translating rather more literally than is usual. An affirmation is a predication of something towards something. A negation is a predication of something away from something. This characterization reappears early in the prior analytics. It is thus fair to say that the subject predicate analysis of simple declarative sentences, the most basic feature of Aristotelian term logic, which was to reign supreme for many centuries, had its origin in Plato's response to a sophistical argument against the possibility of falsehood. One may note that Aristotle's famous definition of truth actually begins with the definition of falsehood. Fact-based correspondence theories became prominent in the 20th century, though one can find remarks in Aristotle that fit this approach. Somewhat surprisingly, in light of his repeated emphasis on subject predicate structure, wherever truth and falseness are concerned, fact-based theories do not presuppose that the truth-bearing items have subject predicate structure. Indeed, they can be stated without any explicit reference to the structure of truth-bearing items. The approach thus embodies an alternative response to the problem of falsehood, a response that may claim to extricate the theory of truth from the limitations imposed on it through the presupposition of subject predicate structure inherited from the response to a problem of falsehood favored by Plato, Aristotle, and the medieval and modern tradition. The now classical formulation of a fact-based correspondence theory was foreshadowed by Hume and Mill. It appears in its canonical form early in the 20th century and more, and Russell, thus a belief is true when there is a corresponding fact and is false when there is no corresponding fact. The self-conscious emphasis of, on facts and the corresponding portions of reality and a more serious concern with problems raised by falsehood distinguishes this version from its foreshadowings. Russell and Moore 
forcefully advocated advocacy of truth as correspondence to fact was at the time an integral part of their defense of metaphysical realism. Somewhat ironically, their formulations are indebted to their idealist opponents, Bradley and Joachim. The latter was an early advocate of the competing coherence theory who had set up a correspondence to the fact account of truth as the main target of his attack on realism. Later, Wittgenstein and Russell developed logical atomism, which introduced an important modification on fact-based correspondence approach, further modifications of the correspondence theory, bringing a return to more overtly semantic and broadly object-based versions were introduced by Tarski's technical work on truth. Truth bearers, truth makers, and truth. So Dave, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Truth bearers, correspondence theories of truth have been given for beliefs, thought, ideas, judgments, statements, assertions, utterances, sentences, and propositions. It become customary to talk of truth bearers whenever one wants to stay neutral between these choices. Five points should be kept in mind. One, the term truth bearer is somewhat misleading. It is intended to refer to bearers of truth or falsehood, true value bearers, or alternatively to things of which it makes sense to ask whether they are true or false, thus allowing for the possibility that some of them might be neither. Two, one distinguishes between secondary and primary truth bearers. Secondary truth bearers are those whose truth values are derived from the truth values of primary truth bearers, whose truth values are not derived from any other truth bearer. Consequently, the term true is usually regarded as ambiguous, taking its primary meaning when applied to primary truth bearers and various secondary meanings when applied to other truth bearers. This is, however, not a brute ambiguity since the secondary meanings are supposed to be derived definable from the primary meaning together with additional relations. For example, one might hold that propositions are true or false in the primary sense, whereas sentences are true or false in the secondary sense, insofar as they express propositions that are true or false in the primary sense. The meaning of true, when applied to truth bearers of different kinds, are thus connected in a manner familiar with from what Aristotelians called analogical uses of a term. Nowadays, one would call this focal meaning, healthy and healthy organisms and healthy food, the latter being defined as healthy in the secondary sense of contributing to the healthiness of an organism. It is often unproblematic to advocate one truth, one theory of truth for bearers of one kind and another theory for bearers of a different kind, like deflationary theory of truth or an identity theory applied to propositions could be a component of some form of correspondence theory of truth for sentences. Different theories of proof applied to bearers of different kinds do not automatically compete. The standard segregation of truth theories into competing camps proceed under the assumption, really a pretense, that they are intended for primary truth bearers of the same kind. Four, confusingly, there's little agreement as to which entities are properly taken to be primary truth bearers. Nowadays, the main contender are public language sentences, sentences of the language of thought, and propositions. Popular early contenders, beliefs, judgments, and statements, and assertions have fallen out of favor mainly for two reasons. Um, the problem of logical complex truth bearers and the duality of state context uh, act object. The noun belief can be the state of believing or the content to what is believed in the former state of believing can be said to be true or false if the highly questionable then only insofar as the latter what is believed is true or false. Similarly for nouns referring to mental acts or their objects such as judgment statements and assertions. So the problem of logically complex truth bearers, the subject S may hold a disjunctive belief well, believing only one or neither of their disjuncts. Also S may hold a conditional belief without believing the antecedent of the Consequent. Also, S will usually hold a negative belief without believing what is negated. In such cases, the true values of S complex belief depend on the true values of their constituents, although the constituents may not be believed by S or by anyone. This means that the view according to which beliefs are primary truth bearers seems unable to account for how the true values of complex beliefs are connected to the true values of simpler constituents. To do this, one needs to be able to apply truth and falseness to believe constituencies even when they are not believed. This point, which is equally fundamental for a proper understanding of logic, was made by all early advocates of propositions. The problem arises in much the same form for views that would take judgment statements and assertions as primary truth bearers. The problem is not easily evaded. Talk of unbelieved beliefs, unjudged judgments, unstated statements, on 
asserted assertions is either absurd or simply amounts to talk of unbelieved, unjudged, unstated, unasserted propositions or sentences. It is noteworthy, incidentally, that quite a few philosophical proponents run afoul of this simple observation that they are unasserted and unbelievable truth bearers. And five, mental sentences were the preferred primary truth bearers throughout the medieval period. They were neglected in the first half of the 20th century, but may come back in the second half through the revival of representational theory of the mind. Somewhat confusingly, for many centuries, the term proposition was reserved exclusively for sentences written, spoken, or mental. This use was made official by Bothius in the 6th century and is still found in Locke's essay in 1705 and Mill's Logic in 1843. Sometime after that, uh, more in 1901, propositions which sides the term now being used for what is said by uttering a sentence for what is believed, judged, stated, assumed, with occasional reversions to medieval usage, like in Russell. Truth makers. Talk of truth makers serve the function of similar but correlative to talk of truth bearers. A truth maker is anything that makes some truth bearer true. Different versions of the correspondence theory will have a different and often competing views about what sort of items true truth bearers correspond to. It is convenient to talk about truth makers. Whenever one wants to stay neutral between these choices, four points should be kept in mind. One, the notion of truth maker is tightly connected with and dependent on the relational notion of truth making. A truth maker is whatever stands in the truth making relation to some truth bearer. Despite the causal overtones of maker and making, the relation is usually not supposed to be a causal relation. The term truth making and truth maker are ambiguous. Two. Note that anyone proposing a definition or account of truth can avail themselves of the notion of truth making in the sense a coherence theory advocating that belief is true, if and only if it coheres with other beliefs. They can say what makes a true belief true is its coherence with other beliefs. So in truth making and truth maker do not signal any affinity with the basic idea underlying the correspondence theory of truth, whereas on um, the other use, these terms do signal such an affinity. Three, talk of truth making and truth makers goes well beyond the basic idea underlying the correspondence theory. Hence, it might seem natural to describe traditional fact based correspondence theory as maintaining that the truth makers and facts and that the correspondence relation in, is the truth making relation. However, this assumption that the correspondence relation can be regarded as the truth making relation is dubious. Correspondence appears to be symmetric relation, whereas it is usually taken for granted that truth making is an asymmetric relation or at least not a symmetric one, it is hard to see how a symmetric relation could be an asymmetric or non-symmetric relation. And four, talk of truth-making and truth-makers is frequently employed during informal discussions involving truth, but tends to be dropped when a more formal or official formulation of truth, theory of truth, is produced. However, in recent years, the informal talk has been turned into official doctrine, truth-maker theory. This theory should be distinguished from informal truth-maker talk. Not everyone employing the latter would subscribe to the former. Moreover, truth-maker theory should not simply be assumed to be a version of the correspondence theory. Indeed, some advocates present it as a competitor to the correspondence theory. Truth. The abstract noun truth has various usage. It can be used to refer to the general relation property otherwise referred to as being true, Though the latter labor would be more perspicuous, it is rarely used even in philosophical discussions. The noun truth can be used to refer to the concept that picks out the property and is expressed in English by the adjective true. Some authors do not distinguish between the concept and property. Others do or should. An account of the concept might differ significantly from an account of the property. To mention just one example, one might maintain with some plausibility that an account of the concept ought to succumb to the liar's paradox. Otherwise, it would be an adequate account of our concept of truth. This idea is considerably less plausible in the case of the property. Any proposed definition of truth might be intended as a definition of the property or as the concept of both. Its author may or may not be alive to the difference. The noun truth can be used finally to refer to some set of true truth bearers, possibly unknown as in the truth is out there and the truth about this matter will never be known. And this goes on and on with more detailed logical formulations and some of the objections 
or different theories. So, so this is a huge topic, and you know, so this is not really even a deep dive into truth. It's more just an introduction. And uh, the last one of these theories I'm going to cover is the identity theory of truth. I'm going to read a few sections of this. The identity theory of truth was influential in the formative years of modern analytical philosophy has come to prominence again recently. Broadly speaking, it's, it sees itself as a reaction against correspondence theories of truth, which maintains that truth bearers are made true by facts. The identity theory maintains against this that at least some truth bearers are not made true by but are identical with facts. The theory is normally applied not at the level of declarative sentences, but to what such sentences express. And it is these items, or again, some of them, that are held to be identical with facts. Identity theorists diverge over the details of this general picture, depending on what exactly they take declarative sentences to express, whether Freudian thoughts at the level of sense, Rossellian propositions at the level of reference, or both, and depending also on how exactly facts are construed. But to give a precise illustration, an identity the theorist who thinks that declarative sentences express Rossellian propositions will typically hold that such that true propositions are identical with facts. The significance of the identity theory for its supporters is that it appears to make available the closing of a certain gap that might otherwise be thought to open up between language and world and or between mind and role. If its supporters are right about this, the identity theory true potentially has profound consequences both on metaphysics and the philosophy of mind and language. So read through parts of this. Historical background. The identity theory of truth was first used, or at any rate, first used in the relevant sense by Stuart Candlish in his article on uh, Bradley published in 1989, but the general theory, idea of the theory had been error uh, in the air during the 1980s, for example, in discussion first published in 1985 concerning John Mackey's theory of truth. McDowell criticized that theory for making truth consist in a relation of correspondence rather than identity between how things are and how things are represented as being. The implication is that identity would be the right way to conceive the given relation, and versions of the identity theory go back at least to Bradley. For further discussions, uh, see Candlish, uh, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning the history of truth. The theory can be found in G. Moore's The Nature of Judgment, 1899, and the entry he wrote on truth for Baldwin's Dictionary of Philosophy and Psychology in 1902. Russell embraced the identity theory at least during the period of his 1904 discussion of Maynong, uh, possibly also in the principles of mathematics in 1903 and a few years after these publications as well. Frege has a statement on the theory as 1919 essay, The Thought, and may have held it earlier Whitkinson's Tractatus 1922 is usually held to propound a correspondence rather than identity theory of truth. However, this is questionable. The Tractatus declarative sentences are said to be facts, arrangements of names, and states of affairs are also said to be facts, arrangements of objects. In the Tractatus, it is taken to put forward a correspondence theory of truth that then presumably the idea is that a sentence will be true just if there is an appropriate relation or correspondence and isomorphism between sentence and the state of affairs. However, the problem with this interpretation is that in the tractus, a relation of isomorphism between a sentence and reality is generally conceived as a condition for of the meaningfulness of that sentence, not specifically of its truth. Full sentences as well as true are isomorphic within states of affairs only in their case the states of affairs do not obtain. For Wittgenstein, states of affairs may either obtain or fail to obtain. Both possibilities are, in general, available to them. Accordingly, it has been suggested that Tractatus contains two different conceptions of fact, a factive and a non-factive one. According to the former conception, facts necessarily obtain, or in the case according to the latter, facts may fail to obtain or not be the case. This non-factive conception has been discerned at uh, Tractatus, uh, given that in the Tractatus states of affairs, and perhaps facts have two poles obtaining or being the case and not obtaining and not being the case, it seems to follow that while Wittgenstein is committed to a correspondence theory of meaning, his theory of truth must be an identity theory along the lines of a declarative statement is, is true just if what 
it is semantically correlated with is identical with an obtained state of affair. Identity theory normally presupposes the factive concept of facts so that factive is redundant in the phrase fact of facts and that it is a policy which is followed here. Though a bipolar conception of facts, if indeed Wittgenstein has, has it, it may seem odd, the bipolar conception of the state of affairs, which is generally agreed, seems quite neutral. Here the identity theorist says that the true proposition is identical with obtaining state of affairs. Peter Sullivan has stated a different way of imputing an identity theory to the Tractarian Wittgenstein, his idea that Wittgenstein's simple objects are to be identified with Fragan senses, and that the effect of the tractus contains an identity theory along the lines. Sullivan's ground for treating Tractarian objects as senses is like a bona fide Fragan sense that are transparent. They cannot be grasped in different ways. An apparent difficulty with this view is that there is possibly more to Fragan sense than just the property of transparency. After all, Russell also attached the property of transparency to his basic objects, but it has not been suggested that Russellian basic objects are really senses, and that suggestion would seem to have little going on for it, partly though not only because Russell himself disavowed the whole idea of fragrance in a fragrant sense. The orthodox position, which will be presupposed here, is that the tractarian Wittgenstein like Russell finds no use for a level of fragrant sense, so that his semantic hierarchy consists exclusively of levels of language and reference with knowing of a mediatory or similar nature located between these levels. Wittgenstein does appeal to the concepts of a sense and reference in the tractus, but it's generally agreed that they do not figure in a Fragian way according to which both names and sentences are used, have both sense and reference, for which you can see by contrast, sentences have a sense but not a reference, whereas names have references but not a sense. So the motivation. Hey, Claire, good to see you. God bless. Motivation. What motivates the identity theory of truth? It can be viewed as a response to difficulties that seem to accrue to at least some versions of the correspondence theory. The correspondence theory of truth holds that truth consists in a relation of correspondence between something linguistics or quasi-linguistics on the one hand and something worldly on the other. Generally, the items of the worldly end of the relation are taken to be facts, obtaining states of affairs. For many purposes, these two latter kinds of entities Facts obtained states of affairs are assimilated to one another, and that strategy will be followed here. The exact nature of the correspondence theory will then depend on what the other relatum is taken to be. The item mentioned so far make available three distinct versions of the correspondence theory, depending on whether the relatum is taken to consist of declarative sentences, Fragian thoughts, or Russellian propositions. Modern correspondence theorists make a distinction between truth bearers, which would typically fall under one of these three classifications and truth makers, the worldly entities making truth bearers true when they are true. If these dire entities are facts, then true declarative sentences, Fragian thoughts, or Russellian propositions, whichever one of these selects the as a verata to the correspondence relation of the language side of the language world divide, corresponds to facts in the sense that the facts are what make those sentences, thought, or propositions true when they are true. Henceforth, we shall know not normally speak simply of thoughts and propositions, understanding these to be Fragian thoughts and Russellian propositions respectively, and thus otherwise specified. That according to the correspondence theory and the identity theorists can agree so far, immediately gives us a constraint on the shape of worldly facts. Take our sample sentence, Socrates is wise, and recall that this sentence is here assumed to be true at the level of a reference we encounter the object Socrates in assuming realism about properties, the property of wisdom. Both of these may be taken to be entities of the world, but as plausible that neither amounts to a fact, neither amounts to a plausible truth maker for the sentence Socrates is wise or for the expressed thought or for its expressed proposition. That is because the man Socrates just as such and the property of wisdom just as such are not. So the argument goes propositionally structured either jointly or severally and do not amount to enough to make it true that Socrates is wise. Even if we add in further universal, such as the relation of instantiation, and indeed the instantiation of instantiation to any degree, the basic point seems to be unaffected. In fact, it could plausibly be maintained that the man Socrates, just as such, is not even competent to make it true that Socrates exists, for that we need the existence of a man Socrates. Hence, it would appear that if there is to be any truth makers in the world, they will have to be structured syntactically or quasi-syntactically in the same general way as declarative sentences. 
thoughts and propositions. For convenience, we can refer to the structure in this general sense as propositional structure. The point then is that neither Socrates nor the property of wisdom nor the relation of instantiation is just as such propositionally structured. Following this line of argument, though, we reach the conclusion that nothing short of full-blown propositionally structured entities like the fact that Socrates is wise will be competent to make sentences Socrates is wise or the thought proposition expressed by that sentence true. The question that arises here is whether tropes might be able to provide a thinner alternative such an ontology, rich entities as the fact that Socrates is wise. One problem that seems to confront any such strategy is that making the proposed alternative a genuine one that is of construing the relevant tropes in such a way that they do not simply collapse into or ontologically depend on entities of the relatively rich form that Socrates is wise. This question facing the correspondence theorist is now, if such propositionally structured entities are truth makers and they truth makers for sentences, are they truth makers for sentences, thoughts, or proposition? It is at this point that the identity theorist finds the correspondence theory unsatisfactory. Consider first the suggestion that the worldly fact that Socrates is wise is the truth maker for the reference level proposition that Socrates is wise. These surely are such facts that the fact that Socrates is wise we talk about such things all the time. The problem would seem to not be with the existence of such fact, but rather with the relation of correspondence, which is said by the version of the correspondence theory that we are currently considering to obtain between the fact that Socrates is wise and the proposition that Socrates is wise. As emerges from the way of expressing the difficulty, there seems to be no linguistics difference between the way we talk about propositions and the way we talk about facts when these entities are specified by that clauses that suggests that facts are just true propositions. If that is right, then the relationship between true facts and true propositions is not one of correspondence, which is pretty famously observed, implies the distinctiveness of the relata, but identity. This line of argument can be strengthened by noting the following point about explanation. Correspondence theories have typically wanted the relationship of correspondence to explain truth. They've usually wanted to say that it beca is because the proposition that Socrates is wise corresponds to the fact that it is true, and because the proposition that Socrates is foolish, or rather it is not the case that Socrates is wise, does not correspond to the fact that it is false. But the distance between the two, true proposition that Socrates is wise and the fact that Socrates is wise seems to be too small to provide for explanatory leverage. Indeed, the identity theorists claim that there is no distance at all. Suppose we ask, why is the proposition that Socrates is wise true? If we reply by saying that it is true because it is the fact that Socrates is wise, we seem to explain nothing but merely repeated ourselves. So correspondence apparently gives way to identity as the relation which must hold or fail to hold between a proposition and state of affairs if the proposition is to be true or false. The proposition is true just if it is identical with the obtaining state of affairs and if false if it is not. And it would seem to be if the identity theorist is right about this disposition, explanatory pretensions will have to be abandoned for well, it is will be correct to say that a proposition is true just if it is identical of a fact. False otherwise is hard to see that much of a substance has thereby been said about truth. It might be said, it might be replied here that there are circumstances in which we tolerate statements of the form A because B when an appropriate identity, perhaps even identity of sense or reference or both ob obtains between A and B. For example, when we say things like, he is your first cousin because he's the child of a sibling of one of your parents. But here it is plausible that there is a definitional connection between left-hand side and right-hand side, which seems not to hold the proposition that Socrates is wise is true because is, it is a fact that Socrates is wise. If the latter case, there is surely no question of definition. Rather, we are supposed to, according to the correspondence theorist, to have an example of a metaphysical explanation, and this is just what, according to the identity theorist, we do not have. After all, the identity theorist will insist, it seems obvious that the relation, whatever it is, between the proposition that Socrates is wise and the fact that Socrates is wise must, given that proposition is true, be an extremely close one. What could this relationship be if the identity theorist is right that the relation cannot be one of metaphysical explanation? Then it looks as though it will be hard to resist the insinuation of the linguistic data and the relation of its one ident of is one of identity. It is for this reason that identity theorists sometimes insist that the proposition should not be defined in terms of identity between truth bearer and truth maker. That way of expressing the theory looks too much like a thrall to correspondence theorist talk. 
for the identity theorists to speak of both truth makers and truth bearers would imply that things allegedly doing the truth making were distinct from the things that were made true. But since the identity theorists view there are no truth makers distinct from the truth bearers, if the latter are conceived as propositions, and since nothing can make itself true, it follows that there are no truth makers simpliciter, only truth bearers. It seems to follow too that it would be ill-advised to attack the identity theory by pointing out that some or all truth lack truth makers. So long as truths are taken to be propositions, that is exactly what identity theorists themselves say. From the identity theorist's point of view, truth maker theory looks very much like an exercise in splitting the level of reference in half and then finding a bogus match between the two halves. For example, when David Armstrong remarks that what is indeed what is needed is something in the world which ensures that A is F for some truth maker or ontological ground for A's being F, what can this be except for the state of affairs of A's being F? The identity theorist is likely to retort that A's being F, which according to Armstrong ensures that A is F just is the entity that A is F. The identity theorist maps conceptual connections that we draw between the notions of proposition, truth, false liberty, state of affairs, and fact. These connections look trivial when spelled out. Of course, an identity theorist will counter that to go further would be to fall into error, so that to speak of an identity theory can readily appear too grand. So much for the thesis that facts are truth makers and propositions are truth bearers. An exactly parallel argument applies to the version of the correspondence theory that treats facts as truth makers and thoughts as truth bearers. Consider now a suggestion that attaining the state of affairs as the correspondence theorist conceives them makes declarative sentences true. In this case, there appears to be no threat of triviality of the sort that apparently plagued the previous versions of the correspondence theory because states of affairs like that Socrates is wise are generally distinct from linguistic items such as the sentence Socrates is wise. To the extent friends of the identity theory need not jib at the suggestion that such sentences have worldly truth makers if that is how relation of correspondence is being glossed. But they might question the appropriateness of the gloss, for they might point out that it does not seem possible without falsification to draw detailed links between sentences and bits of the world. After all, different sentences in the same or different languages can correspond to the same bit of the world, and these different sentences might have very different components. The English sentence, these are cows, contains three words, and there are three bits in the world corresponding to the sentence and the making and making it true. The sentence cows exist contains only two words, but not the correspondence theorists want to say that it is what made true by the same chunk of reality. And when we take other languages into account, there seems in principle to be no reason to privilege any particular number and say that a sentence corresponding to the relevant segment of reality must contain that number of words. Why might there not in principle be sentences of actual or possible languages such as n is greater than one, there exists a sentence comprising n words and meaning the same in English, there are cows. In a nutshell, then, the identity theorist's case against correspondence theory is that when the truth-making relation is conceived as originating a worldly fact and having as its other relatum a true sentence, they claim that the relation is one of correspondence cannot be made out. If, on the other hand, the relevant relation targets a proposition, then that relation must be held to be one identity, not correspondence. Okay, so there is... The first part of the presentation for tonight, a lot of information. So you want to give a basis for theories of truth and uh, um, and yeah, a lot of information there. And I will be returning to these in depth, you know, for the multiple truth hypothesis you know, my due diligence. These are very complicated things. A lot of people have never even heard of this stuff. And, you know, within the philosophy of science, um, you know, Dave, if you want to hop on, I'm going to say my lightly Krishma, and then I'm going to go into the rest of my material I have on explanatory power and um, inference to the best explanation. And then, you know, connection to Bayesian reasoning some similarities to active uh, inference, and then I have something on truth tests related to Jewish law. So uh, um, let's take a two-minute break. 
So we got Claire here. Hello. Hey, Claire. How's it going? Hello. Hi. How are things? Thank God. Brooke Hashem. Uh, well, on the question of truth, um, I guess people believe what they want to believe, and they will pretend to believe in stuff if the... If, if there is social and political pressure to do so. Well, and that's, that's why I point out the, the purpose of truth is to make it mind independent and separate from belief. And yes, I mean, so people like your know, church of entropy, Hindus, Ashish Dalela, uh, you know, maybe like some pan psychist claim that that's impossible. Uh, you know, however, like you're know, generally the scientific method and, um, Enlightenment philosophy, at least that was the goal, is that truth has nothing to do with the mind. And although you know we have minds and we use our mind to decipher truths, that the ultimate reality of truth is, you know, so to say, mind independent. You mean we are selective with the truths that we choose to acknowledge for social and political reasons. Well, I mean, the psychology of what people believe. So you could talk about, well, people believe things to be true, but that's completely irrelevant from what's true and not true. So the yes. theories, of, the theories of truth has nothing to do with belief. So I'm saying I know, that, but, 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 people but, but, can believe whatever they want, and you could try to understand why people believe what they believe. But I mean, that's largely immaterial to these theories of what is truth, and then the methods for deciphering truth that uh, you sort of say is independent of belief. I, I know. I mean, truth is an absolute standard, and sometimes people might um, be believe in believe in what is true, and sometimes they will believe in what is false, and sometimes they will only pretend to believe in something for social and political reasons such as religions and political orthodoxies. Um, they, they might really believe in it, or they might just pretend to believe in it because they don't want to be marginalised and, you know, um, um, be seen as dissidents. Which, which well, you're still continued. focusing on the psychology. Yes. Well, I mean, I mean what if you look like the scientific or philosophical or metaphysical, like, it doesn't matter what people believe or why they believe it. You know, the point is, what is truth? How do, you truth? With you. How do you come to know truth? And you know, what, what people believe or, or why people believe is irrelevant. I mean, it might be an interesting subject of psychology, but that, that's it. It's that what you're talking about is just limited to a subfield of psychology as opposed to you know, the theory of truth. Well, talking about the theory of truth is, is completely irrelevant because we'll just get nowhere. Um, you know, the, the most important thing is political facts and political truths, and there, there's a lot of denial. You mean to you? You're saying to you the you're saying to you well, the yes, most. Yes, well, I mean, uh, if you're interested in politics, you don't seem to be, or, or you half are, or you half aren't. You're, you know, I guess you're trying to say yes and no at the same time. And what one well, I'm a person in the world. Like, I'm yeah. interested in all things. But I'm saying, like, relative but, but, to but it's just a rabbit hole. You've talked about the theory of truth. Nobody really cares. Nobody will ever um, arrive yeah, at a true theory of there. truth that that will satisfy everyone. So they they go for um, ideology. That you know, they may say one religion is is better than the other, or one political ideology is better than the other and and that that's the only thing worth discuss, discussing isn't it well maybe for you and you, uh, you haven't really got any further you you've just read okay. a whole bunch of stuff uh, I, I don't see anyone in the chat that's actually said anything coherent yeah but it's a tough topic and in, in reality the people who uh find this interesting are very limited in fact well, you know, well, the they're, they're, thinker, not even they're just being completely pretentious that they haven't made any sense i mean you know in, in in the um chat what have they made well what have they said that makes any sense i mean you talked about wisdom um nobody 
I mean, the obvious thing to do is define wisdom, but, but it seems no philosophy department even thinks to do that so that it might be cultivated. Um, well, is that there's only a few departments in the whole world that have philosophy of science. So like the you know, subject I'm interested in, the philosophy of science is not a popular subject. Within philosophy, like you know, metaphysics or epistemology, I mean, there might be a handful of people that study it. Uh, but I mean, generally, no, I mean, there's no whole departments. There might be a course or a few thinkers here and there that specialize in it. So I, uh, I, I don't quite see the philo philosophy of science. I mean, what is it really, you know, the, the, okay, we, we can think of something com controversial that is about science, which is Galileo and Copernicus, and they were saying certain things about the orbit of the earth and um you know wh wh who goes wrong whether the sun goes around the earth or the other way around and the church decided to say that galileo was to be ignored um presumably because it thought that if it admitted that it was wrong about geocentrism then it would cause people to doubt what else they might be wrong about so they ruthlessly suppressed scientific uh, truth, didn't they? That that was what they did. Yeah, I mean that's like what I was reading earlier about, like the Nietzschean view towards truth that the will to truth is subservient to the will to power, and that uh, you know, the truth is not necessarily valuable only insofar as it helps the will to power. Mm -hmm. And when there's a divergence between the will to power and the will to truth, that uh, the the truth should be subservient to power. So we're I mean, saying that, well, why was there this body of power? You're talking like high birth or low birth. They're saying, well, there's these people and they're in power and they're enforcing this rule, whether it's true or not. And, uh, you know, if I'm saying, well, I just want to know the truth. And, and she's like, well, you're know, like, well, why do you just want to know the truth? And I might not have a good answer. Well, I just want to know. And you know if you're you know going to be Nietzschean, well, how's that going to help you with power? It, it might not, and it might even uh, negatively affect uh, my coming to power. So well, that's just, you're making Nietzsche. that you know, like okay, like noted. Like I mean, I read that earlier in the Wikipedia, like the the, the Nietzsche's uh, views on that. Well, there are competing truths on that. We want to get, we want to be in power. But we also know that if we say whatever we like, we're not going to get into power because we'll be offending certain people who are above us. So it's really a question of status, isn't it? We um, we get to lie to people if we're journalists or politicians and they have to keep sucking it up because we are in the position above them if we are president or dictator and the, you know the, these peasants will just have to pretend to keep believing in our lies. I mean, this is the situation now, isn't it? That, that people only pretend to believe in so yeah. many things or, or they might get their channel deleted. Yeah, if you may the value proposition what you're saying and that... Uh like the correspondence theory of truth, if you're going to have like T capital one equals one and it's predictive 100% of the time, um, it's not going to be that case. So you have a hypothesis of a social or psychological phenomenon and it's certainly not predictive 100% of the time. So it might be, you know, a theory, it could have like a 90% predictive power, meaning like what you know whatever you just expressed corresponds to reality 90% of the time, although 10% of the cases are not going to be in line with your statement, but that's still good enough for you to uh, live your life according to this uh, majority correctly predictive principle. Uh, but, uh, you know, statement, well, is it true in, uh, you know, correspondence was that, well, it corresponds to the truth of majority. It corresponds to reality a majority of times However, it is not... Can you give an example of such a thing? Well, I'm saying just your social commentator there on human nature. So I'm just saying, like, like I, I would say that, yeah, but you might be correct 90% of the time where you have to do, like, a study, but, like, I would highly doubt that it's, a, so to say, a true rule 
that applies all the time. As like okay, well, we're not even sure what, 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 what truth we're arguing about, so it, it's too vague. I'm happy to you know, make it a proposition. So I'm going to say that America doesn't have an official religion. Um, I, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me about that. And, and, the, and the next point of discussion yeah, maybe maybe it's, a it's a good thing that america doesn't have an official religion yes i mean we're, now we're delving into the semantics where you're making statements i am making statements you're trying to make, that's the only way to, to have make a communicative this, this, value. this discussion have any point at all well it's a meta discussion so i mean it's like uh derrida or like deconstruction so like i'm deconstructing your words in the semantics and trying to pull out the truth proposition. Well, it, I, it, 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 it's you can't deny that America doesn't have an official religion. And if you were um, being co cooperative, we could go on to discuss whether it's a good thing or not. Um, but but as it is, you you don't want to discuss the subject, and that's why you are attempting to deconstruct my very simple statement that you cannot deny America America doesn't have an official religion, and I'm saying it's bad for Americans and it's bad for the rest of the world. So um, the simplest thing that should be done to solve the problem is to get itself an official religion, and um, according to the title of your discussion. Um, we could um, actually arrive at what, what, what this religion might be, um, except that I, I think you don't wish to discuss it. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you debated or something, because, like, I mean, yeah, I've already heard your hypothesis multiple well, times. Well, then, then, then you could say, kind of... well, I'm wrong. I'm wrong that um, America doesn't have an official religion. I'm wrong that it's um, not a good thing that America doesn't have an, uh, an official religion. Um, I mean, that, that would be more interesting. Well, if you want to try to divide into, like, propositional logic, and you say like your first claim that America doesn't have an official religion, and you say that that would be assessed a truth value, and that might have a relatively high truth value in the, you know, express, like, well, there, there's a constitution, there's a, although you could make an argument that America does have an official religion, or you know, like in the term, like a consensus view of, uh, you, you say, well, you know, there's a constitution, there's legal protections, there's legal documents, although there's a consensus view where Christianity is the majority religion. And then you could argue because it's the consensus religion that it's the, uh, but so you're just giving that your statement that America doesn't have an official religion would probably be hard to assess to have a a truth value of one. Well, no, it's, e it's easy because because if you look at the Constitution, there is the, you know the, the First Amendment is is declaring that America doesn't have an official religion, isn't it? Yeah, but I'm saying to to assess the the entity. So you have the your truth bearers and your truth makers, and to say that the Constitution would be the definitive truth maker, and you know so uh, you know Claire's statement proposition: America doesn't have the official uh, religion proof constitution's first amendment says that america can't have a uh, official religion therefore the statement is accurate uh, but by saying that's just evidence it might be strong evidence however there might be contradictory evidence that uh, could negate the statement that you made and then you would assess the truth value to your statement but All just... right. So, so you're you're saying America does have an official religion, and it, it's Christianity because most people in America who say they have religion are Christian. It, it, is that is that your next statement? Well, I'm was saying that truth is a hard thing to um, officiate, and so from the um, consensus view of truth. You say, well, there's a document that says America can't have an official religion, but and then there'll, there'll be lots of dumb Americans, but who say, oh, but hey, we're Christian, and and my my next statement would would, would be, well, um, if if you are a Christian nation, what what does what what government policy support? Well, if you're just being Christian argumentative, itself? to be argumentative, I'm talking in forms of assessing a truth value. So I'm just saying your first claim that America doesn't have an official religion, um, I might agree has a very, has a 
relatively high truth value. Although I wouldn't say it's conclusively true, that uh, but it's a relatively high truth values that we could you know, relatively accept that statement as true. Okay, so, so we, we, we but, but I'd still say it doesn't have uh, definitive truth. It doesn't. It's not definitively true. It just has a high truth value likelihood of truth. Yes, um, I'm, because there, there are people, as you say, who, who will say, you know, we are a Christian nation, wouldn't they? Oh. I mean, Justice Brewer um, wrote books after this. Argument. Yeah, but you're just arguing to argue. So I say we could take. So we're just breaking what your statement into propositional logic. And so your second statement that America should have an official religion. Yes. That, one, that one's going to be substantially more difficult to assess as true. And even there, it might have a, a, a less than half truth value. If you, if you say that your first statement could have, you know, like a substantially high truth value of your second statement, America should have a, an official religion, certainly you could supply evidence to the claim, but you could supply substantial counter evidence to it. And it'd be very difficult to establish a high truth value to this second claim of yours that America should have an official religion. And I mean, so we're just breaking. Would you, would you like to give reasons about why America shouldn't have an official religion? Um, you know, we, we, we know that Washington said, we must, with caution, indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. That was in his farewell speech, read every year on his birthday on 22nd February. So, yeah, I mean, so, I mean you're just something evidence. about it. Yeah, I mean, it was going to take too long to debate this, but I said, that suffice it to say, like, yeah, you could probably supply a decent amount of evidence for your claim, but uh, it would also be relatively easy to supply uh, a large amount of counter evidence to that claim. Would you like to su supply that counter evidence? I didn't research it in advance, but I mean, just because that's not the current status and because the constitution uh, you uh, made protections against it and you might have to look like Madison or Adams and uh, you know, the various uh, discussions that, that um, I could, make things up but like I, i'd have to uh you know review probably like you know the founding fathers or the madison adams jefferson um that uh would have became the majority voice that uh you know why we have the first amendment in, in the establishing that we don't have an official religion um well actually you you could be um, Muslim and have the First Amendment because it is my thesis that the First Amendment is supported by Chapter 2, verse 256 of the Quran that says, there is no compulsion in belief. Truth stands clear from error. Yeah, so I mean, but, I mean relative, so if you want, you're breaking your, your thesis into propositional logic. And so you know, if you want to have the minimum number of propositions, and so if your first proposition, you know, there's the current state of affairs that America does not have a state religion. And so people could assess the true value, whether that is an accurate assessment of the current state of affairs. And then you're going to give an ought, an ought statement. Ought statements are much more difficult to validify that America, you know, saying the current status of reality is much easier to verify than an ought statement of reality. And I mean, even to some, from some metaphysical perspectives that it's uh, impossible to uh, validify an ought statement. But I mean, but if it, your proposition- I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to argue about it, but um, it, it seems that- I mean, just the metaphysics of truth and not even referring to your ought statement that you're arguing for, but any ought statement that you could validate the truth value of any odd statement well i i can i can put it simply I, I you know i know that this what i'm saying will be found controversial to americans who are saying who what are you saying we need a religion we, we're americans we don't need shit like religion because th that's what what you're, you're saying we we don't need no religion i'm, I'm not even referring to your specific we're, we're so statement. superior I'm just that we don't to, need religion i'm just referring to 
the fact that your argument necessitates an ought proposition. Of and course. All and, 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 and you, you can propositions argue are problematic it. by nature. Why? What, because, what's the truth maker and truth bearer of an ought statement? Well, I can say X and you can contradict me and you, you can use arguments to say, um, no, everything is fine in America. We're doing just fine. We don't need no religion. Well, I mean, if you just refer to the propositional logic as opposed to your argument and like any ought statement, you would say like you ought to be, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I ought, I'm better off alive than dead. I'm, you know, ought to uh, be in a state of pleasure than suffering. Any, any, even the most simplistic ought statement is hard to reduce to a propositional logic of a true statement. How do you validate an ought statement? And like, let, alone, very... let, alone, let alone your controversial ought statement. I'm talking about okay, any okay, ought okay, statement. Okay, so, so I'm saying it's a bad thing that uh, America doesn't have an uh, Yeah, but you can stop religion. focusing on and your you argument. Can, you, you can, because you because can for your argument, you have to... Why? You can ask because your argument why. necessitates that you have a proposition that's an ought statement. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying so I'm not even argu I'm, before I'm arguing and, and the then you, 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 can, you can argue about it by asking me why, but instead you're you're using all these big words, these long words to because I'm to, I'm deconstructing your argument. Yes, do, first, do, do do this by, by all means, I'm, and you can do it by, by asking I'm negating why. that you can have a proposition that's an ought. Okay, I, I I don't know what the hell you mean. Are you saying I shouldn't be making? Moral statements. What is you're saying that ought is a moral statement? Well, yes. Any ought claim is moral. Yes. You're saying like I ought to uh, anything, whatever you think. I I ought to uh, pay my taxes. I ought to uh, honor my, honor my parents. I ought to brush well, my why teeth. Why don't we concentrate on what I'm actually saying than what I'm not saying? I'm saying America. Because I'm deconstructing power. the. Your the logic value, the, the truth value You're of your statement. You're straw manning me. You're straw manning me. Well, why didn't I'm you just deal with my statement? That, because your statement is an ought, and I'm saying that regardless of your specific statement that you're saying, you mean of America ought to have a uh, official religion. So first, I'm picking at the just the ought. You're saying, how dare you make a moral statement? I'm not discussing it. Is, is it it's not, it's not, the moral statements aren't accessible by truth. No, so do, it, I can't, I can't assess. I can't assess the truth value. No, I, I can tell you how you can do it. You, 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 you can say, well, my religion is this, and and this is my moral reference to anything. And somebody else with a different moral system will say, I, I regard your, you know, moral system as wrong. I mean, that, that's how people argue, isn't it? They have um, different ideologies. No, I mean, it goes back to the first statement that, that we're talking about truth being mind independent. So you have to look at it from a mind, like an ought is, how can you, how can you deconstruct ought to be mind independent? And if it's mind dependent, then the truth assessment of it is either impossible or much more difficult. If it's a, if you could, if you could deconstruct your claim into a, a mind independent version, then it's more easily. Yes, to yes, I'm, I'm prepared. You know, so what you're asking me is support your argument with evidence and facts. Yes, that that that's the next logical statement for having a. Yeah, I'm saying if if it's a mind dependent claim, it's is either impossible or extremely difficult to support. No, no, you, okay. facts and arguments are, well, facts and arguments, right? It's not just my opinion that, that it's bad that America doesn't have, you know, I'm supporting it. I'm, I'm going to be saying things in support of my statement, saying that it is bad for America and its global empire but that's it a controls that claim. it doesn't have an official religion. But it's a and, and, and I'm, claim. I'm going to give, be giving um, evidence and arguments in support of it, and you're you're trying to divert me from doing that. No, I'm just pointing out that it's a mind-dependent claim. 
Well, I don't know what I mean. Well, we already know that it's it has to be more than my opinion that it that that it is a bad thing that America doesn't have a, a religion, and I'm about to support it with with evidence and. I, and I want you to support it with mind independent facts. Okay, I don't even know what the fuck that means. Well, I mean, because you don't have a, a background in philosophy or. A, no, well, I, I just don't see what what your philosophy is doing. You're you're just diverting. You're you're not you're using all these words to to not discuss this thing that I want to discuss. So so usually people will say, well, this is this may be your opinion, and everybody has an opinion supported with facts and arguments, and um, you're you're not doing this obvious next step which would make the discussion more interesting. You want to talk about what mind dependent truth or whatever. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm interested Okay, so, so what, give, give me an, what, what is it that you want? Some mind independent, dependent what? Well, I'm, I'm just deconstructing your argument. No, and... no, you are asking me to support my argument. I want to give it and, and you're using the, this, this well, okay, you want to just deconstruct my argument. You can you can only deconstruct my argument by asking me for evidence and arguments. Well, I, I'm deconstructing your argument by trying to translate it into logical form. And 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 what what is this? And, logical and so your first statement was the declarative statement. Yes. Which is. America doesn't have an official religion. Which is a. Uh, you're basically easy to translate directly into logical form. Your second statement is an ought statement, which is difficult or impossible to translate into logical form. So you're saying it's illogical to even talk about morality. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, it just, it can't be, it, 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 I'm saying, can't, I mean, you could still discuss it somewhat in logical form, but uh, a weaker form. So, so the truth claim of it, and then even like some sort of convincing argumentation that you would have to go for a weaker form of truth, like a mind dependent truth, as opposed to a mind independent truth. Can so you give first, examples your, of each? Your first statement could be deconstructed into a mind independent logical form. America. What does that mean? Can you give an example of this mind independent logical form? Well, if you're looking at the object, so the object of America and America might consist of people that have minds, but America is relatively a mind independent object. And then oh. religion relatively. Are you saying Americans are stupid? No, I'm just saying that. Americans could be described as an object. Well, yes, we can all be objects. Well, ideas are more difficult to be defined as objects. I, well, then, I think you're, you're you're deliberately distracting from the the arguments that I want to make. I mean, well, so I your mean, if you want to deconstruct my argument, well, so you your argument for... if your argument's invalid in the first place. Well, how is it invalid? Are you, are you saying it's wrong for me to even make a moral statement or, or, or state an opinion about what what things should be? Well, if it, if that well, if it's illogical, I'm mean, saying it can't be discussed in a, in a logical reference because it can, your statement semantic statement cannot be translated into logical form. So are you, you saying, uh, therefore, that all moral statements are illogical? Um, well, it is an argument. And I mean, so there might be methods, but yeah, that's why I say that, that like, how do you logically express ought? You're saying should. It would be better for for. So I'm saying government, if you make people. a statement about the state of reality and then you're making a state you're making a statement about a potential state of reality. Yeah, I'm making a prediction. You're not so making you, a prediction. You, I mean I mean if you're 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 making a statement about a potential state of reality that doesn't exist. 
yeah so so and i'm saying it would be better if if such and such were done obviously So and and, and you're you're going to say um no because whatever um which is what i expect well, you I mean, to do I can't to, get to, to that point of my saying statement. no without the logical formulation of can you even logically okay i i think you you, you want to avoid this discussion it, it, that that's what you want to do isn't it you you don't want to discuss a subject because it's seen as uh, taboo controversial you don't want this on your channel No, I'm just saying it's not a discussion. I mean, just you repeating yourself, basically. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm inviting you to deconstruct you're about... it. And, and, and you're, 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 you, you seem to be saying that it's illogical to make moral statements. Um, well, you could put it into some form of logical formulation. But not that would, but not that uh, could have a truth value assessment. I don't know what that means. Well, it's because you're not paying attention. Well, can you You're explain too, you're too busy it? like Uh, a, do just you wish repeating to, yourself? or, 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 or do you want to say something incoherent and obscure and refuse to explain it so that um, you can end this discussion because you don't want to talk about it being a bad thing that America doesn't have an official religion? I mean, you, you could do the obvious thing by saying, but why? And then you can deconstruct my arguments, but it seems you want to not talk about it. Wait, because it can't be so from the correspondence theory of truth truth is the correspondence between the statement and reality so your first statement where you're talking about something that like america uh, a present situation so the statement could be assessed as being true or false of whether it corresponds to reality or not Well, is, is anybody your going to thought statement deny you're my talking statement about and something say, that oh, you but agree America does does have an official to reality? religion and it is whatever? Is, You're is talking anybody about going a hypothetical to say that? state Is anybody that you going agree? to say that America has an official religion? Yeah, but I'm saying that when you make an odd statement, you're talking about something that you agree is false because it's not corresponding to the current state of reality. So what, why, why the hell would I be making a false statement that I don't believe in? I'm not you, am I? Well, I mean, you're talking about a height. You're talking about something that doesn't correspond to reality. What doesn't correspond to reality? Am I wrong that America doesn't have an official religion? Was saying that is a truth value statement that could be assessed as true to say if that it's true if that corresponds to reality. So we say like, But well, okay, I can, can it. you gather evidence as an American that actually I'm So wrong? we already America discussed does this have an point. official religion. We already discussed this point. Then we're moving to the second point of your argument where you're saying America ought Yes. to have a official religion. And, and, and I'm expecting you to ask me so why. you're making a statement that doesn't correspond to reality you're making about a statement of a hypothetical state of reality that doesn't exist Well, it is my opinion that America ought to have an official religion. How about that? well it doesn't matter because I'm mean, saying it's just the nature that it's a false statement It in is the true. sense It is in the true sense that you're talking I think about America you're ought talking to have an about official religion. you're talking about something that doesn't actually correspond to reality therefore it's false How is it false unless you can prove that America does have an official religion? we say if america doesn't have an official religion and then you're making the second statement america should have an official religion however that's a false scenario because america doesn't have an official religion so america having an official religion does not correspond to reality So if the statement is false, I don't so see you have how to it is false to say that America doesn't have an official religion. No, the statement that America has an official, ought to have official religion is false because it necessitates America, the, the logical, uh, the truth of America having a true uh, official religion, which is does not correspond to reality. So you could say it's a potential reality. But uh, it's not reality, and therefore the statement is false.
Okay, so so you're saying, Claire, you are saying that America ought to have an official religion. Prove it, yes? Support your your statement with, with evidence and arguments. That's what I, I don't no, know. I'm prepared to do that. Well, we, we can't even get to that point because to deconstruct the logic, that's why I said the logic of an odd statement, because you're saying a potential reality that doesn't exist. Yes, I'm making a prediction. So you, you can say, well, I don't believe that your prediction is true because, you know, X, Y, Z. I mean, no, you just said this, what, what that the statement is impossible because like you're saying, well, it's a potential reality. So whether it ought to be or not, we're saying, well, can it be? And so can, uh, can you have an ought if it can't even be? You're talking like, uh, you know, like... Well, I, I don't see the, uh, the, how it would be impossible for America to have a religion. All it takes is for the ruling classes to decide that it ought to have a religion. It could have a... Um, Congress could pass a Christian amendment. That's been proposed before. Yeah, I mean, given a procedure that could conceivably change the reality so that the statement would correspond with the statement. So to assess it, that you say, okay, there's a current reality, and you're talking about a scenario that does not correspond to reality. Yes, because I'm making a prediction. I'm making, you know, obviously, if I said it should be X, but you know, but it's not, then I, I am implicitly pr proposing to do something, and 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 you know. We but could not that, that, the validity of my proposal, or the morality. Yes, yeah, so I'm just taking the first logical step that you're that you're pro you're proposing that it should be something that, that does isn't. not correspond to reality. Yes, I'm obviously I'm proposing to do something because if it was already done. There would be no need for me to propose it. So then, if you're if you're for in order for your statement to hold up logically, then then have to be potential that what you're saying could correspond to reality and then there be some sort of assessment that this potential reality that you're speaking of could be assessed in relationship to the current state of reality yes so so you're, you're saying is it a good idea to for America to have an official religion. I mean, we could put it in simple terms so that, you know, people can under follow the argument. Yeah, but so you have to, uh, I'm so you could put it into some form of logical form, whether it could be true or not, um, has a lot of supposition. So it would have a lower truth value because you'd have to, you, whether it could be true. So just for your ought statement, one thing it has to be possible that the reality that you're talking about is at least possible. Yes, I think in theory it is possible, even though it, it's not probable at this stage. You think it, it's possible that America could have an official religion? Yes, by, by changing the constitution. And, and you say, well, well you know, according to the current procedures, if two thirds of the, you know, the House and legislature passed an amendment and the presidents ratified it, that uh, that would be some sort of procedural, at least on paper, that America would have an official religion. Yes. And that goes back to the first statement. Well, do, America doesn't currently have an official religion. And if you're val validating that because of the paper documents as opposed to, you're saying the correspondence uh, theory of truth, that the statement is true because it corresponds to reality. If you say, well, reality isn't the, the piece of paper and the procedure in Washington is just one component of reality. Uh, I don't know why you feel you have to express things in, in such a convoluted way. Um, is it because you, you don't want to hear the rest of the argument? I mean, well, I, I, think we're, I think we both to, agree that America I mean, doesn't just have you a came on, You came on when this is the topic that I'm talking about, so I'm breaking down the terminology well, of your mean, argument. I mean, why into, do you pretend that it's even controversial for me to say that America doesn't have an official religion? Well, I'm not controversial is a mind dependent term. So I'm talking, I'm trying to put into truth claims, which would be mind independent. So 
I'm, o- I'm only interested in so talking it's only about true this that now. America doesn't have I'm only, an I'm only interested in talking about this in a mind independent manner. Well, if you don't have a mind, we wouldn't be able to discuss these things. Well, it's I'm using my mind to talk about it, but I'm talking about the object of your argument as a mind independent object. Well, I'm using my mind to do it. Well, obviously, so you, you know, if you don't because agree with what I'm truth. saying, you I'm can deconstruct my arguments. You can ask me to, I mean, you can say, well, I, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. Or I don't agree because, and, and, and then we would have some for, you know. Because it doesn't matter whether I agree with you or not. In terms of not? the truth. Why not? In terms of the truth value of your proposition. Well, I mean, well, do, do, do you disagree with me that America doesn't have an official religion? Well, it doesn't matter whether they agree or not. So, I mean, it matters you're, whether, you're, you're matters whether the statement is true or not. not and whether I agree with it or not doesn't you, change its truth value. It's the truth yeah, value yeah, is yeah, but, okay, but do you agree? I mean, okay, we could be, both be wrong. We could both be wrong that America does have an official religion or it doesn't have an official religion. So which is it? Is, is there some gray area in between where America does and doesn't have an official religion? Well, so to say the truth, that the statement is true, however me and you both think the statement is false, the statement is still true. I know, but do, do you disagree you with my true, statement, statement is still true. that America doesn't have an official religion? Well, so it doesn't matter what I think. So, in terms but, of the but, truth, but it's, in terms, so, okay, so, so... In terms of the truth value of the claim, yes, I know. I know. It doesn't I know. matter what we I think. We could be both wrong. Yes, we could be both wrong, and, and the truth is something else. But but uh, you're, you're you're now refusing to agree with me or disagree with me. Because it doesn't you're matter. You're refusing to express your opinion you. one way or another, whether America has an no official religion or not. It. So um, may we know the reason for your you know, refusing to cooperate in this exercise of discussing whether it would be a good thing or a bad thing if America were to have an official religion, which is obviously the purpose of this exercise as far as I'm concerned. Well, your exercise, but I mean, to me, your exercise is pointless. That's why I'm not... Yes, it's obviously pointless trying to talk to you about these things because you are... Del- you wish to avoid discussions of these things. You only want to talk about theories that nobody cares about that don't, that don't go anywhere. Um, well, well Samish, I mean, if you want to um, uh, Samish can, can see what I'm trying to do. And I suppose he, he can also see what you are trying to avoid. Yeah, I mean, just put it that, that your conversation doesn't interest me. It doesn't interest you because you you have no interest in arriving at the truth. You only want to appear to be discussing these things, but you have no interest in arriving at the truth. Well, I say the opposite because the conversation doesn't interest me because there's no advancement of truth. It's just a matter of no, no. You're, you're not even mind you, you are going out of your way. You're to trying avoid to change. Asking, you're trying to change my opinion. You're trying to change my opinion. Yeah, and I don't yeah, have an well, opinion because yeah, I know well, my then opinion. Then you can resist matter. my attempt to change your opinion. But you're, well, you're, you're, you're not there's two problems. There's two problems to your point. One is that okay. You're trying to change my opinion. So one, I don't have an opinion. So first, I have to formulate oh. an opinion. For, for for me, but you're a Jew. Surely you have an opinion about whether America ought to be a no-hide nation or not. Uh, no, I don't have an opinion. Right. I, I, so I guess you you don't want to court. Control and then, so so to say, it's like okay. To me, it's a waste of my time to formulate an opinion. Why? And then for you, and then well, and then because once I formulate opinion, then you're going to try to change my opinion. Well, so I, I, I didn't even waste. I didn't even waste my time in the first place to formulate an opinion, let alone for you to try to change my opinion. So well, it's like obviously, problem, the problem why so this conversation is pointless. Why, why the conversation? why this conversation is pointless? Because like it's saying, I don't have an opinion, so you're not going to be able to change my opinion because I don't even have an opinion. Yes, yes, because it's a coward's way out. You you don't want to. Well, so now you're you insulting me because I don't have an opinion. So what is the point so of all this so intellectualization? Now you're trying to. Truth and now you're trying to force me to have an opinion and shit like that when you when you don't actually well, want to you're insulting me. You're trying to you're trying to like shame me into having an opinion, but but it's saying 
as long yeah, as I don't yeah, have an opinion. Actually, actually, I am. I, I am because all this intellectualization leads nowhere, does it? It's all about you, you, you. Look at me. I'm so clever. Theories of truth, explanatory power. And, and when it actually comes to the bread and butter of discussing um, actual things, you, you don't have an opinion. Well, I don't have an opinion. And you do it on purpose. So you don't get into trouble because you're well, this. I, did, I didn't because I know my opinion is not important. Therefore, I didn't waste my time formulating or even thinking about you, it. You just wasted. When you asked me like, "Well, what's my opinion?" I, I could things might come to my mind. Like, well, what do I think about this? And I could tell you the thoughts that arise to my mind. But I'm wise enough to know that the thoughts that come to my mind are not important. Like, uh, my opinion on the matter is unimportant. So I'm not going to waste my time trying to formulate it, and that saves me the wasted time of these of the God forbid, a wasted conversation with you, with you trying to change my opinion, because like well, my that's opinion. Well, that's a way out, isn't it? I don't, I don't want to argue about important matters. Well, no, it's, it's, it's no. opposite. Because what I'm telling you is what you're talking about is unimportant. Why is it unimportant? You're an American. Because it's don't a, think it's because it's a conversation about opinions. So I say my opinion is not important. Yeah, but, but, but Therefore, the a conversation about correct. trying to change my opinion is certainly not important. But 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 no, we, we have to examine why you, you waste so much time talking about these big ideas and and then choose not to use them to get anywhere. Well, so I use them to get at truth. And the truth is not well, my what truths have you arrived at using your methods? Um None. What do you think is the purpose of your life as an intellectual? Um, I don't know if there's a purpose to my life or not. I mean, so I say so my purpose in my life is to serve God, to uh, you know, my IntelliKey, make the use of make make the most use of my potential. And so these certain elements, like formulating opinions, arguing about opinions, is exactly, and, and you choose not to have an opinion, so you've well, because it, it, it because it uh, gets in the way or is contrary to my purpose in life. Because like, so, okay, to serve uh, God. Are you are you as a Jew saying that that it's it's not your purpose to have principles to defend? Why well, have principle to defend? What principles I believe do you have? Principles, but they're not my principles. They're not my opinions. They're, uh, I mean, if you call it objective or they're received, they're not, uh, I mean, I might have thought about them and, and tried to align myself, but uh, the, these are, so to say, the, I mean, like I said, that there's an objective standard of behavior, then there's my opinion, and so I negate my opinion and try to conform to the objective standard. So, so the, because the, there's a the proper way to behave, and then there's the way I want to behave, and so I do my best to not behave the way I want to behave and behave the proper way to behave. So that's what religion teaches. So, so my the, goal the, the, is to serve God, not myself. How, so how my mind, God by not my opinions opinion. are about serving myself, so I negate my own opinions because my opinions are all wrong, and then I try to, uh, if I do have something in my mind, to be as objective as possible and uh, you know my best method of uh, of uh, practices to ascertain something objective and then to align my mind and behavior with that objective and that necessitates the negation of my own opinions and so at this point like i'm a grown man i you know i came onto this wisdom decade I, haven't ago. Got an opinion I didn't about waste it. the last 20 years of my life thinking about my opinions because i knew my opinion didn't matter so thank God the last 20 years of my life, I could have wasted a whole bunch of time. Uh, what do I think about it? But I knew what I thought about it didn't matter. So I didn't waste my time thinking about it. So you, you don't think it matters one way or the other whether America has a really, an official religion? It matters. It doesn't matter what I think about it. Okay, but but you, you're not, despite all your learning, your rabbinical training, you, you, you don't have an opinion. Yeah, that's a but, good thing. That's because I worked on myself. I broke myself from my own opinions. So I say, right. okay, it matters, but it, what I think about it doesn't matter. 
Okay, so, but but you're, you're not willing to argue about it, so you, you say you have no opinion. Because if you want me to why. argue about my opinion, I'm telling you, I don't have an opinion on the matter. Okay, but that's deliberate, because you don't wish to facilitate or advance the discussion because you are a coward. Well, I just throwing insults at me. You know, saying like, I want to align myself no, I am, with the truth. I, am, because, I, I want because to align you, you myself with the truth and my opinions are not true. So therefore, time. I don't even have a opinion. You prefer to waste your time talking about nothing for what? Well, you're the one wasting my time. Hmm? You're the one wasting my time. No, no, I don't think I'm wasting your time. Well, I'm, okay, I'm, you don't think I'm you're asking right. you what you think time. you're doing with your life, not having an opinion. Well, well, you know, I'm trying to discover to the truth so I can align myself and, and, and talk about things that go nowhere. I'm trying to discover the truth so I can align myself. Well, what is the truth that the you truth. want to discover? What is the truth? The truth, like why I'm here, what I'm supposed to do with my life. Well, obviously, you have opinions uh, how to, and do how something to behave, about how to accord. How yeah, do uh, but, but 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 you're an oxymoronic Hindu Hindu is a contradiction in terms. It's like you want to serve God, but you're a heretic. You're you're an idolater because Hindus are idolaters, aren't they? Well, so, one, so what is your purpose one, of being this oxymoron other than to attract attention? Well, I want to align myself with the truth. I didn't do it to attract attention. I did it in my search for truth. And then the possibility of this was true that I tried to align myself with the truth. But you're you're going out if you're going not to make an not to have an opinion on something that's very important in your life. We, you know, the, the state of your of your nation. Well, saying that my, my opinion to say is this true? Should I, if it is true, should I align myself with it? Yeah, but but you know, if you go out of your way not to have an opinion, then you're you you will avoid controversy. And, and this is what um, a lot of middle class people are doing. They're not they're going out of their, their way not to discuss the elephant in the room. Thinking themselves superior to the people who complain, but have no solutions. Yeah, I don't think myself superior to anybody. Well, that's why you stream for hours giving lectures to people i'm not lecturing anybody I'm, I'm just reading my research i'm sharing my research but it is a waste of time if you just read stuff that nobody really understands I don't consider a waste of my time i'm saying if you consider it a waste of your time you don't have to watch well i you know, when I see theories of truth, explanatory power, and inference to the best explanation, I would expect you to be interested in what I'm saying, not go out of your way, not to discuss what I want to say. I mean, you could deconstruct what I'm trying to say, but you're not even playing the game. Yeah, because it's just a game, and like you, you're, you haven't even said anything new. I mean, like, I mean, God forbid, I could have. Isn't it new? Have, 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 have we ever discussed? God forbid, the like, everything that we've discussed is like a, it's just like a repeat. I could have had this discussion with myself. It didn't even help that you're talking with me. Well, it makes it more interesting. It's rather the, you know better than you reading three hours of stuff from you know websites and whatever. And that's, so, that's your, that's but, your but I, I am, I am interested in, in in why you refuse to do it. Is it middle class cowardice? Why I refuse to discuss whether it's a good or bad thing that America doesn't have an official religion. Okay, I think it's a too vague or bogus of questions, largely a waste of time to. How is it vague? I mean, because it's just you know... hypothetical about a, 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 a possible alternative state of being that may or may not be possible. Well, you, you've agreed that it, a procedure for so doing has already been stated in the U.S. Constitution. So the Founding Fathers envisaged such a thing. It, it, they contemplated the possibility of changing a constitution, provided certain conditions are satisfied. Yeah, I mean, so we just said, okay, discuss like any random, like, you know, would it be good if I could fly or something like that? You know, saying that that's a, that's a, you know closer to fantasy that okay what well, you're you saying can is largely, fly, you can get into what you're saying is largely close to fantasy although it has 
some sort of um, hypothetical mechanism to get to that state. Well, so you can get like you America can, you having, can having, a having the that official that. religion that there's a hypothetical mechanism according to current standards to get to that state. It's in the American Constitution, you just told us. Well, it's in the Constitution that there could be added an amendment that could change the nature of the structure of at least the, the legal system. Whether that would actually change society or whether that's likely or probable enough to even to warrant talking about. We're talking about things in theory. Exactly like we already talked we're about talking this about multiple, things multiple times. In like I'm not sure you have like a, a new angle on it or something. Well, that, you're, you're, you're actually you know, going out of your way not to discuss my new angle. You haven't told me your new angle. Well, I'm trying to, but you, you, you don't seem at all interested. So, so I suppose you could say, you, you could be saying things like, oh, what's the point of America having a, a religion? You could say that. It, would, would that be your obvious next question if you were minded to ask it? Um, no, I mean, really, nothing's coming to my mind. I don't really, I mean, because I'm, I'm trying to focus on my research. Like, I don't really have, like, thoughts coming to my mind about this hypothetical scenario. It's not, you know, like, my mind's not captivated by trying to think about this hypothetical scenario. But, but you know, like, I, I would really done. only do it as a favor to you. And I guess you're, you've been too competitive that, uh, you know, it's uninteresting for me to do a favor to you to uh, use my mind to think about your hypothetical scenario. Well, I think you already know my hypothetical scenario. You must have. I have, and I've already thought about these. I've already, because you know, we've talked about in the past, I've already thought about your hypothetical scenario. And, uh, I mean, really, I put the link in the chat if Dave wanted to come on. So you came on, and then you didn't, uh, you know, have anything to talk about the subject I'm talking about, and so you're just diverting it, uh, you know, just to talk about something that, at least at this point, doesn't interest me. Like I don't want to interrupt uh, my focus well, on theories of truth to talk about, you know, whatever. Like what your your constant uh, project. Well, yeah. Well, I, I expect people to say, well. It's not going to work because, or we have a better idea, and it is whatever. Um, well, I mean, because, because I'm busy now thinking about some other subject, I don't want to think about that right now. Right, but but you could think about you know the truth of it, whether it's. Um, um, well, whether... I was trying to do that, but but uh, I mean, you just didn't seem uh, to have the focus level or paying attention to. Uh, Deconstruct your arguments, and, and well, so you have to even even, well. even for you to just say thank you that I'm doing you some sort of favor by deconstructing your arguments. So you're just kind of being you, you arg arg argumentative I, and, and and insultive. So just like uh, on well, 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 yes, because you're 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 not doing the obvious thing. Because you know, if, if somebody wanted me to deconstruct their arguments, I would do so. And you you're not you're not even attempting to do it because you're avoiding. The discussion. God, I don't have any arguments. I'm deconstructing your argument. Yes, I don't, and, have, and any you, you I don't do have any arguments on this. So you you don't have any view about whether it would be better if America were a righteous, no white nation as a Jew. I'm not forming a bunch of opinions about hypothetical situations. Well, that's what you ought to do as a Jew. The reality. You you have a religion, or or you have or another odd statement. It. And you're saying like no, I mean like the, the I should correspond to reality, not to hypothetical situations that don't exist. Okay, so you you don't think that that anything needs to be done, everything's fine, no need to talk about. There's change. a lot to be done. No, I mean there's a lot of things wrong. That there's a lot of things that are fine. There's a lot of things that need to be done, but uh, thinking about hypothetical, fantastical situations is. Uh, I say unlikely to uh, have any benefit to me or you. So, minimally, what, as what like, do you think ought to be done? Benefit as a lot of exercise. What, what do you mean, think ought to be done? Largely just a waste of time. What do you think ought to be done? I don't have any thoughts about what ought to be done. You just said there are lots of things that ought to be done. I didn't. So, there's a lot of problems. I think there's a lot of things that could be better. I don't have any prescription of what ought to be done. I don't want to be in charge. I don't have a long list of things that I would do if I was in charge. I'm never going to be in charge. 
and therefore I don't waste my time thinking about a bunch of things I would do when I'm never going to be in charge. Okay, so so you 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 are taking on the the lot of people complaining, and there are lots of people complaining, and they don't have a solution, and they think somebody higher up ought to have a solution, but they. Yes, I'm not they wasting my know. time thinking about solutions of what I would do when I was in charge, because I'm never going to be in charge. There's you know currently no path, no uh, proposition to put me in charge, so there's no reason for me to think about a whole bunch of solutions to solve a whole bunch of problems that are never going to be in my hands. But surely knowing the, the, the what, what in theory ought to be done is better than... I mean, it's than... almost like heretical. You think, like, if I were God, like, I'm not God, I'm never going to be God. So there's no purpose in me thinking if I were God. Well, you don't have to think that you're God. You, you, you could think of a, well... In an ideal situation, this ought to be done, that shouldn't be done, you know, you might so have If some. I were running for Congress, I mean, even if I were running for Congress, what you're talking about would be largely irrelevant. But, like, I'm not even running for Congress. Well, if you're I'm running for Congress. I'm not a politically minded person. I don't have a bunch of time. I don't spend a bunch of time thinking prescriptively about what other people ought to do. It's a waste of my time, a waste of my energy. I almost never think about what other people should do. So, what do, what do you what, what 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 would you say you spend your time doing? I think about ideas and trying to understand truth and uh, ideas and mechanisms. But but without with the express purpose of not getting anywhere. Well, I can get somewhere. I understand a lot of things, and some a lot of those things I use in my daily life. Such as. Well, even what I'm talking about right now, that uh, you're like, that uh, every time I speak or think through ideas, that uh, these theories of truth will have me, uh, you know, clearer uh, thinking of logic and understanding ideas. And, uh, you know, also like just the due diligence that, uh, you know, eventually I want to write a book or, you know, have more productive conversations you're not about like what I would do if I were God, but just conversations about topics. And then I'll have this information more accessible, more top of my mind. And, uh, you know, the due diligence of my research to uh, have thought through the uh, major ideas Like you know, I'm thinking about the multiple truth hypothesis. So I'm doing the due diligence of research of all the similar ideas. And, uh, you know, like, so when I'm advancing these ideas, and people are like, well, you know, what about Kripka and what about Russell and what about uh, uh, Ramsey? That uh, you all know these things. I don't know their theories, and uh, you know, so this, I'm I'm just really doing my research and sharing my research. So, the multiple truth hypothesis is saying yes and no at the same time. Is is, is that what it is? Um, no. I I thought it was. You're saying that, that there could be, you know, more than one truth at the same time about the same thing. Isn't that what the MTH is about? You, could, It's an incorrect way of phrasing it, but I mean, it's somewhat, I mean, maybe it's somewhat similar, but uh, that's why I'm trying to formulate it. And that's why I'm doing the due diligence of the research. So, I mean, if you, if you, I don't know, maybe you never heard of the, correspondence theory of truth and the identity theory of truth and the coherence theory of truth and the deflationary theory of truth. Some of these are the major theories of the, you know, the great thinkers of our day. So I'm trying to think about my idea in terms, in relation to the main theories out there. Would you like to go through what, what those things are? You that, that, that you just well, I already mentioned? did. I mean, that's what I was streaming. Like I spent like hours reading through reading through that. Yeah. What would you like to sum up? I was trying one to sentence. summarize. I was trying to deconstruct your ideas according to these theories. Like that's why I was trying to deconstruct your propositions according to the coherence theory of truth. I mean, in the um, correspondence theory of truth. What's what's that? The correspondence theory of truth is that the truth is assessed by the relation between the concept and reality, that it's true if the statement or idea corresponds to reality. Well, it's, it's true that America doesn't have an official religion, so that there was no need for you to con deconstruct that. I think everybody agrees. Well, no, I said that, that it, it has a tri high truth value, although it can't be, the, the nature of the statement is it can't be, uh, it's very difficult to assess as true or false. 
you just assess that it's a, a truth value that's more likely to be true. And that's why I say that the co correspondence value of truth, you say if it corresponds, if it's 100% correspondence, you could call it true. If it corresponds the majority of the time, it has a high truth value, but you can't you know, call it capital T true. Okay, so I think um, members of Congress would say that America doesn't have an official religion, um, but if they say it is, I would ask them what it is, and if they say it's Christianity, then um, I, I would point out that the, the founding fathers separated the church from the state. And yeah, first, so, so I, I, I think that's the argument about yeah, America not having an official your, religion. Your skills at deconstruction, I guess, are you need work. So, I mean, to deconstruct, I mean, one thing, you know, the, the components of your statement, like what is America? How do you define America? What well, is I think you, you know what, the American what is a religion? Country. How do you assess whether America has or doesn't have an official religion? Well, it's it's pretty so, official that America doesn't have an official religion because you know to to um, contradict me, you would have to say, oh, but America does have an official religion, and it is da da. Yeah, so it's what I said, like. Like about Jews, like is Judaism what the books say or what Jews do? Well, so Judaism say, well, well, is the okay, religion. Like, okay, it's, it's not America the shit what, that Jews is do. America what the books it's not the shit that Jews do. Judaism is not what the shit that Jews do. It, it, it's what their religion, what their scripture says they should be doing. Well, I'm okay, so to say that's your opinion. But there's well, well, yes, and I'm prepared to do that. Of, Judaism to say, okay, well, here's an authoritative document that's, so if you're going to look in the statement, I, just, I gave the example, like, okay, is Judaism what you have some authoritative text books rabbis say, or what the people called the Jews collectively do? So you're going to look, is America what some documents, what some authoritative uh, people could, could be assessed say, or is America what America does? And that's why I said there, there, there's the um, consensus view of truth also. So you say that, okay, so you want to say, well, America is what these official documents like the Constitution and uh, certain legal texts and court rulings say, or is America what America does? And if, there, if there's a contradiction between what America does and what these documents say, uh, then you can't assess the truth as being conclusively true. You can say, well, it's true that these documents say it. However, America doesn't correspond to what these documents say. You can so say Americans follow their constitution all the time. They don't even the follow their own so rules. Your statement only corresponds to what these documents say, but it doesn't actually correspond to what Americans do. Yeah, so you're, you're saying Americans either have no rules or break their own rules. So it was, like that it was if you're looking to assess the truth value of your statement, so there's different methods to assess the truth. So if you're saying America, so it's saying these things have to be defined and, and it might not be able to give a precise or closed definition or you might have to give multiple definitions and then to assess a statement like uh, official religion and, or, or some statement. And, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there'd be evidentiary, there'd be multiple pieces of evidence. And one of the pieces of evidence uh, or multiple pieces of evidence would be documents. Um, but there would also be, because we're talking about the truth of the statement is defined by how well it corresponds to reality. The statement is capital T true if it 100% corresponds to reality. So there's evidence it corresponds to reality because these important documents say so. But there's conflicting evidence that it doesn't correspond to reality if there's a consensus... Uh, Why don't we just America say that, that the Americans flout their constitution? Uh, and that Tucker Carlson has lost his First Amendment rights, and 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 so will 
lots of Americans. We could talk about that, but you're not interested. We, okay, I think it's a pointless conversation. Why? Uh, why? You don't think Tucker Carlson has lost his First Amendment rights? I, um, I mean, I didn't assess it. It doesn't really matter to me. Okay, you, you prefer not to discuss it because it's controversial. No, I what is the point of all your learning to... if you just avoid important discussions like this? Well, I mean, it goes to your state, like a correspondence view of truth. So you say, okay, there's a First Amendment. People have free speech. You say, why? Because uh, there's this paper, this document that says so, but here's this contradictory evidence that doesn't correspond to reality. There's this prominent figure, Tucker Carlson, who has not been accorded his First Amendment rights. So it's a contradictory piece of evidence to a statement like uh, you know, America has uh, free speech. Well, I think most Americans, if they were ours, would feel that their scope of being able to speak freely is being noticeably uh, narrowed every day. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree with that assessment. So I pay attention somewhat in the sense that, yeah, I have followed a little bit like Tucker Carlson's deplatforming and, you know, certainly in relation to me and what I talk about and how I comport myself with uh, my own behavior in relation to you know, how careful I am with what I say. And is that a good or bad thing? Well, it's a value judgment. That uh, my opinion doesn't matter on that. I mean, surely it's not that controversial to say that if you have a set of rules applying to a group and the group mostly ignores it, that it must be... You know, the rules are not working or the people are not following and, and both and it's bad or, or, or not really. what, what is it's like what we're talking about the deflationary value of truth what does that when mean you, when, when you say when you add that i am duvid this statement is true it didn't add anything that i said this is true like if i'm duvid the statement is true whether i say it's true or not so, like, when you add, like, and it's bad or good from, like, the deflationary value of, of truth, it doesn't add any statement to it. So, if I tell you, like, you know, God forbid, um, I need dental work done, and it's bad. It didn't add any more useful information to the statement. I told you, like, oh, so what's going on with your teeth? What type of dental work do uh, you put that? So, and it's bad. Going to the dentist and spending money on dentist fees. But I'm saying from the deflationary, it didn't add any statement that you said it's good or bad. So it's like we're losing our free speech and it's bad. What what value, what extra information did this assessment that you said is bad add to it? Okay, so so because you refuse to make state an opinion, um you're you're, you're... saying from the deflationary value truth that it didn't actually add any useful information, your assessment of whether it's good or bad. No, you're, you're refusing to commit yourself politically to saying whether it's good or bad. Because it or... doesn't add any useful information. No, no, because, because you're, you're being you obstructive. You're well, I'm, saying, I'm saying why I don't. So obvious. you did, and I want your, I want, so now you're, you're the one who did, so I was saying I don't because... Yeah, so you I don't, because you don't want a sensible discussion about anything. You just want to talk about stuff that never leads anywhere. So you said, you made a statement, and then you added, and it's Yeah, bad. I'm, I'm just noting your cowardice. Or, or it's good. I'm, what, I'm noting your what, cowardice. What value-added information was there to your assessment that it was good or bad? So, out of all the people in America, you're saying, it's good that Americans are losing their First Amendment rights. It's good. I love it, because I'm duvid. No, I didn't say, I say good or bad. It's, it doesn't add yeah, any yeah, value. We, we know why you're refusing to say it, because you don't want to have a sensible discussion about the First Amendment. You don't want a sensible discussion about anything, because you are an no, you're the one who doesn't want to add. You're the one who doesn't want to have a sensible discussion and as seen by your adding statements that have no value that make it more no, difficult. No, it, 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 I, I am imputing uh, a motive when you behind add your, a statement your, that your, is good your, or bad. Your, your, your it, it makes it more difficult to have a sense of How can an American say that it is a good thing that Americans are losing their First Amendment rights? Listen to yourself. 
it doesn't, I didn't say it was good or bad. It's saying adding a good or bad to it to doesn't it. makes it you're, more difficult to have a sensible discussion. Again, why are you being like that? You're not meant to be slippery. Jews are not meant to be slippery, but you are because you're a liberal. I mean, God forbid, but. Um, yes, you're a liberal, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you call I mean, yourself a liberal. It's really too. just your lack of uh, logic, I mean, unfortunately. What, what's so, so illogical about pointing out that you're a liberal Jew? Are you going to contradict me? Um, you vote well, Democrat. If your assessment is true or false, I mean, it, it doesn't make a difference. You're saying therefore. Oh, yes, yes. yes so, so, so when it's true, you, you say it doesn't make a difference. You're, you're doing this slippery Jew thing. But you're not supposed to be that slippery. You have a religion whose rules that you ignore. You're, uh, you're even refusing to say that it's a bad thing that America is not a righteous, no hide nation. You're going out of your way not to discuss these principles of your religion because well, you're because a it's just a value judgment where I'm not the assessor of value. So you're making a worthless claim that makes the conversation no, 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 more you're, difficult. You're just refusing to cooperate by, by refusing to have an opinion well, on anything you, that you... is important, testifying to your cowardice. Well, I'm saying if you add, like, okay, it's important. Well, yes, it's important. But you're pretending it's not. You prefer to waste hours and hours of time reading stuff. I mean, you're that the one wasting my time. And saying that because you can't understand what I'm saying, you continue no, to waste I, I know time. What, I know what you're doing. You continue doing, to add useless information. You, you, you make it impossible to have a useful exchange of information. What do you want to talk about? Well, I mean, your failure to use logic makes it really impossible. How to talk am I being illogical? Well, I said because you're adding an assessment of value where you are not the assessor. Everybody's so, an assessor. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. And you can say my opinion is incorrect, but you're going out of your way to say that you don't have an opinion, but my opinion is still wrong. So you're contradicting yourself, David. Yeah, well, so I'm wise in the sense that I know my opinion doesn't matter, as where you're a fool that you think your opinion matters. And there and you also you're a bigger well, my fool, opinion you're wouldn't you're a bigger fool that true. you keep on expressing your opinion. So I mean yeah, one thing you yeah, think your I opinion do. matters. I, Second yeah. thing is you keep on insisting on, on expressing your opinion. Yes, I do. And then the third you keep on you, you, and you, I'm know, you, to you argue it. you yes, want to argue about the validity it. of your opinion. So I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're a fool you, in many aspects. You construct my opinion. Say I'm wrong in saying that America doesn't about have an opinion. official religion. So, I mean, I mean, you're 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 volunteering some useless information, your opinion, and then you're uh, giving a useless assessment of the value of your opinion, and then you're being argumented over it. So it's all just yeah, yeah, because point. because I am noting that you are refusing to give an opinion about whether it's a bad thing that Americans are losing their First Amendment rights. And it is um, obvious the reasons for your cowardice and your non-cooperation. There's just a sense of wisdom that my opinion on that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I think it's good but or it bad. It should be exposed. I'm not going to waste that, my time, you, 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 waste my time assessing the good or bad. As an intellectual and have nothing useful to say. So why are you still here talking to me? Well, I just want to keep making the point. Of what? That you have nothing to say. Well, I have something to say, just not to you. Or you want to make the point to, and you know, just in case there's anyone that might be interested in my research that you want to tell them that they shouldn't, uh, you know, like Claire's like public service announcement in case you were listening to Duvid and following his research that you're wasting your time. Your research is basically saying, I want to be in a position to say yes and no at the same thing on the same subject at the same time. So I've summed up your, your book for you in one sentence. Um, well, and that's your, assessment of what I'm saying, and I don't think that's accurate. Okay. What, what's your more accurate assessment of yourself? That you're not going to understand it, so it's a waste of my time to oh, you you, you, watch my content. You bet you just watch my content. It's impossible to explain nonsense, isn't it? Well, I mean, to you. Yeah, it's nonsense. Because you have a failure to be, use logic. How, am I, how have I been illogical? 
Because you keep on asserting your opinions. It's logical to assert one's opinions if one has yeah, a message illogical to propagate. To assert your opinions. What? It's illogical to assert your opinion. Everybody it's illogical does. to have an opinion. So I mean, it's double. It's illogical. Okay, so, so it's illogical to have an opinion in the first character. place. It's you're double illogical to assert an opinion that you wasted your time having in the first place. I don't think it's a waste of time to have. Well, obviously, opinions. that's why you're a waste of time to talk to. I don't think it's a waste of time okay, to so, expose the fraud. So why don't you, that why you, don't you think that's somewhere else? Get rid of me then. And you want me to bounce you? Yeah, go on. And God forbid. I mean, I mean, like generally, like a nice guy. Like I don't want to kick you. Yeah, go, me. On, go on. Go on. Kick me. Kick me. You can't, you can't voluntarily me. leave. No, just, just kick me. Go on. God forbid. No. You do it generally you like just a nice do guy. You want. I mean, if you lose the argument, then kick me. I don't even try to have an argument. You never do. Yeah, I mean, God forbid, try to avoid arguments. Well, then what's the point of being an intellectual and being Jewish and talking well, about big ideas that lead nowhere? Well, to share my research? About saying yes and no at the same time. What would be the purpose of that? But there's a lot of that now, isn't there? Well, I think you assess Dying the truth. And saying the yes purpose and is no. to assess talking the truth. Out, and talking out, truth. Out, out of both sides of your mouth, as you Americans say. So I mean, it goes like with the free speech. So if my free speech is eroding, rather than wasting my time having an opinion about whether it's good or bad, just to assess the truth of the situation and accord my behavior with the reality of the situation. Okay, so, so free you're, 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 you're basically declaring yourself to be a non-player character. You, you can see it's all going wrong, but it's not your job to have an opinion. So, but, but in the meantime, you talk about serving God and finding purpose to your life. Um, isn't the purpose of your life um, being a good Jew or being a good Hindu? Um, or what, what's the purpose of your life then? Well, I said to serve God, to accord my behavior in a... What, by not having opinions, by not defending principles and refusing to have any? Well, I defend principles. What principles, well, what principles do you defend? A truth. So it is true that America doesn't have an official religion and it's true that it's a good thing or it's true that it is a bad thing? Those are weak truth claims that aren't really worth uh, assessing. So it is true that you wish not to have an opinion in order not to have to discuss something obviously controversial. Well, it's not controversial. I mean, maybe it's controversial. I say just it's a, a relatively unimportant topic. Why is uh, it unimportant I mean, when it affects the lives of so of... many Americans? That the rule of law is no longer being followed. Yeah, but there's all sorts of issues that affect uh, uh, you know, the lives of uh, all Americans. And, well, and, and other Westerners who are um, dominions of America. And say most so, of them. so if, if World War III to, were to break out, there would, you would, you'd have no opinion about it. As an American, you'd have no opinion about it. Yeah, I probably wouldn't bother forming an opinion. If that became the reality, I would just accord myself to the new reality to the best of my ability. If I have no, no power to change it, I wouldn't form an opinion. So my, my personal action, I have an opinion. So if there's like a war and I decide whether to join it or not, um, you know, like Ukraine and Russia or something, like I would have a strong opinion about it. But if it came like where I had to pick a side, then there'd be a practical uh, reason why I would afford an opinion about it. So, you know, like if there's a battle and I have to fight, then I would. But if there's something that I there's no practical difference to uh, to me whether I form an opinion on it, I'm not going to waste my time forming an opinion on it. So and even, even so the sense of my opinion, no, my opinion, no opinion on opinion it, about foreign policy. My opinion on it is more in 
the accordance of my own behavior. So if it came to, so okay, if free speech is being diminished. So with the diminishing free speech, I accord my behavior and become more and more careful about what I say. Okay. So not, I mean, you, God forbid, so unlike you, unlike you, you who keeps on getting banned. So, so rather uh, than forming an opinion like, oh, this is bad, I just so like, okay, this is the new reality, and then I accorded my behavior to the new reality. As right. So, you, so, so actually, you said you're, this you're, is you're, bad, you're remember, but you did not accord sheeple. your opinion to the. You did not record accord your behavior to the new reality. You just formed an opinion so that you don't like the new reality, you're, you're cattle, and therefore you sheeple. suffer punishment by your sheeple behavior cattle, not being in accordance with the new reality. Effeminate, non-masculine, no principles to defend, not fighting for anything. I mean, God um, forbid. Yeah. So you, Okay. You're here to insult me. I mean, yeah, I, I, I am because that that that's you're proud of it. Actually, you're you're proud not to have principles to defend while calling yourself a proud Jew. I got stuff to get through, so I'm going to go back to my research. Have a good night. Okay, so I have a few essays here on explanatory power and inference to the best explanation related to not necessarily truth because uh, you're saying explanatory power or best explanation is somewhat skirting the issue of truth and uh, you know so we talked about truth and like how do you know truth or the various theories of truth and so you know, from the scientific level as i said truth is more used in metaphysics and philosophy than actually um science science usually accepts that you can't determine the truth at best you could have some sort of statistical probability like i said the coherence i mean the correspondence value of truth where the truth is dependent upon how well it corresponds to reality so we look at explanatory power so let's read through this basic here Explanatory power is the ability of hypothesis or theory to explain the subject matter effectively to which it pertains. It is opposite of explanatory impotence. In the past, various criteria or measures for explanatory power have been proposed. In particular, one hypothesis theory explanation can be said to have more explanatory power than another about the same subject matter. If more facts or observations are accounted for, if it changes more surprising facts into matter of course, according to Pierce, if more details of causal relations are provided, leading to a high accuracy and precision of the description, if it offers greater predictive power, if it depends less on authorities and more on observations, if it makes fewer assumptions, if it is more falsifiable, uh, more testable by observation or experiments, according to Popper, if it can be used to compress encoded observations into fewer bits, Solomonov's theory of inductive inference. Recently, David Deutsch proposes that theorists should seek explanations that are hard to vary. A theory explanation is hard to vary if all details play a functional role, cannot be varied or removed without changing the predictions of a theory. Easy to vary explanations and contrast can be varied to be reconciled with the new observations because they're barely connected to the details of the phenomena of questions. Deutsch takes examples from Greek mythology. He describes how very specific and even somewhat falsifiable theories were provided to explain how the god Demeter's sadness caused the season. Alternatively, Deutsch points out one could have just as easily explained the seasons as resulting from the god's happiness, which would have made a poor explanation because it's easy to arbitrarily change details. Without Deutsch's criterion, the Greek god explanation could have just kept adding justifications, the same criteria being hard to vary 
may be what makes the modern explanations for the seasons a good one. None of the details about the Earth rotating around the sun at a certain angle and certain orbit can be easily modified without changing the theory's coherence. Uh, philosopher Karl Popper acknowledges it is logically possible to avoid falsification of hypotheses by changing details to avoid any criticism, adapting the term immunizing stratagem from Hans Alpert. Popper argued that the scientific hypothesis should be subjected to a methodological testing to select the strongest hypothesis. Okay, so I found some slides. These are, I guess, two big thinkers uh, from the Center of Logic and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh from a seminar in Germany, The Logic of Explanatory Power by Schumbach and, Sprang and Spranger. So here's a paper related to the authors of the topic. So I'm going to go through the slides that they made, but if you want to uh, um, get more in depth, you could read their paper. Um, this is also an important paper. Um, Eric Barnes, Inference to the lovely, Loveliest Explanation, um, which is going to go later to uh, the best explanation. But uh, I'll just share this now because I'm not going to have uh, time to read it. It's a little technical. Um, and I'll look just at a little bit of a few of these papers. So here you have Hempel's explanations and reason, reasons. Well, Hempel's distinction, explanation seeking why questions and reason seeking why questions. Um, explanations make us understand, reasons bind us to beliefs. So inference to the best explanation, we are under certain circumstances entitled to infer to the hypothesis which explains the phenomenon best. Um, so Bayesian explanationism, uh, explanations as for reasons, uh, explanatory power of hypothesis, um, a phenomenon provides evidence to believe that the hypothesis is true. Explanatory considerations have an epistemic pull. We analyze the concept of evidence and explanatory power from a Bayesian perspective, Bayesian explanationism. So Pierce, Bayesian explanationism, the measure of explanatory power. Explanation and Reasons was prominently anticipated by Charles Saunders Pierce. The surprising fact, uh, the explanation is observed, but if hypothesis uh, were true, the explanation would be a matter of course. Hence, there is a reason to suspect that the hypothesis is true. Suggest to measure explanatory power in terms of a measure uh, that depends on the joint probability distribution of the explanation and the hypothesis. The explanation should be an increasing function of the probability of the explanation in relation to the hypothesis and should be a decreasing function of the probability of the explanation. Our analysis is unidirectional explanatory power is revealed in probabilistic claims but probability relations need not entail explanatory power. Measure sensitivity. There's a prominent analogy between measures of explanatory power and measures of evidential support confirmation. The analogy to confirmation theory points to a principal problem Measure sensitivity, judgments on explanatory power depend on the specific measure that has been used, but a set of adequacy conditions, we'd like to narrow down the set of admissible measures. So adequacy conditions, some of these are you know, basically in mathematical, logical form. So we're going to look a little bit more, but uh, a lot of the explanatory power is, as I was saying with uh, Claire, reducing claims to logical form or probability form, where the probability of the correspondence between the hypothesis or the explanation in reality could be tested. And you know, the theorem, similar to uh, Bayesianism, the significance of this result depends, however, on the plausibility of the adequacy conditions. Our argument for the specific uh, explanation is reinforced if it has further pleasant probability. Uh, properties. So the 
explanation hypothesis is a decreasing function of the probability of the explanation at increasing function of the probability of the explanation with uh, over the hypothesis. Evidential support increases with explanatory power. And avoids the problem of irrelevant conjunctions. So we suggest a reference of explanation and reasons by means of a Bayesian analysis of explanatory power with specified intuitive, plausible, technically convenient adequacy conditions for measuring the explanatory power, proven a uniqueness theorem by going through the properties of explanation, the function. We have shown that the function matches our intuitive judgments about explanatory power insofar as the explanation function is accurate formal analysis of our concept of explanatory power. Explanatory power holds important normative weight uh, vindication of the Piercean rationale. Hempel's distinction stands. Explanation and reasons are conceptually distinct entities, but they're also intrinsically related. So just little introduction slides. Um, so let me read a little bit from a few articles just to get a feel for this inference to the best explanation. I'm going to go through one that has some defined terms that we'll read through a little bit more. And then I have this one on Judaism, truth and Judaism, truth tests, educational philosophy, and the five models of philosophy and Jewish law. So here we got Leah Henderson, inference to the best explanation, Bayesianism, and the problem of logical constraints. Many philosophical accounts of scientific theory comparisons take as a starting point competition between mutually exclusive alternative hypotheses. However, in scientific inquiry, it often appears that hypotheses which are in competition with one another are not mutually exclusive. For example, hypothesis which postulates just one cause of a particular event may compete with hypothesis which postulates a conjunction of causes. It appears that the conjunctive hypothesis does not exclude the single cause hypothesis, but rather entails it since the single cause hypothesis may be seen as a special case of the conjunctive hypothesis. The apparent existence of logical relations between competing hypotheses then presents a problem for models of scientific inference, which assumes that competing theories are mutually exclusive. I call this the problem of logical constraints. The problem has been raised in slightly different guises for the inference of the best explanation in Bayesianism. In this paper, I show how taking a hierarchical view of theory comparison allows us to resolve this problem. Scientific theory evaluation takes place at multiple levels, with more general theories competing against each other at higher levels and more specific hypotheses competing at lower levels. High level theories can be seen as mutually exclusive alternatives, even while logical relations are respected at lower levels. So last week I talked about multiple hypothesis testing. This is very similar. Multiple hypothesis testing is, is more common in new machine learning algorithms. Uh, you mentioned Chamberlain in the uh, method of multiple working hypothesis. Uh, this is more Bayesian and conceivable to eliminate, you know, so the inference to the best explanation. Many philosophical accounts of scientific theory comparison take as a starting point competition between mutually exclusive alternative hypotheses. However, in scientific inquiry, it often appears that hypotheses which are in competition with one another are not mutually exclusive. For example, hypothesis which postulates just one cause of a particular event may compete with hypothesis which postulates the conjunction of causes. It appear that the conjunctive hypothesis does not exclude the single cause hypothesis, but rather entails it since the single cause hypothesis may be seen as a special case of the conjunctive hypothesis, the apparent existence of a logical relation between competing hypotheses then presents a problem for models of scientific inference, which assume that competing theories are mutually exclusive. I call this a problem of logical constraints. The problem has been raised in slightly different guises for both inference to the best explanation and for Bayesianism. Broadly speaking, to resolve the tension, there are two approaches we can take. One, we can accept the competing theories can be logically compatible with each other and either abandoning existing models of scientific inference to extend and reframe them to account for a competition between non-mutually exclusive hypotheses. We can argue that despite appearances, the competing theories in scientific practice really can be seen as mutually exclusive. In this case, existing models of scientific inference are adequate 
as they stand. In this paper, I argue for the latter approach. I will not argue directly against the first approach, but in my argument that the competing theories really are mutually exclusive succeeds, then the first approach becomes unnecessary. My approach will be based on the recognition that scientific theory evaluation takes place at multiple levels with more general theories competing against each other at higher levels and more specific hypotheses competing at lower levels. I argue that according to the reasonable conception of higher level theories, they can be seen as mutually exclusive alternatives, even while logical relations are respected at a lower level. So just to brief the problem of logical constraints and scientific inquiry, we often see cases in which hypothesis postulating one cause of a particular event competes with a hypothesis which postulates the conjunction of causes. Schumpach and Glax give a helpful example from paleontology. Scientists have considered direct hypothesis about the cause of mass extinction of the uh, Cretaceous uh, paleogene boundary about 65 million years ago that wiped out dinosaurs. One influential hypothesis is that the extinction was caused by a biload impact. Evidence for this impact hypothesis include an unusual layer of clay in the boundary with an anonymously high level of iridium. So I'm not going to read through this, although let's go a little through the here, the, the, you know, the example of the kind of the historical evolutionary, you know, call scientific versus something where you're explaining the past as opposed to predicting the future. There may also be cases where one hypothesis competes against a disjunction of hypothesis. For example, according to Aristotelian theories, living organisms could arise either as the result of generation from parent organisms or by spontaneous generation from inanimate matters such as earth and water. Aristotle thought that some organisms in particular, some small fish, eels, and barnacles do not arise from living parent organisms, but are instead spontaneously generated from inanimate material. A series of experiments in the 17th through 19th century eventually convinced scientists that spontaneous generation does not occur. Although living creatures like maggots or worms could be observed to appear apparently spontaneously or meet on meat or in broth when effort was made to isolate the medium from all possible sources or contamination by living organisms, the production of living creatures is no longer observed. Thus, the general Aristotelian hypothesis that living organisms could be produced either from living organisms or by spontaneous generation was replaced by a single causal explanation. Living organisms could be produced from other living organisms. These kind of examples have been used to argue that scientific inference can involve competition between logically compatible hypotheses. So this article goes on, but uh, you know this inference to the best explanation is kind of using a Bayesian theory to try to look at multiple theories at the same time. And this one becomes a little bit technical about Bayesian. There's a lot of examples, uh, but let me try to hit it from a different angle. So putting inference to the best explanation into context it is often assumed that inference to the best explanation belongs to the context of justification. But several recent developments might lead one to ask whether it is more appropriate to situate the, it in the context of pursuit, uh, piercing abduction which has been designated as an immediate precursor to inference of the best explanation, IBE, is according to recent scholarship best located in the context of discovery and pursuit rather than justification. Furthermore, alleged difficulties in recognizing IBE with Bayesianism have led to the proposal for giving IBE a non-justificatory role, which is close to that of pursuit. I argue, however, that these considerations do not make a strong case for locating inference of the best explanation in the context of pursuit. Although abduction plays a role, important role in the context of pursuit, inference of the best explanation is not simply renaming of abduction. It has been reconceptualized in a way that makes it unsuitable to operate in the context of pursuit. Considerations concerning the compatibility between IBE and Bayesianism also not give strong grounds to locate IBE outside of the context of justification. This is because we should not expect that the context of justification can be characterized in purely probabilistic terms. Thus, IBE should continue to be regarded as a candidate for characterizing epistemic appraisal in the context of justification. There's a well-known distinction in philosophy of science between the core context of justification 
and the context of discovery. Roughly, the context of justification is concerned with the part of scientific inquiry which attempts to justify theories as either true or well-supported or confirmed by evidence, whereas the concept of discovery is concerned with what part of the scientific inquiry in which new hypotheses are formulated. It has also been suggested there is another concept, context that it pursuit. This context is concerned with questions about which theory should be further pursued in scientific investigations. It is often tacitly assumed that inference to the best explanation belongs to the context of justification, but two recent developments might seem suggest that it is more appropriate to situate in the context of pursuit. First, in many accounts, inference to the best explanation is presented as if it were simply a renaming of a form of explanatory inference, which has been recognized since at least the time of Charles Sanders Pierce, namely abduction. Yet recent scholars have persuasively argued that abduction for Pierce had no role in what we now call the context of justification. Rather, they argue the best interpretation of his view is that he regarded abduction as inference from central to the context of discovery and perhaps also the context of pursuit. The fact that hypothesis could provide an explanation of certain surprising facts was a reason to think of it in the first place and also to regard it as a worthy of further pursuit. Now, if inference of the best explanation is indeed a direct heir to Percy and abduction, it might also be regarded as primary a theory of pursuit rather than justification. Another line of thought which seems to lead to similar direction comes from a consideration of whether IB can be made compatible with Bayesianism, which is usually taken to belong to the context of justification. This has been a debated issue, with some arguing for incompatibilist positions and others for compatibilism between the two forms of inference. Recently, Frank Cabrera suggested that the most promising compatibilist accounts do not, in fact, account for everything that is going on in inference to the best explanation. 2017, the study proposes that inference to the best explanation and Bayesianism are complementary forms of inference, not because they can be shown to be compatible, because they have different functional roles in scientific inquiry. This can be interpreted as a proposal that inference to the best explanation should be regarded not as a theory of justification, but rather of something closer to pursuit. In this paper, I argue that these considerations do not make a strong case for locating IBE in the context of pursuit. While it's true that abduction plays a role for Pierce in determination of pursuit worthiness, it does not amount to anything like a rule or theory for pursuit worthiness. Furthermore, IBE is not just renaming of abduction, but has been reconceptualized in a way which situates it more definitely in the context of justification. Secondly, I will argue that the objections to compatibilism between IB and Bayesianism are not sufficient to motivate regarding these as belonging to different contexts. My conclusion is that neither argument succeeds in motivating the view that IBE is primary theory of pursuit worthiness, and it should continue to be seen as a candidate for a normative account situated in the context of justification. The plan of this paper is to follow, first introducing what the distinction uh, between the two contexts amounts to. I will discuss first the historical arguments for situating IBE in the context of pursuit, and then the argument for the relationship with Bayesian and Context. Originally, the distinction between the context of justification and context of discovery was made to demarcate the proper domain of epistemology as a normative enterprise. The claim was, as Reichenbach put it, that epistemology is only occupied in constructing the context of justification. That is, epistemology deals with the question of how well justified theories are by the evidence without reference to the process by which these theories came into existence. The process by which scientists actually came up with the hypothesis for the hypothesis, space belongs to the context of discovery. In philosophers such as Reichenbach and Popper, the context of discovery is regarded as a free province where creative processes hold sway, which cannot be regimented by the normative investigative of epistemology. The context of justification was then characterized in terms of hypothesis space and a set of evidence which were both treated as exogenous or given. The task in this context was to conceive as one of developing a logic of confirmation, which might be developed either in terms of logical or a probabilistic relation between the hypothesis and the evidence. For example, Bayesianism presented itself as an important candidate for tracking problems such as when is one hypothesis better supported by the evidence than another hypothesis. The Bayesian addresses this question as follows. First, start with a prior distribution over the hypothesis. When evidence is obtained, update the prior probability to the conditional probability of the hypothesis. The conditional probability of the hypothesis gives the evidence or posterior probability given by Bayes' rule, where you have the likelihood and a normalization constant the hypothesis with higher posterior probabilities then can be regarded as better supported or justified. 
philosophers have also considered the question of how much hypotheses are supported by particular evidence leading to a variety of confirmation measures. Later, the purpose of drawing a distinction between contexts can be seen not so much as a demarcation of the proper domain of normative evaluation of science, but rather as a way to characterize different types of normative evaluation. A number of writers began to think that actually some normative characterizations of the context of discovery is possible after all. And interesting, they also appealed to piercing abduction as providing an inference from that might characterize the discovery process from this point of view, the point of making distinctions between contexts is to delineate the different kinds of normative questions which can be asked about scientific inquiry. The context of discovery can terms a set of normative questions about which hypothesis it is appropriate to formulate at the outset of scientific inquiry. The context of justification, on the other hand, concerns normative questions to do with what has been called epistemic appraisal, questions concerning truth or empirical support, such as which hypotheses are better supported or justified by evidence. The context of pursuit is in some sense intermediary between discovery and justification and concerns questions about which hypothesis should be pursued in further scientific investigation. This task is assessed the research potential of theories, their promise of unexplored possibilities is called heuristic appraisal, in contrast with the epistemic appraisal concerning confirmation of truth, which goes on in the context of justification. For each context, there can be different views about the type of normative appraisal that is involved. For the context of discovery, there is still debate about the type of psychological process in play and the extent to which norms can govern a free creative process. However, even if one thinks that there cannot be a right way to discover a hypothesis, one might still admit that there are some basic normative constraints of the product of the process. That is, there are some basic constraints what a theory must be able to do in order to accept be acceptable as a candidate for further pursuit and or testing that const constitutes a minimalist understanding of what is involved in the context of discovery. The epistemic appraisal involves the context of justification, can also be understood in different ways. Traditionally, epistemic appraisal is taken to involve questions of truth, and the epistemic attitudes in question are then either beliefs or credences. However, there is a variety of views about both the aim of epistemic appraisals and what can be achieved, and the er these are associated with different views on what epistemic attitudes are at stake. A more minimalistic understanding of epistemic appraisal would take it to involve appraisal epistemic support. Such an evaluation will always concern a relation between the hypothesis and a particular body of evidence, how well theory is supported by the evidence. But we may well be interested in going beyond the assessment of empirical support and asking when theories are justified in some stronger, more absolute sense. After all, we want to know which theories we should act on for immediate purposes. Traditionally, these are the theories which we believe or to which we have give higher credence. But one might be less ambitious about what epistemic appraisals can achieve. We might simply want to know what a theory we can treat as if it were true, even if we do not necessarily believe everything it says. Loudon designates this attitude of treating as true as acceptance. And he says, particularly in cases where certain experiments are practical actions are contemplated, this is the operative modality. When, for instance, a research immunologist must prescribe medication for a volunteer in an experiment, when a physicist decides what measuring instrument to use for studying a problem, when a chemist is seeking to synthesize a compound with certain properties, in all these cases, a scientist must commit, however, tentatively to accept ins of one group of theories and research tradition, traditions and rejection of others. Here, Loudon is concerned with theories that are taken to be true for the purposes of ongoing scientific investigation, but presumably acceptance should also play a special role in immediate applications to practical problems. For instance, if a theory is accepted that a certain medicine is efficacious against a certain disease, this will be a central consideration in governing prescription choices by doctors. Acceptance in Loudon sense may be characterized by certain dispositions, in particular to assert the theory or to use it in a range of contexts. Gregory Dawes, for example, says that to accept a proposition is to employ it as a premise in one's reasoning, whether theoretical or practical, in any domain to which it might apply. Uh, Dawes conjoins this by having a realist aim with the goal of attaining knowledge, but one could also conform it with taking the aim of scientific inquiry to be something more modest like empirical adequacy. Acceptance as used in these more minimalistic ways needs not involve any sense of inner conviction such as might be taken to be characteristic of belief, rather is the attitude that one takes towards the theory one takes to be the best bet for current use. In summary, then, there are different kinds of epistemic attitudes which may be associated with epistemic appraisal. The appraisal may be aimed at determining what to believe 
but it may also involve evaluation in which theories can we treat as true and accept in London sense. In fact, Laudan chooses to talk about the context of acceptance instead of a context of justification. I will continue to use the term context of justification, but with the understanding that it may involve a number of different epistemic attitudes, including belief as well as Laudan's notion of acceptance. Finally, the heuristic appraisal in the context of pursuit can also be understood in different ways. The main concern is the question of which theories to pursue in future investigations. For this, one must assess the promise or potential of a theory for the future based on the current status in relation to the evidence and possibly also aspects of its historical development to date. There's been some work on characterizing heuristic appraisal, but has been generally received less attention than the epistemic appraisal. One view of a heuristic appraisal takes it that is be a much broader category than epistemic appraisal. Thomas Nichols presented a number of reasons for this view, including the idea that heuristic appraisal figures at all stages of research and concerns not just theories, but also problems, techniques, equipment, personnel. Uh, assessment of problems may also require attention to historical indicators rather than just the current epistemic status of the theory. For example, it could be that the overall rate of development of the theory is important or its track record in meeting new challenges. Also importantly, a broad sense of a heuristic appraisal involves a prudential or practical consideration as well as of evidentiary considerations. What research should be pursued has to involve considerations of the significance or importance of the outcome, not just considerations of whether the hypothesis are likely to be true or false. It also depends on the questions like what resources are available. One might try to set aside some of these practical considerations, cost, uh, et cetera, and focus on specific epistemic notions of pursuit worthiness. Uh, Cizelja, of, for example, suggests considering the type of pursuit which conduces to distinctly epistemic as opposed to practical goals. One might then take this kind of epistemically focused heuristic appraisal to be kind of anticipatory epistemic appraisal that is an evaluation of possible truth or possible future degree of confirmation. But this is important to stress that this is not equivalent to just determining which theories get the best epistemic appraisal now. Newer theories may not yet have the same opportunity to develop to their full potential, and they may later turn out to be more effective than currently best confirmed theories. As Cezalja 2012 points out, robustness in the face of uncertainty is important consideration in the context of pursuit. It is important not just to pursue the theory with the most epistemic promise, but also a number of backup theories since future investigation may derail the theory, which can curr currently enjoys the best epistemic appraisal. The norms from the context of pursuit then must take account of this hedging on bets, even when the focus is on potential epistemic performance, although one will not usually want to regard to contradictory theories as being both justified, it can be quite rational for scientists to work on and pursue mutually inconsistent theories. As several authors have noted, the interesting question about pursuit worthiness concerns not the individual scientists, but the scientific community as a whole. What is the most rational for an individual scientist to pursue depends on large measure in idiosyncratic factors like training, what theory of pursuit worthiness concerns is what set of theories the scientific community as a whole should pursue. Here, the aim is that a space of possibilities is thoroughly investigated by the community, and that means that some groups of scientists may and indeed should work on theories which a particular moment of time have less epistemic support. This is to ensure the robustness of the scientific inquiry as a whole, since it avoids prematurely shutting down potentially fruitful avenues of inquiry. John Worrell provides a nice illustration of how the different normative questions can come apart even for individual scientists, he analyzes the case of David Brewster, a 19th century scientist primarily remembered for his work on optics. As Worrell's accounts, Brewster's epistemic appraisal was that the wave theory of light was more empirically successful than the Newtonian corpuscle theory. Nevertheless, Brewster's heuristic appraisal was that Newtonian theory was nonetheless worthy of pursuit and possibly more so than the wave theory. Brewster thought this because he judged the heuristic potential of the Newtonian theory to be high despite some setbacks. There need not to be any contradiction in Brewster's combination of views if his views about the empirical success are located in a different context, thus addressing a different normative question than his views about pursuit. In this paper, I will examine the question in the proper context for inference of the best explanation. It is possible that a particular form of inference could play a normative role in more than one context, although the role may be different in each. On the other hand, it could also be the particular kind of inference is really designed to answer the questions of one of the contexts it is not appropriate for others, or it could be that an inference from form has a primary role in one context, but can also do some work in others. 
In what follows, I will consider two different lines of arguments for regarding inference to the best explanation as playing a primary normative role in the context of pursuit rather than justification. I would argue that both arguments are unsuccessful. So this is actually a pretty long study and uh, encourage people to read through it, but uh, that's all I'm going to be able to uh, look at for now. So I went over some of this with Jennifer on Week in Review a while back ago, although I might try to go through this paper in totality now and um, you know, seeing like you said, like truth, how do you assess truth, the correspondence value of truth, which is similar to Bayesian reason, that Bayesian um, your probability is a good method of assessing the current correlation of the reality, the theory with the reality, and, you know, it's iterative and will give a predictive power in saying that it won't assess it as true or false. It'll give a predictive power that will be a value between zero and one. And, you know, some level of truth at zero or one, but in most forms of research, you're going to have a probability. And so that's why generally science does not speak of truth because theories are only probable. And then here, like the inference to the best explanation, where you have multiple competing theories and they have a certain level of explanatory power. So let's look at this paper from probability to consilience, how explanatory values implement Bayesian reasoning. And this one has a lot of good definitions and some mathematics. Recent work in cognitive science has uncovered a diversity of explanatory value or dimensions along which we judge explanations as better or worse. We propose a Bayesian account of how these values fit together to guide explanation. The resulting taxonomy provides a set of predictors for which explanations people prefer and show how core values from psychology, statistics, and the philosophy of science emerge from a common mathematical framework. In addition to operationalizing the explanatory virtues associated with, for example, scientific argument making, this framework also enables us to reinterpret the explanatory vices that drive conspiracy theories, delusions, and extremist ideologies, explaining explanation. Intuitively, philosophy, and as seen in laboratory experiments, explanations are judged as better or worse on the basis of how many of many different criteria. These explanatory values will appear in early childhood and their influence extends to some of the most sophisticated social knowledge formation processes we know. We lack, however, an understanding of the origin of these values or an account of how they fit together to guide belief formation. The multiplicity of values also appears to conflict with Bayesian models of cognition, which speak solely in terms of degrees of belief and suggest we judge explanations as better or worse on the basis of a single quantity of the posterior likelihood. In this explanation, we show how to resolve these conflicts by arguing that previously identified explanatory values capture different components of full Bayesian calculation and when considered together with weighted appropriately implement Bayesian cognition. This framework shows how key explanatory values identified by laboratory experiments and philosophy of science, co-explanation, descriptiveness, precision, unification, power, and simplicity emerge naturally from the mathematical structure, structure of the probabilistic inference, thereby reconciling them with Bayesian models of cognition. Secondly, it shows how these values combine to produce preference for one explanation over the other. Third, it emphasizes new conceptual distinctions, such as one between explanatory values that can be assessed before the arrival of data, theoretical values, and those that can be assessed after the arrival of data, empirical values. Finally, it enables us to reinterpret work on the characteristic deviations from normative patterns of explanation that drive phenomena such as conspiracy theories, delusions, and extremist ideology. It also resolves a tension between influential philosophies account to of inference to the best explanation, which says belief formation is or should be guided by explanatory considerations, while some hold that inference to the best explanation is compatible with Bayesian updating because explanatory considerations can be captured within a probabilistic framework. Others argue that the two are either compatible or potentially even identical. We adopt this latter perspective and show our framework provides a compelling, albeit preliminary, account of how such an emergent compatibilism can be achieved. 
the highlights. Recent experiments show that the value explanation for many reasons, such as predictive power and simplicity, Bayesian rational analysis provides a functional account of these values, along with concrete definitions that allow us to measure and compare them across a variety of contexts, including visual perception, politics, and science. These values include descriptiveness, co-explanation, unification, power, and simplicity, and fall into two groups. The first are associated with the evaluation of explanations in the light of experience, while the latter concern the intrinsic features of an explanation. Fairs to explain well can be understood as imbalances in these values. A conspiracy theorist, for example, may overrate co-explanation relative to simplicity, and many similar failures to explain that we see in social life may be analyzable at this level. Bayes' rule of decomposition into explanatory values. Formally, the explanation E is evaluated on the basis of its log likelihood in the presence of evidence. Using Bayes' rule, this gives us uh, the descriptiveness and the co-explanation, theoretical values, and contextual factors. The terms in this decomposition are descriptiveness, which means the total extent to which an explanation predicts each fact in isolation from others, co-explanation, which measures the extent to which the explanation links facts together, theoretical or evidence independent values, and context dependent priors. For simplicity, we do not show the additional normalization term that is constant across all explanations and thus does not affect comparison between explanations. Bayesian framework for explanatory values. Bayes' rule says that we should value an explanation in terms of a posterior degree of belief determined by a prior degree of belief in that explanation times the probability that it assigns to the data that we have observed. Working with log probabilities means that the components of the calculation combine additively, matching the intuition that we weigh multiple, feature, multiple features of an explanation by adding them together to make a final determination about its validity. Box one shows how the log posterior can be rearranged into a series of additive terms which define mathematically values identified across a variety of different contexts. The first two terms are empirical and track how explanation accounts for observed data. Descriptiveness, formerly the log likelihood under the assumption that the data are independent, measures how well an explanation predicts the facts in isolation, and co-explanation, formerly this information theoretical point-wise multi-information, measures how well an explanation predicts patterns that connect facts together. The next terms are theoretical and track the value of an explanation independently from the data. As we'll argue, the two key theoretical values correspond to expected empirical values, while others reflect structural features of an explanation in context-dependent priors. This leads to two pairs of explanatory values, descriptiveness and power, co-explanation and unification, that appear either at the empirical or theoretical stage, respectively, along with an additional theoretical value of simplicity. The correspondence between the mathematical terms and explanatory values are shown in the glossary. We will discuss each in turn explanation through the lens of descriptiveness and power. The simplest way to judge an explanation is to consider each piece of evidence for it independently, keeping a running, ta running tally to the degree to which it makes the explanation look better or worse. This is captured by descriptiveness, the sum of the independent log probabilities of the relevant facts. Although descriptiveness neglects that facts are rarely independent, it nevertheless often works quite well. For example, when evaluating students on the basis of their grade, we can usually interpret each mark as an independent reflection of academic ability, thus making GPA a useful summary. On the other hand, overemphasis on descriptiveness is a domain where correlations really do matter, resulting in cognitive bias known as correlation neglect. The theoretical value corresponding to descriptiveness is power. How descriptive an explanation is in a world where it is it was true. Valuing power means valuing explanations that make more definite predictions. All other things being equal, more descriptiveness is always a good thing. Power is more ambiguous, and someone might consider power to be virtue or vice. High-power explanations make definitive predictions and therefore more easily falsified. They are also more easily learned from experience. Further, if you believe in a high-power explanation, you expect those who have value descriptiveness to be receptive to it as well. Power can also be a vice, however, because the world is not always as predictable as we might wish in uncertain situations, one might have value low power explanations as more open-minded and allowing for a wider range of possibilities. Indeed, in statistics, um, has advocated for the principle of maximum entropy, which views minimizing precision, the sum of power and unification as a universal normative rule of inference because it presumes to know at least a pariah. So glossary. 
explanation and account of some observable aspects of the world in the Bayesian framework and explanation supplies a probability distribution over events, explanatory values, explanatory features that lead us to prefer one explanation over another, empirical values, ways in which explanations can be valued on the basis of data, log likelihood, the log probability and observed data given an explanation, descriptiveness, the total log probability of observed data given an explanation when each observation is considered in isolation, co-explanation, the relative increase in log probability that an explanation gives a pattern of observed data above its ability to predict each piece of in isolation, equal to point-wise mutual information in the case of two variables or point-wise multi-information in the general case. Theoretical values, priors, or ways in which an explanation can be valued without reference to data, precision, the expected likelihood of data conditional on the explanation being true, also equal to the negative entropy of the explanation, measures the degree to which an explanation's predictions concentrate on a particular subset of the space of all possible outcomes, power, the expected descriptiveness of data conditional on the explanation being true, measures the degree to which an explanation tends to produce individual pieces of data that can account for an isolation, Unification, the expected co-explanation of data conditional on the explanation being true, also equal to the mutual information in the case of two variables or the multi-information in the general case, measures the degree to which an explanation predicts patterns of outcomes and connects multiple variables together. Simplicity, any function that measures how straightforward an explanation is. Examples include parsimony, concision, and elegance. The appropriate choice of will generally depends on context. Parsimony, a type of simplicity that reflects the number of elements, parameters, or principles of an explanation requires. Concision, the type of simplicity that measures how compact an explanation is by counting the number of words required to communicate it. Explanatory value in action. A common paradigm to tease apart explanatory values is disease diagnosis. Participants are asked to explain a patient's symptoms by reference to the different medical condition. The figure above illustrates a general case in the task where there are three potential explanations shaded in red, blue, and yellow with density of each color indicating probability. This might produce different patterns of symptoms here, different combinations of a patient's blood, oxygenization, and temperature. In the framework of Bayesian explanatory values proposed here, the blue explanation has low power. It allows for a wide range of outcomes and low unification. Patient temperature is not particularly well predicted by oxygenation. The red explanation is a higher power, a narrow range of possibilities, and a zero, non-zero co-explanation. High patient temperatures are usually accompanied by low blood oxygenation. The yellow explanation is similar to the red in that both powerful and co-explanatory, but implies less simple relationship between oxygenation and temperature. Confronted with these three different patients, these explanations have also different empirical values. For example, the red explanation is lower descriptiveness than the yellow explanation, but higher co-explanation than the blue. For the particular case of patient A, red also has higher co-explanation than yellow, since a patient with A's temperature under the yellow co-explanation could have a wider oxygenation rate. Which explanation best depend is best depends on the context. And if the yellow explanation is more value on the basis of descriptiveness and co-explanation power or unification, a person may still come to prefer the red or even the blue with a strong enough preference for simplicity. For example, the yellow explanation may produce its complex relationship between oxygenation and temperature by invoking the presence of two diseases simultaneously or through a complicated interaction of different underlying conditions. Explanations are evaluated relative to a usually stable background ontology. If the ontology changes, so do the values. Explanation through the lens of co-explanation and unification. In addition to considering facts in isolation, we also care about how they connect together. This is captured by co-explanation, which measures how well an explanation predicts a pattern of observation over and above how well it accounts for each independently. While this definition arises naturally from a Bayesian decomposition, its mathematical form matches that proposed as an operation of inference the best explanation and as an operation of explanatory considerations. 
Call explanation is high when explanation says some features of the data are predicted by others. For example, when economists observed that unemployment and inflation were inversely correlated, they proposed the relationship was a general law of the Phillips curve. Explanations that include this law had, as a consequent, co-explanatory values. Inflation appeared to become predictable given knowledge of unemployment. Beyond economics, this value is particularly relevant to domains characterized by correlating common causes such as disease and medical diagnosis, legal cases, and social interaction. Psychological studies in these domains are often implicit tests of an individual sensitivity to co-explanation as explanatory value. When that the mind links certain distinct experiences into coherent wholes is also at the heart of Gestalt psychology. To apply the Gestalt category means to find out which parts of nature belong as parts to function wholes, to discover their position in these wholes, their degree of relative independence, and the articulation of larger wholes and sub -holes. And vision, for example, is argued that we perceive not the individual pieces of a raw sense data, but rather the explanation that links them together. The Kinesa triangle is compelling because the implicit shape we see co-explains the orientations of the missing wedges. Co-explanation has the parallel theoretical value of unification. The expected co-explanation of the explanation conditional upon the truth. Unification says that the world is characterized not by coincidences, but patterns as commonly value in philosophy of science. A good scientific theory makes a manifestation of different phenomena dependent on each other. In a similar account, for whom good theories were a systemic picture of the order of nature. As with power, unification may be both virtue and vice. Even when the unifying theory is complicated, it does not assert that the world itself is simple because knowledge of some of its features allow you to predict others. Unifying theories like powerful ones are more testable. One could not only look for unexpected events, but also patterns. On the other hand, experiments show that unification may be perceived as a vice. Consider, for example, two explanations for why So explanation through the lens of simplicity and other priors. Explanation has and descriptiveness help us weigh explanations in a Bayesian fashion. Without simplicity, however, there are rarely good enough as pointed out by thinkers such as Galileo, Newton, and Kant. And one can often improve the, an explanation by adding more parameters, exceptions, and mechanisms and observation linked to Occam's razor. In Bayesian inference, simplicity enters into the prior. Accordingly, our intuition Intuitive notion of simplicity is captured by one or more theoretical value. Um, we find evidence for using an alien disease paradigm that puts descriptiveness and simplicity here parsimony into conflict. Participants' explanatory preference are consistent with a value for descriptiveness, plus a constant data independent penalty for theory elaborateness, lack of parsimony. Further research has shown that preference take from early in childhood development and are the robust across context. Simplicity is complex, and our intuitive notion is an amalgam of many theoretical considerations. Table three will illustrate the independent operation to such considerations when explanations have causal form. The upper left theory is both more parsimonious, fewer hidden causes, and more unified, providing a joint account of events than the bottom right theory. However, these effects can be decomposed. We therefore also have a parsimonious disjointed theories where each visible aspect has a streamlined but not a streamlined but not overlapping latent causal structure and elaborate unified theories where everything is connected by sprawling web of relations. This latter kind is reminiscent of conspiracy theories, where in one sense everything is very simple, all visible aspects are connected to each other, but that simplicity is achieved by postulating an elaborate web of hidden connections. In statistics, simplicity is part of a model of selection, and there are many forms that commonly used a cakey information criterion and Bayesian information criterion are parsimony measures that count the number of parameters in a theory in machine learning regularizations, terms penalize non-zero parameters, values to prevent overfitting of data. Meanwhile, the maximum entropy principle understands simplicity as negative precision. There is general consensus, both simplicity in is crucial to normative decision making, and however the value is measured it ought to enter additively in log space as in terms of prior. Uh, well, statistical models are often 
concerned with prediction, the psychological value of simplicity goes well beyond this goal. Simple explanations can be easier to remember and work with. It may be preferred because we are limited beings with cognitive restraint. The simple explanation may be better because it requires fewer cognitive resources to apply or leads to fewer mistakes. Simple explanations are also easier to communicate and teach and thus ease social coordination. Simplicity may even be seen as an aesthetic value with simple explanations described as elegant and on that basis, valuable in and of themselves, mathematical beauty plays a significant, if controversial, role in physics. Simplicity is not the only domain general theoretical value, as there are many prior reasons to prefer one theory over another. Entire classes of explanations may be categorically better than others. For example, those that reveal causal mechanisms explain new phenomenon by analogy to familiar ones or feature concrete mechanisms rather than abstract principles. Within each class, humans have been shown to hold strong contextual informed priors for certain kinds of explanations. For example, we prefer explanations that involve disease causing symptoms over the reverse and find some causal connection immediately plausible. These priors reflect our ability to flexibly apply background knowledge to new problems and often take the form of intuitions and instincts, what Galileo referred to as the natural light that guards our reason. So table one, in these diagrams that represent the causal structure are different explanations. Shaded nodes represent observables. Other nodes represent postulates, latent causes, and arrows represent causal relationship. Simplicity is a rich com concept that likely binds together multiple intuitions simultaneously. One way of assessing simplicity is parsimony, which counts the number of parameters or latent causes invoked by an explanation. A second way of assessing simplicity is unification, which measures the degree to which a theory provides an overarching, connected account of multiple features of the world. Explanations can vary along each of these dimensions independently so that the overall simplicity might be judged as an additive composite of the two. When values become vices, our approach yields a normative prescription where deviations from equal weighting lead to characteristic explanatory pathologies which conceptualize um, what's called vice epistemology. Consider the phenomenon of overgeneralization, attempting to cover all examples with a single explanation rather than allowing for exceptions. This can be caused by overvaluing co-explanation relative descriptiveness or by overvaluing unification since theories that have high unification will tend to have higher co-explanation when they're good fits to the data. What makes a weighting virtuous varies across context. For example, the appropriate amount of simplicity depends on the domain, and there is evidence that people complexity match allow the perceived complexity of the explendum and guide priors on the simplicity of the explanation. What that being said, with that being said, recent empirical work has started to tie abnormal reasoning to common inferential bias that generalize across domains in the way that suggests the systematic miscalibration of values may be at fault. For example, those prone to paranormal thinking also show susceptibility to the conjunction fallacy. This can result in overvaluing co-explanation because labeling um, provides co-explanatory account. Empirical work has also established strong individual differences in the tendency to believe conspiracies. Those who believe one are more likely to believe in others. This trait is common with individuals who with schizotypal disorders, which are linked in order to a number of other explanatory abnormalities. The finding that conspiratorial mindedness is a stable trait suggests that his associated beliefs may be accumulated over time, at least in part to a systematic miscalibration of individuals' weighing of explanatory values. Conspiracy theories often both abnormally co-explanatory and descriptive, they account for anomalous facts which are unlike un under the official explanation and show how seemingly arbitrary facts of ordinary life are correlated to hidden events. Um, finding that manipulation which induces subject to see correlations in neutral domains like stock returns also increase belief in conspiracy theories. Finally, famously conspiracy theories are unifying. They describe a universe where everything is correlated by a network of hidden common causes, the motives and meetings of the conspirators. Valuing these features is not in and of itself a vice. What frequently goes wrong is the failure to balance these values against others, such as simplicity or contextual priors that urge trust in institutions and downweight generalizations associated with racist, sexist, or anti-Semitic prejudice. On the surface, the conspiracy 
the theory is quite simple as it unfolded. However, increasing complexity is required to explain contradictory evidence and to cover up that has so far prevented it from coming to light. Such a judgment is itself open to criticism as noted by some conspiracies are extremely compelling on normative grounds. Some even turn out to be true. This latter point gets to the heart of what makes explanation so difficult. Striking a virtuous balance between so many considerations is a self-challenging cognitive problem, one that we solve partially by social circumspection. Failures at this level might help to explain anti-vaccination movements, COVID-19 conspiracies, the use of pseudoscience and extremist ideology, and science denialism. While these beliefs are part of form and maintained by social presence in addition to epistemic ones, their core logic often appeals to many of the same explanatory imbalances as conspiracy theories do. These interact with individual level predispositions, including what are usually taken to be pathologies of thought. One avenue for future research is how social processes may serve to maintain, accentuate, or exploit individual level explanatory imbalances, including remarks. Framing explanatory values as components of a Bayesian inference is a form of rational analysis, which seeks to understand mental states in terms of computational goals they help agents achieve. Such an approach has been applied to a wide range of subjective states, such as representativeness, suspicious coincidence, randomness, tip of the tongue, boredom and flow, mental efforts, and curiosity. Of these, explanation is the most closely related to curiosity. If curiosity drives us to seek answers to salient questions and to make sense of the world around us, then explanatory values are subjective states that signal often in compelling hedonic form when good answers have been found. A Bayesian framing naturally centers on an explanation's ability to predict observed data. Explanation is more than prediction, however, and other features are necessary to satisfy the many social cognitive practical constraints that bear on the practice. A highly predictive black box, for example, is not something that we can evaluate in terms of theoretical constructions, such as parsimony or unification. Even when the black box is opened, what is inside may be so far from virtuous in the human sense that it scarcely counts as an explanation at all. Even if it is intelligible in a literal sense, there's something more basic yet. Of course, an explanation must be intelligible before we can ask about its value. This is part of the explainability crisis in machine learning, and it's crucial to understanding thereby closing the gap between human and artificial intelligence. Well, a rational analysis of explanatory values is an important first step Further work is needed to address the intelligibility problem. All explanations occur against the backdrop of folk theories, worldviews, and explanations that have come before. This opinion suggests that it may be possible to enumerate atomic explanatory values and that the history of explanation is largely the history of their relative emphasis. Given the explanations emerge in social contexts, however, we might also expect new values, especially theoretical ones, to appear over time. This dynamical contextual natural of Explanations are clarifies why explanations seem more valuable when they co-explain phenomenon that on the basis of previous understanding were conceptually distant. Indeed, conceptual distance and co-explanation may be two sides of the co of the same coin, which is conceptually distant, may just be what with our current explanations we cannot co-explain. Another important aspect of the dynamical side of explanation is the role prediction of a sample reevaluation when new information arrives because predicting the future is much more challenging than accounting for what is already known. Doing so can become a powerful source of empirical value. The importance of conceptual distance and power of confirmation by unexpected data came together in consilience. Consilience is the explanatory value introduced in the 17th century to describe features of scientific explanation that both are and ought to be prized by the community. The consilience of inductions we well rights takes place when induction obtained from one class of fact coincides with induction obtained from another class. Such a coincidence of untried facts with speculative assertions cannot be the works of chance, but implies some portion of the truth in the principles on which the reasoning is founded. Indeed, for we well conciliates carries simplicity and unification along for the ride for conciliant explanations. All the additional suppositions tend to simplicity and harmony. The system becomes more coherent and is further extended. The elements which we require for explaining a new class of facts are already contained in our system. Different members of the theory run together, and we have thus a constant convergence to unity. We will far from the only writer to draw attention to the general features of what makes for a good explanation, and a significant part of social interaction involves debating and arguing for different explanations on the basis of the values they exhibit. 
the implicit bargain for this paper is that such values may be amenable to the analysis in terms of basic atomic units active in similar ways across a great variety of domains. Once identified, these units can provide a new way to understand how people make sense of the world. The three stages of explanation, generation, selection, evaluation, with the observations and explanations. Explanation decomposes into three stages. We generate explanations or receive them from others, select among them, and reevaluate them based on subsequent experience. Our piece is focused on how values influence selection, but they're equally important in generation and reevaluation. Values help us decide which experiences to seek out next. Co explanation may lead. Uh, me to look in places where I expect the data to be correlated under a favorite hypothesis. Descriptiveness, conversely, may lead one to look for key counterexamples in the style of Kyle Popper's falsification. Values also act at the generation stage. Um, describing scientific hypothesis formulation as descriptiveness driven, where explanations are updated in response to outliers. One produces an explanation, looks for places that it fails, and tries to update it in response. Co explanation, the generation place could also look like piercy and abduction. The cycle augmented to include the gathering of data is used by both children and adults. A descriptive driven cycle need not be virtuous. Updating an explanation may increase its descriptiveness at the cost of theoretical values such as unification and simplicity. Kuhn's paradigm shift is driven in part by the decreasing simplicity of the standard paradigm as anomalies arrive. More and more epicycles are required to explain them. Rather than looking for outliers, because we value descriptiveness, one may look for correlations because we value co-explanations. A person who subscribes to a unifying group stereotype, for example, may ask if people belong to a group in question when they show the characteristic behaviors. More virtuously, co-explanation can drive scientists to compare evidence across different domains. Empirical values also direct attention at more basic cognitive level. Uh, you find that descriptiveness draws the eye to outliers. Attention to a group of pixels correlates with deviations from its predicted distributions. Co-explanation conversely draws attention to patterns that constitute gestalts. Theoretical values conversely are crucial to how we go about generation because we cannot consider every explanation. Parsimony and contextual considerations help us reject certain types of explanations out of hand. While unification makes the world itself easier to remember and describe, theoretical values can sometimes be a vice, and we often fail to generate good explanations even when we have the ability to recognize them. Okay, so one last paper to go through. A lot of information there, you know, putting a lot of things together, um, trying to go through you're really the full gamut of things related to the multiple truth hypothesis. So we covered theories of truth. You know, last week we were looking at uh, multiple hypothesis testing and you know, tonight we're looking at inference to the best explanation and explanatory power relating to Bayesianism and you know, a lot of statistical methods. And yeah, I'm going to try to tie this all together. So let's read this last one. It's pretty long. This is uh, translated from Hebrew. Um, I think you can find it online. I downloaded this just so... I would be able to get it in, in good size, but truth test educational philosophy in five models of the philosophy of Jewish law by Avinoam uh, Rosneck at Hebrew University. This article innovatively uses the principle of truth test and the logic of the philosophy of education as a tool for spelling out the philosophy of Jewish law. The five tests for verifying claims are the test of correspondence, the test of unity, coherence, the test of utility, pragmatism, and the test of simplicity or elegance, and the test of clarity. In the last part of the article, we shall see if we focus on the philosophical context of the discussion and take the comparison between the verification test and types of halakhic thought to the logical conclusions in the analytic and critical context, we shall find that this comparison not only illustrates the links between philosophical and halakhic discourses, but also points to the difficulties and possible defects in the various halakhic models articulated in this article. 
It is generally acknowledged that every religion claims exclusive possession of absolute truth. Ephraim Erbach, for example, has gathered a wide array of sources from within the Jewish tradition that attest to the centrality of the quest for truth and the claim to have obtained it. These sources encompass uh, biblical and classic rabbinic texts, medieval writers, and modern thinkers. In light of Erbach's analysis, religious truth can be understood in several ways. Some see it as flowing from personal certainty and therefore not subject to public philosophical examination. Others regard it as revealed by divine source, which necessitates overshadows all other human truths. These analyses necessarily deal not only with the standing of religion, but also that with halakha, uh, Jewish law. Each sheds light on the other. Indeed, the sources are replete with references to halakha decision-making processes and the respective appeases, as well in broader discussions of the oral Torah's authority of vis a vis that of the written Torah in general and prophecy in particular. That proposition makes a strong true claim for halakha regarding it as an embodiment of divine truth. It follows that no contest can exist between it and finite human truth system. This, The issue with examples has been widely treated in the literature, but does not really exhaust the arguments made within halakha. Does an analysis of halakha system, in fact, disclose additional halakha principles for verifying the law? Can we identify within the halakha arguments that overlap with truth tests that are familiar in science and philosophy? And if, in fact, evidence exists of additional truth tests within the halakha, what does that imply about the halakha world? In this article, I will take a first pass at examining in general terms the usefulness of philosophical verification techniques and understanding the Jewish religious phenomenon as manifested in halakhic theory and halakhic decisions. I will now not here consider the tension between the conclusions I draw and the idea of revelation as the truth test. This is an important issue requiring separate analysis. In the present context, I intend only to uncover various traces of five truth tests within halakhic discourse and note the diverse, sometimes conflicting premises implicit within the discourse, a diversity that has far-reaching halakhic cultural and social implications. I refer to the truth test in summary from only, and I will concentrate primarily on the halakhic implications and the philosophical analysis. Still given the breadth of the multifaceted nature of halakha, I make no claim that the truth test encompasses the entire scope of halakhic phenomenon. In using various models of truth tests, we can accomplish only what the use of models generally accomplished in cultural, sociological, or religious studies, illuminating, rationalizing, and systematizing portions of multifaceted phenomena. According to the analysis I cite, are explicit in support of my claims, and that too will be done in summary form, are ones on which the models at issues can shed light. It follows that the examples cited in connection with opposing models may themselves be contradictory to each other. Philosophical analysis of truth test is a theoretical matter as far as I can tell, no effect has previously been made to compare it to halakhic analysis because the philosophic discussion is primarily abstract. While halakhic addresses normative practice, I will use an intermediary discipline philosophy of education to mediate between the theoretical and practical spheres. This is an area that has done well in bridging theory and praxis, and we can follow in the footsteps. As noted, five verification tests may be cited, correspondence, uh, coherence, pragmatism, simplicity, or elegance, and clarity, self-evidence. What is the nature of these tests or arguments, and what ties them to the role of halakha? How can we use them to understand various aspects of halakhic discourse? The correspondence test holds the propositions true if it corresponds to the facts, assuming that the latter are subject to observation. This proposition plays a role in the empirical approach, which views the senses and experience as the source of our knowledge, in this approach shared by Aristotle, John Locke, and many others, the underlying epistemological premise of this premise is that the intellect is tabula rasa and stores new impressions drawn from our experiences. Everything is determined by the objective world as we experience it, and everything is subject to objective autonomous facts. This claim has naturally spawned some fascinating secondary analysis, which are beyond this article. The correspondence test has made its way into epistemological and pedagogical discourse. John Locke expounded on the didactic methods inspired by this approach as the Czech ed educator Johan Amos Kamikus. Israel Sheffer refers to the impression model. In this context, Sheffer contends that the process of learning takes place through the impression of simple ideas and concepts onto the pupil's mind by means of an unmediated encounter with reality and sensory experience. The ideas are then possessed, integrated, contained, and stored by the intellect. Experiences, he believe, are the touchstone 
by which every claim in theory must be measured. Does this model have halakhic implications? Can the halakhic phenomenon and the validity of the halakha be understood more clearly in light of the correspondence test? Before answering this question, the following clarification needs to be made. The philosophical test of correspondence concerns itself with the epistemological and or ontological issue. The field of halakha seems not to deal with these issues. However, or translate the philosophical discourse into normative halakha discussions, I will allow myself to do so because of the great similarity between the question, what is a true statement in philosophical discourse, and the question, what is a correct statement in the framework of halakha? Now we're able to ask, what is the correct true halakha in accordance with the correspondence text? In approaching halakha on the basis of this very conservative model, we respond to the query, what is the halakha, by saying the halakha is the normative phenomenon known to us from the halakhic reality in our community. That position has broad implication, allows us to say that halakhic instruction to do X conveyed in the theoretical language acquires clarity, meaning, and force only through our unmediated visual cognition in the case of X within the halakhic community. It follows that the query, how does one teach halakha, will be answered by noting, first, the study of halakha is not solely a textual pursuit. If a budding rabbi is to flourish, he must have massive exposure to the role of halakha practice, for only there he can gain a proper understanding of the law in question. The system emphasizes the place of custom and stresses the importance of a live bond to an existing communal halakhic structure. These factors become key components in proper socialization and the training for her halakhic life. It turns out that then that what makes something halakha is not it's being written in a book or it's on mediated encounter with the practice of the lives of our parents, or other members of the community. In other words, instruction X becomes a normative obligation only if we recognize X as part of the normative experience of the community that is bound by halakha. In light of these insights, one may better understand that Haim Salvechik's instructive article exploring the distor distortion of halakha thought when it's severed from sources of experiential reality. The distortion is a result of deciding halakha questions by looking not to the collective memory of how things are, and were done as a matter of practice, but the conclusions reached on the basis of theoretical halakhic analysis, its consequences are evident in changing halakhic practice. The idea has been variously formulated that halakha is true insofar it is applied in practice, and that one ought to step back from the role of theoretical halakha. Let me here present a few of them. Rabbi Joseph uh, Alaskar notes the duty to make one's house a meeting place for sages. Only by doing so can one experience intensive learning of proper norms through observation and imitation rather than intellectual analysis. The, indeed, the ideas expressed in a more earthly terms in Rabbi Kiva's account reported in the Gomorrah of how he followed Rabbi Joshua into the privy. There he relates, I learned three things from him. I learned that one aligns himself north-south rather than east-west. I learned that one relieves oneself while sitting rather than standing. I learned that one wipes with the left hand rather than the right. Ben Azai said to him, have you been that ins insolent of your teacher? Rabbi Kiva replies, it's Torah that I need to learn it. The drive to learn halakha from real life situation reached into Rob's bedroom when Rob's students, Rav Kahana, lay concealed under his master's bed in order to learn how Rav conducted himself with his wife. Here too, Rav Kahana justified his action by saying, it's Torah and I need to learn it. Another formulation of the correspondence model appears to be the response of literature and the maximum, go out and see what people are doing. The maximum is used to circumvent a theoretical account of the halakha derived from the text and to argue for an adherence instead of accepted halakha as seen on the ground of applied in practice. In light of these examples, the halakha is determined not in reliance on halakha analysis, but in reliance on observation of the prevailing practice. Consider, for instance, the prohibition against tie, tying or sewing together torn phylacteries, or prohibition grounded not in law, but by the popular custom to avoid doing so. In Rashi's words, as quoted in Beit Yosef, and concerning his statement, go on and see what people are doing. Rashi interprets, since it is not the practice to do so, you should not do so. We hear similar strains in connection with the issue of whether unmarried women may go out with their hair down or uncovered. Rabbi Vadi Yosef notes that his pertinent passage is taken at face value. Every single woman should not let their hair down. And it is a forced reading to say that the only single woman referred to are widows. Yet various sources suggest that while it manifests modesty for a virgin not to go out thus with her hair uncovered, it is our custom their bride on her wedding day goes about with her hair visible before the wedding. And this was the custom with respect to virgins, but not to widows. And even though the Mugain of Rum wrote that is forbidden, 
for a single woman to go with her hair exposed. In practice, it was the universal custom to be lenient, and they have a basis to rely on. Go on and see what people are doing. For even among strictly pious people, the virgins go with their hair down and exposed. The principle is applied as well in permitting the use of foreign melodies within the framework of Jewish prayer. But Vladi Yosef writes, the songs of supplication sung by the whole congregation in synagogues on Friday night were composed by learned Jews on the basis of melodies drawn from popular love songs, among others by the brilliant Reb Solomon Nanaido and the brilliant Abraham and Tabi and other famous brilliant men. Almost all the songs of the Eastern Jewish communities, which are recited with pleasant tunes on festive occasions and at meals associated with the fulfillment of the commandments, were composed using the tunes of love songs by holy and pure liturgists and poets, and no one had a bad word to say about the practice. We also had the privilege of hearing prayers led by righteous and upstanding scholars with pleasing voices who employed melodies from love songs when saying Kaddish, Kedusha, and other passages in the prayer, the angelic effect with awe and reverence infusing the hearts of the congregation with joy and song and goodwill. Happy are the people who are so situated and go out and see what people are doing. Similar arguments are used to permit using decorating matzo on Passover, despite the risk of the time needed to decorate, might allow for the dough to rise. Saying the prayer for healing on behalf of a person who's come to the synagogue on Sabbath, even though the prayer is recited in his presence and congregational recitation of biblical verses in the midst of the priestly blessings, many more examples could be cited. A more generalized formulation of the principle clarifying the importance of observed common custom and its ability to overcome theoretical analysis can be found in the famous comment of Rav Haigon. Rav Hai explains the role of halakhic practice in the, as a decisive factor in defining halakhic structure and substance. The statement appears in the context of a discussion of the sequence of tones sounded by the chauffeur of Rosh Hashanah. Concern had been raised about a custom in conflict with halakha, but Rav Haigon brushes the problem aside that we can fulfill our duty in this way and thereby implement the wishes of our creator in is something we know clearly to be correct. It is an unbreakable legacy handed down from our fathers to sons through successive generations of halakha that has spread through Israel. And since we have received the practice in hand, it is correct as a matter of law delivered to Mount Moses at Mount Sinai that they have discharged their obligation. Therefore, all difficulty has been removed. And if one should presume to challenge this ruling, he can be refuted as follow. The answer should be prefaced with the question, of how we know that we are commanded to blow the shofar on this particular day and that the substance of the written law in the Torah written by Moses is dedicated by, dictated by the Almighty. We know it on the authority of the Jewish people, for it is they who attest to it, and they do attest that is doing this act of blowing the shofar. We have discharged our obligation and that they receive that understanding of the authority of the prophets as a law given to Moses at Sinai. It's testimony of the collective and collaborates every Mishnah and every Gomorrah Talmudic teaching and beyond any proof, go out and see what the people are doing. This is the central and authoritative argument, which takes precedence, and then we consult everything that is written in the mission of the Talmud on the subject. Whenever, whatever issues are raised there and can be explained to our satisfaction, find good, and if there is something there which is not compatible with what which is in our hearts and cannot be definitively clarified by the evidence, it is nevertheless does not invalidate the main argument that is the practice of the collective. His essential argument is simple. Custom is the form, foundation of the entire halakha. Therefore, one who challenges a custom on the basis of theoretical law suburbs the entire halakha structure. Statements along these lines concerning a place of customary practice vis-a-vis -vis halakha are numerous. Another group of statements grounded in this viewpoint can be found in the work of Jacob Katz. Katz speaks of the ritual instinct, meaning that the halakha is sustained not by rabbinic decisors, but by the public and by existing practice. The premise is that public practice intuitively refrains from breaching the boundaries of the permissible and forbidden. The complexity of the halakha, which is shaped in the fundamental way by existing practice, has been nicely described by Tamar Ross. The cultural tradition that envelops Jewish law evolved over thousands of years, and thousands of threads are interwoven in the community, communal life of its adherents, along with interactions of whose, of whose existence and significance we are not necessarily aware. We cannot create a normative world that overlooks life as lived continuously for 2,000 years. These ways of life necessarily serve as a backdrop to the elaboration of the original sources. As noted above, these examples do not convey the full breadth of a luck of thought and decision-making. Many examples at odds with those just described may be cited. 
I will do some in connection with the other truth models. Still, we cannot disregard the firmly established presence of a form of logic thought consistent with the correspondence model in all its implications. These remarks, as we shall see, will pertain to the other models and examples to be considered below. The coalescence coherence test claim that the statement is true if it coalesces with other statements to form a simple organic whole, single organic whole. On this view, no true statement can exist in isolation. The test is based not on sense perceptions, but on intellect and reason. Reason is a set of rules with an inner structure. It fashions our sensory impressions, transforming them to an ephemeral experiences and to objective re entities. Reason furnishes us with rules and principles that enable us to evaluate arguments, justify beliefs, and act consistently. This position, too, has been formulated in diverse ways by various thinkers, though all concur that an isolated statement lacks significance unless encompassed within an organic system that comprehends and illuminates it. The position is rooted in the idealist and rationalist tradition of Western philosophy extended from Plato, Kant, and Hegel to the neo-Kantian, neo-Hegelian, and positivist schools of the 20th century. As noted, it devalues the sense in favor, senses in favor of intellect and principles of abstract thought. The theory has been translated into the educational arena, a step that helps clarify its practical implications. The aim of education from this vantage point is to endow pupils with habits and critical thinking in order to promote their intellectual autonomy. Pupils will be expected to demonstrate an ability to provide rational explanation for their beliefs on the basis of coherent principles. They will also be expected to apply these principles creatively in a changing world instead of simply reiterating familiar arguments. Within this rubric, a distinction took shape between psychological coalescence expanded by John Dewey's school and logical coalescence. The distinction is reflected in the existence of different schools and systems of educational methods from progressive education in the first half of the 20th century to the scientific education that followed it. How can a logic phenomenon be understood in light of the philosophical system, though not the diametric opposite of the correspondence test? The coherence test differs profoundly from it, but it too can be translated into the holistic order and it is consistent with the contention frequently encountered in Lockic discourse that Jewish law is a closed system. A Lockic argument never exists in isolation. It is woven into a broad system of legal logic, language concepts, and precedents that render a specific ruling acceptable. Moreover, from this perspective, though certainly not from others, it is not the reality that shapes the law, but the law that shapes reality. In other words, the decisor considers and clarifies the place of a particular law within the overall Holocca framework, and then proceeds to impose it on reality which changes accordingly, it follows that coalescence into logic order rather than reality is primary. The position can readily be grounded on the teachings of Moses Mendelssohn and Yeshai Libowitz and the portions of Rabbi J.B. Salvatic philosophical halakhic doctrines that present the role of Rav Chaim of Brisk through the figure of neo kantian in halakhic man. According to Salvation's Galactic Teaching, Historicism and Psychological Reductionism, which are systems of inquiry, analysis, and information derived from the world, have no place in legal deliberations of the Halakhic man. The Halakha, in his account, moves on its own special trajectory. Its laws are ideal and normative. Its thought process is mathematical. The Halakha, on this view, is independent of external stimuli and human reactions they evoke. Reality has no formative function with regard to the Halakha. It is merely a necessary platform for action. The Halakha constructs then sustain their own reality. An example of this can be found salvation comment on the deliberations concerning the case of an aguna, a chained woman whose husband has disappeared or refuses to give her a divorce. We always shared in the sour the sorrow of the wretched aguna, but as a rabbi sitting to judge the case of an aguna, he would make his decision without being swayed by the feelings of sympathy, even though his comparison Compassion had been stirred by the pitiful woman. His decision was based only on theoretical halakhic principles. To what can this be compared to a satellite that enters a certain orbit? Well, the satellite's entry into this trajectory was dependent upon the force that uh, propelled it. Once the object found its trajectory, it moved along it with wondrous precision, and the amount of force propelling it can neither add to nor detract from its movement in the least. In his view, rabbinic authorities should not take into account extra halakhic factors such as emotions in general, and compassion or sympathy in particular decisive shapes his thought exclusively in accordance with a lot of principles. Another formulation of a of coherence approach is its disassociation with concrete reality appears in the document exchange between Rev, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein and Professor Saul Lieberman. When considering the Talmudic distinction of whether it is permitted to remove bread from an oven on the Sabbath, Lieberman professed 
himself astonished that one could even attempt to study such an issue without first in get, investigating the pertinent technical uh, realism. Lichtenstein responded as follows. His remarks here translated from the original Hebrew. One can discuss and analyze through the teachings of Rechaim of Bris in a brilliant and innovative fashion the removal of bread and can attempt to define, as did the Roshonim, the category of craft not entailing labor uh, and compared to several other halakhic phenomena. All this may be done without knowing what the exact stages of this activity are from the realistic technical standpoint. Obviously, the luck sage who is asked to make a ruling must be familiar with the technical aspects of the removal of bread and cannot content himself with relating to the subject as an abstract basis. But the student sitting in the Beit Medrash house study can for 40 years or more conduct a class on removing bread without knowing the intricacies of how it is done in reality. This viewpoint has exerted a varied and wide-ranging impact on halakhic and legal thinking. It finds comprehensive expression in Joel Roth's book, The Halakhic Process. Moshe Halberthal and Menachem Mautner have traced the presence of formalistic, coalescing, cohesive thought in the yeshiva world, on the other hand, and the general and Israeli court system, on the other, exploring the existing characteristics and drawbacks. The fruits of this approach have been incorporated in the deepest levels of scholarship in the field of philosophy of halakha, willing no small influence on the scholarly agenda. This holds true even where scholars have sought valiantly to show that halakha does not operate in a formalistic, coherent manner, and instead takes account of various other considerations and diverse sets of interest. It likewise holds true in the context of effort to show that legal and halakha formalism and the associated coherence differ fundamentally from the correspondence concepts of other fields. The tension between the perspectives of correspondence and coherence is nothing new to the philosophy of halakha, but has previously been expressed under other rubrics with no connection to truth test terminology. We now turn to additional truth test models not previously considered in meta-halakha context. According to the test of utility pragmatism, a statement is true if it is useful to human beings in their struggle for survival. No single final absolute truth exists. Truth is rather something active and dynamic tied to an objective and validated by the result of its produces. Pragmatism affirms an exclusive theoretical truth having no utilitarian value and lacking any expression in practical results is entirely groundless, emphasizing the practical character of truth as a mean or tool for satisfying biological needs and adapting to the requirements of life. This perspective equates truth with utility. William James was the first to formulate this philosophy. John Dewey was his preeminent pro proponent, advocate, and the first to note its educational implications. Dewey understood reality as an ongoing process in which every living organism strives to perpetuate its existence in a dangerous and unstable world. That world presents a constant stream of challenges, and cognition is one of the tools we use to maintain ourselves in the face of those dwellings. As soon as an individual finds himself in a state of imbalance, an imbalance that casts him into a murky and menacing situation, he works to reorganize rally, reality in order to regain his equilibrium. Practicism seeks only one thing, to solve the novel problems that incessantly arise. The correspondence test has little, if any, relevance to this goal, and the coherence test has even less. Cognition aims not to uncover reality, but to achieve results, whether or not they coalesce within a single frame of reference. Our entire purpose is to satisfy our needs, accomplish our objectives, and exercise effective control of our environment. Pragmatism strives to turn everything into a program of action subordinate to the desired results. In light of these principles, Dewey concluded that a necessary condition for learning for human thought and inquiry is a personal interest in the subject being investigated. Without personal involvement, there will be no investigation. Furthermore, inquiry always deals with processes with unresolved and problematic situations. Human consciousness has little interest in the past. Its focus is on the unfolding future. Education, accordingly, is an ongoing process of growth and development. A pupil study, Dewey contends, should focus on practical activities that interest the child. A strong connection must be forged between his studies and his life, and the school should take care not to cut itself off from society. What insights can we glean from this respect to Alakla? Various passages relate to the way in which Torah is learned may be read in light of this perspective. Rabbah, for example, says that one should always study Torah in a place that his heart desires. This statement pertains to the relationship between the student and the studies. It suggests that a teacher must respond to the student's needs, for only in that way does the student study become meaningful. Beyond that, 
This position sheds light on the relationship between the decisor and the halakha. I'm referring here to the fundamental principle of halakha decision-making. The halakha is determined not on the basis of hypotheticals, but on the basis of real-life cases of situations in which some imbalance requires immediate attention. For example, the halakha cannot examine the status of a woman as a theoretical issue. The difficulty issue, difficult issues faced by the scissors in one period is not necessarily the same as those that arise in another the unmediated encounter with reality and his challenges to observant Jews impels the decisor to issue a decision. He would never have had an occasion to reach such a decision had he not been confronted with the particular situation he was asked to address. In this context, one may note two tendencies in the Lachic literature that are tied to pragmatism, though not identical to it. The first is the more common the clear recognition of the luck is necessary dynamism vis-a-vis -vis changing reality. Jewish law must not become an abstract system for discerning divine truths. Rather, it must play a role within the changing environment as it resolves contemporary problems, reacts to the reality in which it functions, and is shaped by human beings who are uniquely able to administer the law with the flexibility required by their changing lives. In this spirit, one may read the words of the Vilna Gon, who argued as a direct corollary to a rabbinic medrash that a luck of truth grows out of a concrete reality, similar of Arya Leva Cohen argues in his book, uh, Kesara Achoshin, that the human intellect, whose roots are earth -born, are incapable of attaining truth, but the oral law was given to be administered in accord with the sage's determination. This is implied by the blessing of the Torah, uh, which declares he has given truth, the Torah of truth, he has given us the oral law as an outright gift to be administered as the sage is determined. These texts, of course, may be read as dealing only with the source of a luck of authority and the force of the authority of the oral Torah, but from a pragmatic perspective, one may see them as standing from the premise that a luck of truth and a luck of solution must grow out of real-world problems that require solutions. It is through these solutions that the truth of the Torah is to be assessed, and that it is important to comment that the law was not given to the ministering angels, where Moshe Feinstein begins his books and responds to Igor's Moshe in the same spirit. He writes concerning what is true for the purposes of teaching. It has already been said it is not in heaven. On the contrary, if a rabbinic scholar reaches a certain judgment after having applied himself to the elucidation of Allah by studying the relevant sources of the Talmud and later decisors to the best of his ability with gravitas and on the Lord may be blessed, if this is how it appears to him, his judgment is true for the purposes of instruction. It must be taught. The rabbinic sage, according, is obligated not to the higher order of things, but to the encounter of that order with reality and all its requirements. All the judge has is what he sees with his own eyes. And the Torah, according to Rev. Feinstein, awaits the sages who provide it its crown in accord with their ability and understanding. His later years, Rev. Soloveitchik made similar statements with regard to the nature of topical halakha, as did others. In citing these comments, I do not mean to argue that the Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Feinstein, and Rabbi Salvation adopted the approach implied by pragmatism. My contention, rather, is that certain principles associated with the test of utility or the pragmatic test can be found at the heart of meta halakha discourse. They are tied as well to the rabbinic figures who were, in fact, influenced by philosophical pragmatism, such as Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, although Berkowitz was one of the leading spokesmen for this approach, he too couched these ideas exclusively in intra-halakha, intra-rabbinic terms. Sensitivity to human needs and difficulties underlies this principle of halakha decision-making and emphasizes the centrality of such principles as its ways are the ways of pleasantness for the sake of peace, and you shall do uh, the just and the good. In his view, halakha obliges the Jew not only to heed God's command, but also to take account of the other and profoundly sensitivity sensitive to him, seeking his welfare and well-being in whatever situation he may find himself. A similar spirit suffices with the rising of Emmanuel Rema Rackman. David Hartman speaks more pointedly, bringing the existential spirit to bear in the halakhic context. He calls for an end to metaphysical discourse and its replacement with the discourse that clarifies man's connection to himself, his family, and his heritage, and the desire to converse with and construct a mutually covenant with God. Their truth is not determined on high, on the contrary, the deity looks down in order to adapt himself to the truth taking shape among human beings. In this way, the religious order stops thinking in theocentric terms and shifts to existentialist concepts with an anthropocentric em emphasis. The most robust expression of the pragmatist spirits may be embodied in the works of Mordecai Kaplan, who turned pragmatism to the exclusive foundation of its select thought. He made the point clear in the 1917 diary entry, the question of what is Judaism therefore resolves itself into the question, how do beliefs and practices function? For the function of a thing practically constitutes its essence, 
In his view, religious worship is a sort of recreation, and this is his proper role. Moreover, he wrote in 1915, what we want is a religion that will help us gain our bearings in this world, that will keep down the beast in us and spur us to be worthy endeavors in the field of thought and action. On this view then, and in very stark contrast to the coherence theory, halakhic thought will be sensitive to changing circumstances and psychological and sociological considerations, and it will be alert to the power of these factors to annul legal decisions as part and parcel of halakhic development. According to the test of simplicity or elegance, a proposition or scientific theory will be considered correct only if it succeeds in using a minimum number of concepts and laws to explain a maximum number of phenomena. In the spirit of Thomas Kuhn, we may see that in choosing between two scientific theories, we favor the one that is simpler, more comprehensive, more inclusive, and more elegant in how it resolves the problems. This theory, too, has been translated into educational terms. It suggests the primary role of education to elucidate the subject matter and convey it to the pupil clearly and transparently. Clarity triumphs complexity, and simplicity prevails over depth. The teacher's task is to present the subject matter in an orderly and systemic fashion without burdening the student to superfluous information that will impede his efforts to organize his knowledge. Instruction should transmit rules and topics through the use of broad units of study that allow students to grasp the subject matter by drawing easily remembered connections and that do not burden them with excessive details. In the logic context, this truth test will shed light on the question somewhat different from those discussed previously. The truth test has the consider provided answers to such questions is how do I as a human being or decider know that ruling X represents the logic truth or how can I know whether a normative action by the community has gained a logic status? The correspondence test assigned normative status to pr practical conduct per se and the coherence test required that the normative act be consistent with the theoretical logic principles and the utility test assessed the pragmatic consequences of the action of logic under consideration. The simplicity test poses the same question, but clarifies the range of additional questions as well, questions to which the preceding three tests provide different answers. The simplicity test raises questions that appear more political than meta halakhic As we shall see, however, the questions and their implications exert considerable influence in their own right and shed light on the questions asked by the decisor regarding practical and theoretical halakha. The simplicity test makes us conscious of the sociology and phenomenology of halakhic writing, the changes that has undergone, particularly in modern times in recent years, a new style of halakhic writing has gained descendancy in rabbinic circles within the varied streams of modern orthodoxy. It is a style adopted earlier by other movements within Judaism. The halakhic scholarship published in the annual Tehumim, along with other halakhic works published within those circles, exemplifies these changes. The hallmark of these changes is the internalization of academic and popular writing styles. This represents a significant change from the classical halakhic writing style, an arcane genre largely impenetrable by outsiders unfamiliar with its characteristics and with the halakhic discourse of the yeshiva world. In sharp contrast to the closed and profoundly obscure style used by past halakhic elites, Contemporary logic writers has become lucid and simple. Any educated person can follow the decisor's train of thought and experience his views. The style of writing came to being out of a growing awareness of the client on the other side of the page, of a sense of on the part of the decisor that he must persuade the reader in his own language that the ruling is correct. Aesthetic standards are taking shape for halakhic writing, recognized as a precondition to a supportive attitude on the part of the public that is meant to follow the halakhic authorities determination criteria of aesthetics and elegance has become decisive in the making of orthodox rabbis who earn the devotion of their communities and become the lucky authorities of the age. Their words are judged by the simplicity and marketability, while other criteria such as logic or correspondence to reality are set aside in favor of rhetorical or pedagogical prowess. What is the genesis of this approach and what is its implication? The phenomenon can be analyzed from various angles, from the sociological to the psychological, one can even point to certain new age tendencies associated with it. I cannot here undertake a systematic analysis of the matter. Certainly, one may note the important role played in the process by Rabbi Cook, a leading rabbinic and philosophical force in the land of Israel in the 20th century. I refer to his halakhic teachings, which I have elsewhere termed prophetical halakhic, but Cook, as we know, 
developed a halakhic doctrine that he expected would establish itself in the land of Israel, incorporating prophetic dimensions that uniquely characterized the Torah of the land of Israel. This connection between halakha and prophecy had already been expounded in Kabbalistic and Hasidic courses predating Rav Kook, as well as the works of Rav Yudah Levi. Rav Kook articulated various defining characteristics of prophetic halakhic decision-making, one of which pertains to our discussion in his view. Prophetic halakha requires a simple, succinct style of writing in the land of Israel, which is the site of prophecy. A type of halakha should be established does not require lengthy clarifications. An important asset of rabbinic scholars in the land of Israel was that they considered brevity a virtue. And Rev. Cook goes on to cite various examples to prove his point. The decision-making process of scholars of prophetic halakha then is necessarily concise and logically straightforward, grounded in profound grasp of halakha principles. These teachings appear to have a direct influence on the Lockhart ruling of Cook's disciples, which tend to be brief, if not simplistic. Rav Shlomo Avenar is a preeminent example of this phenomenon. His prose is distinct and lucid, and his writing genre contrasts sharply with anything we are familiar with in the classical response of literature. It contains not a hint of a Lockhart hair splitting, and the responses presented to the question of a simple exposition of the law as it is. The thousands of Lockhart responses are published every day on the internet constitute an extensive and potent Lockhart phenomenon paralleling this type of Lockhart writing. Here, too, it is difficult to disregard the challenges, the changes of the concept of responsive literature. It greatly increased accessibility and intensity to admit quotations from local sources that justify the ruling. The logic answers given are unequivocal and clear. They are accompanied by contextual rather than textual logic explanations. And the decision sometimes is expressed as simply yes or no in reliance on the authority of the responder. A Acorn, good to see you. The final truth test to be considered here is the test of clarity, self-evidence. According to this approach, the statement is true. If it is clear and distinct in Descartes' term, its self-evident truth requires no further proofs. Its clarity is sufficient guarantee of its veracity. Examples include the principles of logic, such as the law of contradiction, the axioms of Euclidean geometry, and the Cartesian recognition that I am, I exist, is necessarily true so often as it is uttered by me or conceived by the mind. In light of this position, Spinoza constructed a system of morality and metaphysics, all without any need of proof of evidence. The distinction between the rationalist version and the principle of self-evidence, as in Descartes, and the empiricist version is well known. Here, too, one might enter in a detailed review of all the schools and thinking allied with this position, but it's not a purpose here. In the educational context, a self-evidence test appears in the Socratic method, which regards instruction as a process of uncovering what has long existed in the student's soul. Teaching, then, is not the imposition of something external, which Socrates, Plato, and Augustine consider to be impossible, but the evocation of something already instilled in the pupil's spirit. Sheffer takes his approach to a step further in speaking of the insight model, according to which knowledge is a matter of vision, and vision cannot be dissected into elementary sensory verbal units that can be conveyed from one person to another. It can't most be stimulated and prompted by what the teacher does. Learning takes place beyond what is said or done. It transcends doing. The teaching process thus cannot be predicated on what can be grasped or proven or transmitted through persuasion. Teaching strives rather to foster intuitive thought processes based on visual, nonverbal, and unmediated grasp of reality. The teacher should undertake not to impart a subject matter but to furnish his pupils with opportunities and situations conductive to identification and empathy. He should facilitate the emergence of awareness and attentiveness. He should help them develop their experience. He should expand their bounds of self beyond the given and the familiar. The teacher should strive to cultivate the pupil's creativity and provide the conditions that will enable his inner illumination to burst forth while encouraging the growth of psychological defenses, freedom, and spontaneity. The self-evidence test has potential revolutionary implications when applied to the world of halakha, for it establishes an unbending standard against which the halakhic system must be measured, thereby threatening to undermine its authority. It serves to clarify one of the harshest critiques of the halakhic system raised within Jewish thought. Jewish law, Martin Buber would argue, can be true. That is worthy of existence only if its obligatory nature is evident, and halakha would become an evident obligation only when the idao bond with the divine is illuminated. Here we see clearly Buber's entire halakhic or anti halakhic perspective. An unworthy halakha is one found to be lifeless obligation, i. it functional, institutional, and systemic. In light of this argument, Buber distinguishes between institutionalized, frozen, and rote religion in which parents impose the yoke 
of the commandments on the children and religiosity, which is vital, pulsing spirit, perpetually renewed. This is also the distinction between true and false prophecy in Buber's thought. The false prophet does not know the certain truth. Rather, he knows only an ideological truth which serves the needs of the ideology for which is spoken. He experiences no illumination, is therefore ignorant of the qualities of silence, perplexity, and expectation. A genuine prophet, in contrast, like Jeremiah confronting Hanania, knows the quality of tearing or withdrawing in silence in order to return and receive the divine revelation that instructs them from time to time what to say and what to do. The criterion also provides us with new understanding of friends. Rosenweig's distinction between law, which is the archaeological dimension of the religious framework and the command, the latter fosters the sense that the directed to one personality obligates it addressee transforming the law from an alien object into a subject that addresses itself directly to human beings the individual senses a commandment that can he can no longer deny the influence of this ex existentialist spirit on halakhic thought can be discerned not only in meta halakhic uh, context but also in the discourse over legal decision making here too rev cook's concept of the prophetic halakha plays an interesting role the discussion of the sense of certainty as a religious experience was not foreign to rev cook and it occupies a central role in his prophetic and even anti halakhic teachings, Ruth Cook internalized the existential discourse regarding the indispensability of certain uncertainty and the dismissal of halakhic formalism rigidity, transforming it into category of prophetic halakha. Accordingly, the category of intuitive thinking becomes a necessary characteristic of the process of halakhic decision making. To put it another way, focusing on intuitively on the halakha guarantees that one will make the correct legal decision. This is one of the virtues in his view of the Torah of the land of Israel in contradistinction of that of exile. It boosts a direct intuitive simplicity on the theoretical level, free of tortuous hair splitting. A number of his works allude to the sort of elective decision making, and the phenomenon is even more pronounced among his disciples. It was Alan Ross, A.R. Well, Broker Shem, if that's Alan Ross, uh, Shalom, good to see you. Critical analysis, the intersection of the five philosophical models, the pedagogical parallels, and the corresponding models of logic thought can be put to various uses, uncovering the presence of truth tests, and logic analysis can afford us to Positive insights into the nature of these models. Beyond that, it can sharpen our understanding of the problems and pitfalls of lurking within the various halakha claims discussed earlier. Let me provide some examples regarding the correspondence test, which argues for the reliance on the senses, the tabula rasa epistemology empirical approach. One may ask how we deal with the recognition what we recognize as the gap between our sensory experience and the world itself. Can everything in fact be observed? What do we do about our abstract systems of thought? or concepts that do not lend itself to visual conceptualization, concepts such as thought, insight, and many others. Moreover, we assume that sensory experience is objective, but that is really so. It is not, in fact, subjective and capable of precise transmission. Finally, how do we know that the observed act generates the inferred theory? Might not the reverse be true? Might not the theory be primary, grounding our understanding of what our senses perceive? In that event, theory would establish reality rather than being formed out of it. But if that is so, how can we assert in the theory? These questions have their halakhic analogs. It is really possible to as ascribe to a certain the halakhic solely by reference to the real world or the halakhic praxis. It is apparent that halakha encompasses various theories held by the people who practice it, and each theory affords a different interpretation to the halakhic process. But if this so reference only to the practice affords a problematic understanding of the nature of what is, in fact, taking place, it follows as well that two people witnessing the same Halakhic event may perceive and report on different actions. The experience of observations is conditioned on theory and of the premises that each observer brings with them to the reality being observed. It follows that the effort to base an understanding of the world of halakhic solely in practice disregards the subjectivity layer that underlies the possibility of the very observation. If we return to the example cited above, we find that Rabbi Akiva's behavior in following Rabbi Yeshua and paying attention to the behavior in the toilet is problematic. Uh, the thought that we can learn something from the behavior in the past for our own conduct in the present ignores 
the various possibilities of Rabbi Shua's halakhic theory and deliberation. Just from looking at a particular instance of his practice, we cannot draw too many conclusions. After all, it's possible the particular situation caused him to act differently than he would normally have done. For example, he may recently have broken his right hand and had to use his left hand. Likewise, the luck idea that one should look to see what the public is doing in order to determine the norm of behavior is detached from the theoretical, sociological, and psychological context in which the luck of situations arise. If we were to pay no attention to this context, we would be likely to fall into the luck of corruption. For example, a public that does not recite the Psalms of Hallel at the prayer on Israel Independence Day may be doing so due to some anti-Zionist or ultra-Orthodox attitudes prevailing in the public or because of political stance that denounce the allegedly non-Zionist policies of the left-leaning Israeli government. There are two opposing theories that lead to the same practice and sort the normal practice cannot be determined simply by looking at the practice. Moreover, halakhic literature encompasses not only practical instructions, but also theories and principles having no clear practical embodiment. The halakhic rules of logic are an inseparable part of halakha, but can they possibly be acquired solely through the world of action. We find ourselves struggling in a similar way with the coherence test. The expectation is that a system is truly solely true solely by reason of its being a closed, coherent system. It's problematic in several aspects. On one level, one must question the extent to which a system is capable of remaining closed on all sides, cut off from external factors. It is possible to disconnect, as Bergman put it, pure laws from all facts. Moreover, does the Mere coalescence of reports about a person X being in place Y suffice to establish the reality of his presence there. Should we not argue that the ultimate test is the person's actual physical presence there rather than the testimony accounts of his presence? Perhaps more fundamentally, one may call into question the force of the coherence theory itself. Can we say that every closed system is true? Does a wholly imaginary system that adheres to the rules of coherence thereby become transformed into a true system? Can one assume that only one system can attain internal consonants. The lucky material may be approached in the same spirit. Questions of the first sort would include rather the exalted goal of coalescing all the lucky into a pristine coherent system is in fact attainable. If it's reasonable to assume that what cannot be attained in science for there's no hermetically sealed scientific system can be attained in lucky. And we know of various selective phenomena that are not part of overall coherent fabric and that endure only as customer tradition. A clear and even radical example of how coherence test is insufficient in the framework of Lachik can paradoxically be found in the life story of Rabbi Salvechik, who Lachik teaching has already been cited as a clear example of the embodiment of this true claim. The death of his wife uh, was a terrible blow to him and left him lonely and solitary. He adopted for himself an idiosyncratic practices that could not be justified on intrinsic Lachik grounds. When asked why he acted as he did, and on which a lucky basic answers was, what could I do? And in spirit, he found himself visiting her grave every week. And this certainly in opposition to a logic theory, which he described in his philosophical study, Halakhic Man. Moreover, as we saw philosophical questions arising in our philosophical discourse above, so we can see parallel questions in the logic framework. Do we really want to argue that anything logically implied by the logic category is necessarily fitting and proper? Are there no external systems or more ality and values whose task in part is to confirm or reformulate the halakhic processes in light of a broader meta-halakhic order? The pragmatist tradition likewise faces a series of questions that can shed new light on this halakhic analog. The notion that utility is the standard for determining what is the true is problematic in several levels. First, utility is a relative concept that depends on context. Jones and Smith will attribute different utilities to the same action, and his absolute degree of utility can be assigned to the action only by reference to some external system. The very thing that pragmatist denies, moreover, setting pragmatism in the basis for all truth is problematic in and of itself, for it may be possible in some circumstances to obtain desired goal through the use of inputs that are clearly false. Does attainment of the goal transform the imaginary into reality? Finally, the pragmatist argues that X is true because it is pragmatic, but if then we ask, how do we know pragmatism to be true? We can only say that it's true because it is pragmatic. We therefore set up an infinite regressions that cannot be sustained. Turning to the logic analog, we recognize that pragmatic logic ensures us of an ongoing dynamic of change and renewal in the logic decision. 
making, but who determines that the halakha is so determined is in fact the correct halakha. If we respond, that is the pragmatism and body within the halakha that ensures its correctness, we then face the question of the purpose to which the pragmatism is directed. How do we know that the pragmatism is directed to truth and is not caught up in the infinite regression noted earlier? I shall try to clarify this problem which we already noted by way of the question of the status of woman. It's clear that the status of woman, the reality of life in the 16th century, and needless to say, the logic of that period is not like the status of woman in the uh, halakha in the 21st century. The sort of problems that are referred to in rabbinic authorities in one period are not necessarily of a piece with the problems referred to in rabbinic authorities in another period. Hence, the unmediated encounter with reality and the challenges it presents to observant Jews is what motivates the rabbinic scholars when he issues a decision. And yet, this description is partial for as an authority addresses to the problem of the modern woman he requires before making decision a theory that clarifies what the problem is. Without such a theory, he cannot address the question of what the solution might be. For example, Ruth Cook argues that equal rights of women before the law is itself the problem that creates difficulties and handicaps in married life in Modern society, he finds that maintaining the ancient halakhic norms and this framework that promises a natural, authentic life for women, and indeed for married life as such, it follows that the problem emerges out of complex systems. In fact, the problem and therefore the possible solutions are connected to ontological and metaphysical theories. This brings us to the problem space by the elegance test. The test would argue that elegance makes the theory correct, but who is to say that the nature is constructed in this manner? Does the elegance test reflect the reality of the world or merely our own limitations? Does this design ele desired elegance, which has made the condition of truth, generally deal with the truth, or is it more a matter of aesthetics, acceptability, and efficiency to those very questions pertain the aesthetic model of halakha. Do the new criteria introduced in the modern halakha discourse have any bearing on the true claim of halakhic arguments? In other words, if we regard halakhic determination as true simply because of its elegance and simplicity, do we thereby cast aside the very concept of truth and focus exclusively on aesthetics? An explicit expression of opposition to this tendency that points to the alleged dangers within it can be found in the writings of Rabbi Lichtenstein, the halakhic past becomes accessible to a certain extent through the measure of disengagement from the present and future. We feel this to be the case because we witness the increasing infiltration of the general language into the role of halakhic literature. There are those who are dragged into the general linguistic stream and adopt modern Hebrew totally as a tool for expressing Torah teachings. True, this mode has clear advantages both in learning community and it provides clarity, order, precision, and so forth, but there is a price to be paid for this approach and can never be turned and can even be termed dangerous. Another expression of opposition to this tendency, albeit from a different place, can be found from writings of Reb Davy, David Golunkin. Golunkin strives to strengthen the authority of rabbinic scholars precisely from their, for their knowledge and wisdom, even though their language may be difficult and largely inaccessible. It tends to reduce the strength of the public in the halakhic discourse, where they, the public, cannot be said to have true knowledge of the halakha. Finally, there is the test of self-evidence. It's problematic in several respects to argue that the clear and absolute certainty of X assures us of its correctness. First, the annals of science are replete in supposed certainties that were later challenged or overturned. And when you speak of self-evidence, what exactly do we mean and how do we determine it? Is it psychologically, emotionally self-evident or logically self-evident? Is it subjective depending on the individual's personality or is it universal? And if we argue that it is in fact universal, how can we be severed from one substantive psychic structure which shapes our understanding of everything. In other words, how can we distinguish true certainty from imagined certainty? Once again, the luck analog faces can corresponding questions. Does the spiritual self-evidence sought for by Buber generally open the way to stability and knowledge, or does it more likely lead to subjective speculations and delusions beyond any criticisms or restraint? The Midrash makes this point in its tale of the Satan effort to trip up Abraham, who is en route to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, the Satan appears to Abram and the guys in the old man says to him, was I not present when the accuser told you to take your son? And should an old man like you lose so lovable a son? How does the self-evidence test enable us to distinguish between Satan's voice and God's? How does it help us distinguish between the experience of a true prophet and that of a false prophet? Did Joan of Arc truly hear God's voice or did she experience the mad visions of troubled adolescence? The study of and the limits of models. As already meant, noted, it is commonplace that living phenomena are broader and richer than the narrow limits of the models we use to help understand them. Accordingly, models cannot enable us to grasp the phenomena in its entirety. If we narrow our ambitions, however, we will see the usefulness of superimposing models and phenomena we are studying. 
For the narrow perspective, we find the Halakhic system's truth claim is not based solely on a status of revealed truth and that there are indications of several other truth tests that illuminate in diverse and sometimes conflicting ways the Halakhic culture. The foregoing models can clarify portions of the phenomenon according can point to the inner tensions within the Halakhic system reflecting the forces that pull the system in varied directions and the diverse sets of underlying assumptions. A complete account of these models' implications for our understandings of Laka will certainly require much more work, including examinations, the relationship of the truth test to one another and our ability to use them to clarify the meaning of the philosophy of Laka. In addition, other models and other examples that could not be considered here must also be examined. At the same time, we should pay attention to the factors that mediates between the philosophical model and the Laka phenomenon that is pedagogic thought. Not only does the med Mediation, mediation make it easier for us to understand the practical implications of philosophical theory. Perhaps more importantly, it can hinder the emergence of a logic analysis from the juristical sphere to educational. That move, I believe, would bear abundant and important fruit far beyond what could be considered here. It requires broad development and intensive study. Okay, Brooke Hashem, thank God. Um, so hemorrhaging i lost all my viewership but uh i'm glad i got through that especially that last one on jewish law so yeah a lot of information there today um you know thank claire for coming on even though you became a little bit unpleasant or, or off topic um so i'm rounding the corner on you know my research i mean the research is endless and all these topics can go on uh forever uh however you know, a basic level of what I'm trying to get through in order to, you know, start putting out information of the multiple truth hypothesis. Hey, Dave, thanks for, you know, being here. So, yeah, about to call it a night and, you know, appreciate you uh, tuning in and making those transcripts. And, uh, yeah, you know, if you, it's probably best if you just make a comment and put it in the link like you did that one week. And, you know, no one's contacted me and said they used it, but, uh, you know, hopefully at some point they will. And, you know, largely I'm just reading these papers right now, but I think I'm rounding the corner in terms of the due diligence in my research. And, you know, there's a lot of material I want to cover. I want to get the stuff right. I want to be able to express it in the terminology of the modern theories and to correctly be able to describe, uh, you know, to the people who've done the work in the field and the names of uh, the historical background, then even, you know, the, the people up to date and the names of the people who are currently doing research. And, you know, God willing, eventually try to have discourse and conversation with some of those people and start putting out more writing. Um, but, you know, probably the, you know, the whole summer, I'll continue with my research and just pounding forward and uh, putting stuff out. And uh, so it's been a long stream. So I'm just going to sign off and your blessings is that I finished my introduction to Jewish prayer with Michael this week. I don't have any streams coming up. I'm not sure if I'm what I'm going to do with Michael, if we're going to continue streaming or, or, you know, maybe we will, but we'll probably take a few weeks to uh, determine what makes sense. So it'll probably just be next week. We can review and uh, continued research. You know, if anyone wants to talk, uh, you know, join my discord or reach out. And you know, we'll see Ethan Ralph if he uh, you know sets up a conversation or debate. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll post that in my social media. So, uh, your blessings. Thank God. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, Dave. Thanks again as always. Ar, if that was you, Alan Ross. You know, bless you. It was uh, good to see you, my old friend from Israel. Acorn, um, Orfeo. Um, you know, everyone who was in the chat today. The final call. Um, you appreciate people being around and hope the content is useful. So uh, God bless and have a great week.